Good morning. Senate Committee on State Affairs will come to order. Will the clerk call the roll? Betancourt? Birdwell? Present. Lamantia? Present. Menendez? Middleton? Here. Parker? Perry? Schwartner? Present. Zaffarini? Present. Paxton? Present. Hughes? Here. Quorum is present. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we would normally conduct meetings of the Committee on State Affairs in the Senate chamber. That's where we customarily do it. As you know, there's construction going on or, or maintenance going on, so that room is unavailable to us, and so we're glad to be cozy in here. Thank you for folks who are standing, and feel free to make yourselves at home and uh, come in and out. I don't think there's a whole lot going on today. There should be seats outside, but you're welcome. Please stay as long as you need to and want to. We have a, a big agenda today, a couple of matters I want to uh, address, important matters. Uh, uh, my, uh, a couple of things. I've been reminded that this is the first, I believe, the first committee hearing that, that Senator Zaffarini has attended since she has, that has, has become the dean of the Texas Senate. Well, it's an honor for us to be with you on this occasion. Thank you again for being here. <laughs> and also, uh, through uh, research, all appropriate research, we were able to schedule this hearing on the day of Senator Schwartner's birthday. So <laughs> happy birthday, Senator. Thanks for sharing your birthday with us. Thank you for being here. <laughs> and so we'll see if I uh, still have a couple of members en route with uh, obviously traveling and weather delays in many places. And I know that's affected many here and also many of our witnesses who some will not be able to make it for that reason. As we begin, I'm going to see if any member of the committee wishes to make any opening remarks or, or anything like that. Uh, if anybody has anything. I'll start down here just if you want to. Senator Lamantia, you don't have to. I just want to see. We'll just work our way around. And then he says, Senator Bardwell? Wow, okay. Wow. Please, please, Madam Vice Chair. Well, I'm, I um, am glad to be part of this. I mean, so many um, constituents have reached out about the issues we're going to be addressing today. But um, I especially wanted to uh, just express appreciation to uh, my policy director, Laura Carr, who is staffing her last um, um, committee meeting, State Affairs uh, hearing with us uh, today. She is getting married, and uh, we wish her the best, and um, I just appreciate her work. And also my new chief of staff, uh, Laura Stowe, is with us today, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. There. <laughs> it has a nice <laughs> ring to it, doesn't it? Dean's, <laughs> we like that too. We like He's that. Too. Her <laughs> uh, and uh, the committee's uh, accustomed to working together on these matters, and I want to make sure that everyone knows about some changes we've had. Uh, Katrina Corkle, our longtime deputy director and director of the Jurisprudence Committee, uh, is now director of State Affairs. This is our first hearing to put together from stem to stern and to run. Thank you, Katrina. And uh, Emma Gibson, a new member of our team, is working today to keep everything going well. And so thankful to have each one of them and each member of the member staff as well. And so as we begin moving, as we begin moving through these interim charges, this is one of three, we believe, three interim hearings that the committee will hold. And so, again, thanks, everyone, for accommodating your schedules and, and getting here. Um, on the issue of elections and election security, um, both big tech, and that's a broad term that, that uh, is somewhat amorphous, but I think you know what we mean in general. Large entities, which have a tremendous reach, uh, have a lot of influence. And this has been a subject of uh, legislation here in a number of areas, in Texas and many states. And so uh, taking a look at the influence of big tech and also foreign entities, I think we realize that foreign money, and by, and by foreign in this limited context, I mean not just outside of Texas, but outside of the United States. When I say foreign, I want to clarify. Uh, again, we're thankful for folks from all walks of life and all places. In U.S. elections, it's important that foreign money is not involved, and, and U.S. and Texas law are clear about that. And so on both of those issues, large Internet companies have a lot of power, and the power that they have over information, what information they allow us to see, how they shape the information that they allow us to see, uh, what they choose to withhold, what they choose to promote. It's obviously tremendous. And in an election year like this one, 
I guess there's never been an election year like this one, but what's all, what already was underway. Uh, folks are concerned as we go into the fall election, uh, big, uh, big issues at stake. And so that's why the lieutenant governor has charged this committee with looking at these issues. And, of course, Texas has passed some very strong election integrity reforms in the area of, of mail ballots. And as far as in-person voting, making sure that uh, poll watchers are allowed to do their jobs, making sure that voters aren't being misled, making sure that they're not being uh, bullied or forced or, or coerced to vote a certain way. Those are all important. Along with that, we have to make sure that the people of Texas are not being misled and, and not, being, uh, not being given false and misleading information. And so uh, this is a big deal for election integrity. And so we're going to call up our first invited witnesses. Uh, if you're here to testify, we, we do have some invited testimony, but everyone is welcome. So after we hear from our invited witnesses, we're going to open up the floor for testimony from everyone. And so uh, there will be electronic kiosks where you can check in. Uh, if we may end up using paper as well if we have some technical difficulties, but everyone who wishes to will have an opportunity to testify today. This, uh, this, chamber, this building, this chamber belongs to the people, and that's who we work for. And so we're going to call up. Our, our first invited witnesses, we're going to call Dan Schneider. <clears throat> and uh, that's the spot is if you'll take a seat over there on my right, your left. Zach Voorhees. Zach, any next to Dan or anyone in those middle two, wherever you is, there you go. And then, uh, and then Ryan Hardy. Thank you, please. You just pick the seat and move your name plate wherever you prefer. Right? It's, a, it's a paper plate, but it's still got your name on it. And so uh, welcome each of you. I'll remind everyone our invited testimony and also our uh, folks who testify later. When you fill out the witness affirmation electronically or uh, on paper, you are swearing an oath. And so all the testimony today is under oath. Everybody's aware of that. We got you on there. Everybody's aware of that. And so with that, uh, the chair calls Dan Schneider, and please go ahead and begin your testimony. Welcome. Mr. Chairman, thank you for... You pull that microphone over close to you as well. Mr. Chairman, thank you for inviting me to testify, members of the committee. Thank you very much. This is a very important issue. It gets to the pull heart... The pull the mic a little closer to you. I'm sorry. It, it gets to the heart of our entire system of government. Uh, uh, my name is Dan Schneider. I'm the vice president at the Media Research Center. For over four decades, MRC has been documenting and exposing media bias. And in recent years, we've added uh, the big tech election interference and other big tech bias in silencing speech. Um, we have launched CensorTrack, which has documented over 7,000 uh, cases of censorship by big tech in inappropriate ways. Um, and much of that is related to elections and trying to uh, impact the outcome of elections. Uh, corporations are allowed to engage in electioneering under Supreme Court doctrine, but there's only it's, it's a narrow path to do that. I have uh, other colleagues who will probably explore that a little more. But what I want to do is point out how big tech tries to influence elections, and it almost always goes in one direction not necessarily in a partisan direction, but these big tech platforms like Google and Facebook and Twitter will have a candidate of choice, a preferred candidate, and any candidate in the way of that individual mm. will be censored, and content supporting that candidate will be silenced. Uh, I will give you some examples. Uh, Google, which I believe is, is the platform that is most notorious and most effective at swaying elections, and Dr. Robert Epstein will, will explain that a, a bit later, I think, um, uh, silences people in nefarious and secretive ways. So uh, we just had four Republican presidential debates over the course of uh, over 100 days. We at the Media Research Center did two studies consistently throughout those 100 days, including the night before each one of those Republican presidential debates. We did a search for Democrat presidential campaign websites and a second search for Republican presidential campaign websites. The Google search results were consistent for 100 straight days. Joe Biden's campaign website was always in the top three of search results, as might be expected. Marianne Williamson was also in the top five. 
Never was Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s campaign website produced by Google. It was completely buried, never to be found. You know, the single greatest threat to Joe Biden's renomination was buried by Google. More surprisingly is what we discovered when we searched for Republican presidential campaign websites. Again, for over 100 days, we did these searches on clean computers throughout the country. Google produced only two campaign websites. The first was Marianne Williamson again. The second was for Will Hurd, who, as I think members of this committee know particularly well, never broke 1% in national polling. And by the time he withdrew from the race, was less than one half of 1%. Those were the only two campaign websites that Google would allow people to find. If you look at the Google News tabs, the great bulk of the, the news links that Google uh, per, permits people to find, 20 times more links to liberal websites than conservative websites. And under, under the Google News tabs, if you search for Trump or Biden or elections, 0% of the links are to right of center media outlets. Uh, this is just, these are just two examples for how Google uh, very specifically and in a very planned and coordinated way, tries to manipulate the way people think about elections and who they vote for. Facebook uh, is on the rise in terms of its censorship. We, we had seen evidence that maybe it was declining its censorship practices, but in just recent weeks, we've seen that it's ramping it up. The most notorious of the Facebook uh, election interference uh, practices was when they, in fact, took down the New York Post story about Hunter Biden laptop and the Biden uh, family practices abroad, which you know, raise serious criminal and legal questions. Uh, these things, these practices are oftentimes to, you know, claimed to be to fight misinformation, disinformation, hate speech, etc. But these big tech platforms worked aggressively to support the idea that Donald Trump was a Russian asset, which we all know is, was fabricated, and did everything they could to, to hide the fact that the Biden family is involved in uh, – in possibly criminal activities. Uh, and of course, they did this right before the 2020 election. We now see a big tech election interference on the rise, not only in America, but overseas. And it's being done very specifically to help the candidate of their choice win the uh, election. Thank you, sir. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you for your testimony. We're going to hear from each of the witnesses and then come back with questions. We'll have some for you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Voorhees, introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Welcome. Um, hi, my name is Zach Voorhees, um, and thank you, Chairman Hughes, uh, Vice Chair Paxton, and members of the committee for listening to my story. Um, I was a Google engineer for eight and a half years and a whistleblower against Google in 2019, risking my career and livelihood to warn the public about Google's plans to meddle in the 2020 election using a program called Machine Learning Fairness. This disclosure was done through Project Veritas. I will briefly mention my background. I graduated in 2006 from the University of Oregon with a triple major in computer science, psychology, and mathematics. I worked on Star Wars and Indiana Jones games before being hired at Google. If you've used Google Earth or YouTube for game consoles, you're familiar with my work. Uh, let's talk about Google's censorship uh, AI system called Machine Learning Fairness. I discovered this program while searching for information about Project Dragonfly, probably a fake project meant to misdirect the public. Make no mistake, machine learning fairness is and has always been the real censorship program, and it is massive. The goal was to, quote, program the public to align with Google's corporate values. Those are their words. Uh, this was a four-step process laid out by the AI ethicist Margaret Mitchell, who has since been fired for um, unethical behavior. Step one, training data are collected and classified. Step two, algorithms are programmed. Step three, media are filtered, ranked, aggregated, or generated. And step four, people like us are programmed. That's a direct quote from their slides. And it wasn't just in one slide, it was littered throughout the company. This process was repeated in a cycle was step four feeding back into step one. This sounds like something out of a conspiracy theory, 
but it's real. Google rewrote their news algorithms, specifically trained on mainstream media stories targeting Trump, such as his fight with Comey. Systems like real-time events, real-time boost, and hive mind assign higher amplification scores to stories related to targeting Trump. Google's internal documents revealed their stance on, quote, algorithmic unfairness. They stated that even factually accurate representations could be considered algorithmically unfair and removed. And let me just quote them. For example, imagine a Google image query for CEOs shows predominantly men. Even if it were a factually accurate representation of the world, it would be algorithmic unfairness. In some cases, it may be appropriate to take no action if the system accurately reflects current reality, while in other cases, it may be desirable to consider how we might help society reach a more fair and equitable state via either product intervention or broader corporate social responsibility efforts, end quote. Let's talk about news ranking. News sites that supported Democrats were ranked with the highest quality and trustworthiness. Here's a partial list. Wall Street Journal, 8.53. CBS News, 6.57. CNN, 6.0. Fox News, 5.2. Russia Today, 4.57. The Young Turks, 2.53. Alex Jones Network, negative 1.56. At the bottom of the list is Next News Network at negative 3.35. Let me reiterate, the foreign propaganda outlet Russia Today was scored seven points higher than the Next News Network, one of the top YouTube news networks in America. Since my disclosure, Next News Network has been permanently demonetized and will soon be bankrupted. These sound more like the actions we'd expect from a Russian propaganda complex. But shockingly, it's the actions of Google. At YouTube, I observed 40 different AIs classifying videos under various labels. Influencers like Dave Rubin were labeled as right-wing news outlets with fake news labels. The justification was always user safety. But in 2020, this system of censorship went so far as to ban mentions of vitamin C, turmeric, and vitamin D during the pandemic. Despite public statements to Congress, Google has many blacklists. Some literally named blacklist.txt. For example, the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution of Ireland, shockingly, was blacklisted from YouTube. Um, this, we, we need to investigate this and we need to put a stop to what's going on and the public needs to know what's going on. There are a few systems that are out there. Um, one of them, my, my colleague, Dr. Robert Epstein, with his tech watch project is the only one that I know that is auditing Google and showing the bias that they're having. Um, and I yield the rest of my time and thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Hardy, welcome, introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Hi, my name is Ryan Hartwig and I was employed by in Phoenix, Arizona from March of 2018 to February of 2020. And for those 23 months, I worked as a content moderator for Facebook under the subcontractor Cognizant Technology Solutions. I personally reviewed over 70,000 pieces of content while working for Facebook and all types of content on both Facebook and Instagram. While working for Facebook, I noticed the company had a particular interest in politics and would often bend or break their own rules with, for example, newsworthy exceptions. Subsequently, I reached out to Project Veritas who provided me with a covert camera I began filming uh, for the next nine months inside Cognizant's content moderation facilities. I published a book analyzing Facebook's practices titled Behind the Mask of Facebook, a whistleblower shocking story of big tech bias and censorship with my co-author co Kent Heckenlively, JD. This past week on Twitter, journalist Michael Schellberger released the Twitter files CIA, showing that members of the intelligence community were involved in an attempted takeover of Twitter's content management system. What I observed at Facebook includes interference in U.S. election activities along with influence in foreign countries. Here are just a few examples of what I observed and documented. In July of 2018, here in Texas, um, a 16-year-old teenager was wearing a MAGA hat and was attacked while eating at a Whataburger in San Antonio. 
Facebook instructed us to delete this viral video seen millions of times because it showed cursing toward a minor, despite there being many instances of the video in which the cursing was bleeped out. We continually flagged political content with the label VI, which had the effect of routing it to Facebook employees for further review. Facebook also instructed us on how to take action on political speech during the 2018, 2018 midterms. They told us to delete the phrase monkeying things up and told us how to interpret the phrase used by Ron DeSantis as hate speech. This was during the 2018 Florida gubernatorial race against Andrew Gillum. Facebook had election training decks for the 2018 midterms, not only for US politics, but globally as well for countries like Poland, Taiwan, Canada, and Argentina. I also had limited access to, access to some training material for Brazilian Facebook employees. Facebook had us monitor, track, and flag content related to Spain's Basque and Catalonian nationalism separatist movement. Facebook instructed us to delete a post in Venezuela, which was a call to arms for the Venezuelan revolution. Facebook specifically instructed us to ignore human smuggling content that explains gaps in border patrols or explain how it's done. Fellow, fellow whistleblowers Tara Rodas and Aaron Stevenson have both shown further evidence on how the US government is involved in human smuggling and trafficking. And um, the last example I wanna share is that I never received any type of legal training from Facebook or any state or government officials on what is deemed election content or with regard to any state or federal election laws. Since 2020, when I came out as a whistleblower, I've done hundreds of interviews on the topic of content moderation in dozens of countries worldwide because the topic of free speech online is a matter of global importance. I helped submit much of this evidence in the Murthy vs. Missouri case in March of 2024 that went to the Supreme Court. Uh, my whistleblower's writ of Qui Tam was in the nature of an amicus brief submitted by Dr. Three Rivers. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court rejected our writ intentionally, mischaracterizing it as an amicus. Dr. Three Rivers is a trustee and counsel for the Hawaiian Nation and the Federation of Indigenous Nations. I also serve as a notary, clerk of courts, and judge for their federation. In addition to serving with the Federation of Indigenous Nations, I also serve as an officer with the Social Media, Social Media Freedom Foundation. Jason Fick, the founder of the foundation, has been fighting to correct the court's application of Section 230 for six years now. He too has been to the Supreme, the Supreme Court twice and is currently headed toward the Supreme Court a third time. After years of litigation, it seems the courts are not interested in resolving the disaster that we face online so I now call upon the Texas legislature to take action against Meta to prevent further disruption of the 2024 local and national elections. Um, I, I myself was born in Alaska and I, I'm, it's an honor to be here in the great state of Texas. Um, and I, I wanna call on all of you, all the members of the committee here to, to take action, to, to help all of America and the world to fight against the tyranny of Meta. And with that, I yield. Thank you for your testimony. Senator, any any questions for the panel? I've got a few, but I want to let the, the uh, Senator Zafferini, you're rec Dean Zafferini, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To any member of the panel or to all, what recommendations would you have for this legislature to take action to address the issues you address? Can I go ahead and speak? Um, my recommendation is uh, subpoenas would be filed uh, against Google for any um, documents that have the name blacklist.txt related to Google, uh, YouTube, um, and their uh, news uh, search corpuses. Um, I would also ask that you subpoena um, their documents related to rankings of media outlets. Um, I've provided a supplemental uh, showing a slide deck including such a list um, that is four years old. It's a bit dated. Uh, the open question now is what are the updated rankings of the uh, media outlets that they have? Um, also, um, you know, machine learning fairness is so huge. I don't even know how you would even swallow that. But if you could do, like, you know, ask them, file a subpoena, ask them for documents related to machine learning fairness. And that is going to be such a huge bombshell that it just needs to get into the public disclosure. So it's those three things, machine learning fairness, blacklists, and uh, their media rankings is just is, is the start of the entire thing. 
Do you have the experience, and if you don't, just say so, to inform us what the cost of such studies would be or such actions? Um, I mean, yeah, I've got a lot of expertise. I, I worked for them for eight and a half years. No, but to give us the information regarding what the legislature would have to spend, what the cost to us would be to take those actions. I'm not familiar with how Senate, like, you know, processes work, but right. I, I've got 950 pages that I've released, so I, I can reduce the cost significantly. All right, thank you. Did you have something? Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention, I mean, yeah, subpoenas are, are great if, if that's possible. Um, I just... I just want to emphasize the importance of having maybe a local liaison with with uh, Meta or Facebook uh, for Texas. It's, it's astounding that that uh, all these countries in the world are being moderated and censored by Facebook, and nobody has a local representative. Like I talked to a legislator in Argentina a couple of years ago, and they 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 wanted a way to contact Facebook or Meta. So I mean, subpoenas are great. Just the, the fact that you know these these companies are are enforcing election law in your state. And I don't know if that's against the law, but if there can be subpoenas issued for that, but at the very least have, you know, force them to have a local liaison um, for Texas. Thank you. Senator, just briefly, um, uh, it's important for you all to, to know that Google and Facebook and these other big tech firms are actually, they've resurrected the Plessy versus Ferguson standard. They believe that not only can they discriminate against people based on political viewpoint, they can and, in fact, do discriminate against people based on race and religion. Facebook just recently took down the side of a religious group specifically because they were concerned that its existence might, might harm uh, people in India. Uh, the, these are the six of, of India. And in the Supreme Court, they have specifically argued that their rights – are greater than the rights uh, than civil rights law created here in the United States. So, what can you do? You can actually subpoena these companies to find out why they think that their rights to discriminate against people based on race, religion, and political viewpoint are valid, and and resurrect uh, the the centuries long tradition of common carrier laws that prohibit uh, discrimination based on these these things when a service is provided broadly. Thank you. What criteria do Facebook and Google use in directing their employees to take certain actions such as labeling content incorrect or inappropriate? Answer that. Yeah. Um, we're not privy to that information. It's a private group that does that, the content moderation policy, um, and their policies are not open uh, for employees to know exactly how they operate. So employees are supposed to take action but don't know the criteria? For uh, the, the, the committees do. But it's it, – that information, as far as I know, is not something that I, as a regular – like, I was not on the content – I was a software engineer, in, independent contributor within the company. So I was only able to get information that was internally available to all employees at the company. Did you have something to add? Yeah, so we, we, we did have – I did have access to the, the criteria. So we called it the – we, we you publicly know it as the community standards, but they have a policy called implementation standards, or IS – that's the, the, the basis for decisions. That's the criteria to take content down. And so it's very lengthy. It's, it's, it was written by their attorneys. But every, every job I would look at, so I'd have, I'd have 30 seconds to make a decision, but I'd have to consult those, those implementation standards. And that was a criteria that Facebook gave us to delete content. It's a constant moving target. What we have seen in disclosed documents is that the policies that may exist at any one point would be overruled by individuals would make unilateral decisions. Uh, but our research shows that in, you know, the candidates who would be taken down were those candidates opposing the preferred uh, individual by these companies. Hillary Clinton, when she was running in 2008, got taken down by Facebook and Google. Uh, in 2016, candidates opposing her were taken down. So it, it, it's done on a bipartisan basis. It's just whoever's threatening the candidate of choice is, is to be targeted. Thank you. And go ahead. Um, if I can add one thing, um, what might be a really cheap way to get at this information is to ask what the decision process was for demonetizing Next News Network, right? Like they're very large, and if you can get that information related to that case, I think that that's going to um, sort of 
illuminate what their decision making processes were for that demonetization. Like they're still demonetized. They've been demonetized for like six months, they're like the top conservative news network on YouTube. And the question is, why did they get demonetized? And if we have the answer to that, we're going to get the answers to a whole bunch of other like um, censorship activities with the company. Thank you. And specifically for you, what was the impact of, the, of your disclosure? The impact um, of my disclosure was, I mean, um, in, in what way? Like To the public reaction. Oh, it was th one of the major stories of 2019, the biggest disclosure by Project Veritas, their biggest story they've ever had. Um, we had two disclosures, one in June when I was anonymous. Um, in August, I came out publicly after being raided by the FBI, including the bomb squad, sheriff's department, and SFPD. Uh, with a standoff that ended at gunpoint. So, um, and it was all due to a wellness check and I just didn't want to come out. And so it just kept on escalating and they shut down the streets from 20th of Valencia to 22nd. And I realized that if I don't come out, they're going to come in. So I came out at gunpoint, surrendered myself and then uh, flew to Washington DC and then went to New York, disclosed, came out as myself. Um, and then ever since I came out, they've left me alone and I haven't heard a peep from them since. And did the social media react to the impact, the reaction of the public? The reaction of the public was massive. Like, it was a massive story. But did the social media react to the response? Did it lead to a change? Any actions? I mean, they, not only did they, I mean, they turned off the censorship for about three months. And then COVID happened. And then the censorship came back. Um, and the person that was busted in the sting operation by the name of Jen Janai, you may have heard that name recently, she was handed Google's entire AI alignment with that Google Gemini thing where it was like there were black Nazis and, you know, the founding fathers were, you know, female Indians, Native Americans. Like, um, that's her thing. Instead of, like, putting her to the side, they elevated her and they gave her the entire AI alignment. And that's the reason why Google's in this hot water right now is because she is the most radical leftist, one of the most radical leftists at the company. And instead of you know, responding to the public outcry, they went in exactly the opposite direction. So uh, with Facebook, some of the results that we've, we have had is, uh, soon after I went public in June of 2020, uh, the, I submitted evidence to Congressman Matt Gates, and that led to a criminal referral to the DOJ for Mark Zuckerberg, because he did, Mark Zuckerberg lied under oath, allegedly lied under oath uh, by testifying that uh, they, they do not censor political content. When he when he testified to Congress about that, and then I also helped with a uh, an FEC complaint against Facebook in Michigan for the John James versus Gary Peters Senate race, um, and also submitted evidence with Laura Loomer's RICO lawsuit um, against uh, Facebook. So the, those are some of the results so far. Um, but as I mentioned, I've, I've spoken to in, to con members of of Congress in, in Brazil and Argentina in other countries as well who are also f facing the same issues that Texas is facing. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. And Dean, with your question on the on the their policies, how they decide what to block, what to promote, you'll recall uh, House Bill 20, uh, which was which this committee moved in 2021 on that topic uh, about being put in Facebook jail that came up in the hearing as I recall. And uh, uh, that case was in front of the U.S. Supreme Court about a month ago. We were there, the Attorney General Paxton uh, and his team defended that case, and we hope, as that case moves forward, that through the discovery process, which you're familiar with, we'll be able to get some of these answers because it really is such a secretive thing, and and, uh, and they have a lot of power. Thank you for your questions, Dean. Members, any other questions for the panel? Senator Birdwell. Thank you, Chairman. May I? I'm, I'm going to ask some very rudimentary questions, if I may. Um, is as a private entity, are any of the biases that you've described purchased by those individuals to be biased that way? Are they selling a preference? Or, or the, so, they're, so they're not just simply doing it of another accord. They're, they're receiving compensation to demonstrate such a bias. Um, any, anybody can answer. Yeah, yeah. So, um, as sort of a liability shield, Google is outsourcing some of their um, alignment decisions to the ADL and SLPC, which are highly – ADL, I mean you're throwing acronyms anti out. Anti-Defamation League, the Southern uh, 
Southern uh, Poverty Law Center. Um, those are the two main ones that I know in which they're outsourcing their decision processes to. Um, a lot of them are internal as well. Um, and it's my belief, but I can't, I don't have any evidence for this right now that they are, um, they have some sort of deal with the, the pharmaceutical cartels. Um, and they were caught um, in collusion with the New York Times. So for example, uh, remember that Cafefe thing that happened uh, 2017? Well, the New York Times had a conversation with them and they deleted the word Cafefe from their Arabic to English translation dictionary, which the original translation is, we will stand up. So if you do the whole tweet, despite the constant negative press, Cafefe, that translated to, despite the negative constant press, we will stand up. They deleted that word and then the Washington Post said, let's use the 22nd Amendment to get rid of the president because he's tweeting nonsense. Well, it's nonsense because they made it nonsense because they deleted it out of their translation dictionary. So um, the New York Times has been talking with them. I believe that the pharmaceutical cartels have been talking with them. Um, and they are outsourcing their decision-making processes to the Anti-Defamation League. And so in, in, in outsourcing, I'll use the word subcontract. Would sure. be inaccurate? So in subcontracting those decisions, the, the entities for which you used to work are expecting some sort of legal protection by saying, you know, we didn't do it, these other folks did it, even though – in my view, as, a, as an old military guy, you're responsible for everything your unit does or fails to do. And if you ask a subordinate to do something, you are just as responsible for the failure of that subordinate as if you did it yourself. Right. And okay. they all, there's also the factor of Section 230, which means that they can't be, um, you know, they have immunity uh, for the content moderation policy decisions that right. they make. And that's what HB 20, uh, if I were yes, – if I recall what we what we dealt with on on 230, so let me let me ask this because I'm, I'm I'm trying to think through what interim hearings are designed to figure out how we might draft legislation. And while I know this is the the, the chairman's main lane, as a common carrier, not just nationally but internationally. Is it possible for Texas to compartmentalize the Googles and the and the Twitters and the Facebooks, kind of like insurance is compartmentalized among the states? You know, you, you can't be a company in Wyoming right now selling insurance in Texas. You have to come get licensed in Texas. Is it possible for Texas law to compel the Googles and the Facebooks of the world to say, if you have an IP ad, and I'm very rudimentary, look, I, I don't know what, I, you know, kind of like Oddball and Kelly's Heroes, I just ride them, I don't know what makes them work, okay? But if I've got an IP address in Texas and I do a Google search, does that take me to the IP of Google in Texas that keeps it from being biased? But other states might still have a biased search in California, Illinois, because without a federal, and I don't look for federal solutions on so many things, but because <laughs> Article One, yeah, Article One says interstate commerce is regulated by the federal government, and of course the way the founders meant regulated was to mean regularly occurring, not just put rocks in the rucksacks of businesses just for the for the fun of it. But <laughs> is that the dynamic we're dealing with? Is to the legislation that this committee might hear in the coming legislative session would compel, kind of like when we, when the federal government broke up Bell into all the regionals, are we basically talking about breaking up Facebook and Google into, if you're in Texas and you search something under Texas law, the Google search engine has to be in Texas and it cannot have these biases without punishment by Texas law. But you might still have the same problem in California, but that's for Californians to figure out. Well, you could, Is that you what could, we're dealing with? I would. Can, can I answer this? Because I got the perfect okay, solution. Ahead. I think the easiest first step for this is to require all searches done in Texas to be proxied through a Texas server. That doesn't mean that they actually have to have a data farm in there. That means that there is a point in Texas that the information has to get through. And if you have that, then you've basically got a center 
that can log the information. There's a paper trail. And right now you don't have that paper trail. It's all tunneling to California or Indiana to one of their, or you, uh, one of the big data centers in the East Coast. So if you would require Google to proxy all traffic as your first step, then you would have that audit trail that you would be able to then have under Texas jurisdiction. There's also one other point that I want to bring up, and that is, is currently um, well, Google's got an Achilles heel, which is their forum selection clause that is in their terms of service. And what this forum selection clause does is it requires that if there's any problem with Google or YouTube or Facebook and all the big tech, you got to sue them in California court, either at their state court or in a district court under their jurisdiction. Um, and I, like I raised $145,000. We sued Google. Um, and that's what happened to us. We all got sent right to California and right into their rigged system. And uh, they're, they're, yeah. Kind of like what we dealt with with New York this past session, like uh -huh. what the issue was. But yeah. yeah. But if you guys can somehow eliminate the form selection clause just for big tech, every single problem that Google does. They're going to be able to be sued in your court system right here in the great state of Texas. Okay. You want to do it. Yeah, just on the first question about the pay to play, uh, basically, are being, be people being paid, are, are companies or people being paid to get um, certain content allowed? Well, is, is somebody writing a, a, a check that says, make me the number one hit when somebody. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so I do know that uh, Jason Fick, who I've worked with closely at FYK, he, his Facebook page had over 30 million followers and he, he was basically, they took, they took down his page and sold it to someone else because he wasn't paying enough in Facebook ads. So that was the premise of his original case against Facebook, which went to the Supreme court. They chose not to hear it. So now he's, he's has a constitutional challenge against the government. But, um, I do know that they have the, the, the VIP X check. So kind of a white list for, for famous people. So if you're really famous, then you can't be taken down. So, and they have certain shields and protections so certain content or persons don't get taken down. Now, is there is there money changing hands? I, I don't know if there's money changing hands. Well, because what but. we have, I, based upon what I tracked, and, and I don't remember all the cases you've mentioned, but I, I think it's a standard assumption of the of the bias of the uh, of our the social media companies for which you you were formerly employed. Yeah. I don't think that's in question. The, the, the challenge before the committee is what's the line of respect for private entity, knowing it's a common carrier, and where's that, where's the point of the fulcrum on that seesaw where the legislation has to be so that we're not going beyond where government shouldn't tell private entities how to run their business. Yeah. But knowing the unique nature of this business, what's fair to the to the public? Yeah. And that's the, the that's a precision weapon that is very difficult to, to figure out. But that's why I asked the question about do do we do something that compels kind of like insurance, <laughs> compels them to break up. Okay, here's Google for Texas, here's Google for and that's, I think, the yeah. process that I think you're telling me we have to start. Am I correct? Well, yeah, Senator, the Supreme Court, of course, as you know, is, is hearing uh, three different cases right now. And we are at risk of losing the First Amendment entirely. Uh, the Google Facebook attorney has argued that our individual rights to free speech are nothing compared to the government's right. Right to free speech, to coordinate with big tech to silence individuals, which of course turns the First Amendment right. upside down. Um, right. If the Supreme Court goes the wrong way on that, there's almost nothing you can do to enforce common carrier laws. Uh, let me suggest another avenue, uh, getting to your previous question. Uh, these big tech firms, it's not, I wouldn't characterize them as subcontracting, but they coordinate, collude, with advertisers and media ratings firms like NewsGuard and Adfantes, and, and then other organizations like the Southern Poverty Law Center and, and uh, ADL um, that used to care about the rights of individuals. And now they're just politically politicized, radical left-wing organizations that exist to silence 
everyday Americans. This collusion, I believe, is in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act and then similar laws at the state level that, that prohibit illegal restraint on trade. So I think that that could be a very good avenue for this committee and for the Attorney General to explore. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Senator. Um, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have just two questions for Mr. Boris. Could you repeat the goal of the Machine Learning Fairness Program? Yeah, it's a four-step process. And uh, Well, and that's my second question, the four steps. Um, what was your first question? So the first question is, I think you stated verbatim the actual goal of that program. Um, the goal was to program the public to align with Google's corporate values. So to program the public. Yes, program the then And that's a quote by Google. Okay. So that's verbatim. That's their stated goal is to program the public. Yeah. In, in fact, the entire uh, quote is uh, people like us are programmed. You'll see in the testimony that I said that people are programmed, but there's different variations of that. The longer variation is people, in parentheses, like us. Like us? Like us okay. are programmed. Okay. And they see their search engine as the method of which they program us. And, and that, that is a four-step program. And um, could you repeat those four steps? The, yes. The four steps um, are step one, training data are collected and classified. Step two, algorithms are programmed. Step three, media are filtered, ranked, aggregated, or generated. Step four, people are programmed. And then this cycle repeats going back to step one. And so by cycling through, they eventually move the population to uh, align with their, with their corporate values. Media are filtered, ranked, aggregated. Or generated. Or generated. Yeah, That's so disturbing. synthetic data, I guess AI, right? Like, we'll just generate data, and uh, articles will, will just generate articles, and then um, aggregate and rank them. So. Thank you for your very disturbing answers. Thank you very much. Senator Parker, you're recognized. Well, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, appreciate you all very much being here today and taking us through uh, your personal experiences. I want to uh, just kind of dive down for a moment with regard to um, – uh, the bias that's obviously uh, coming through these systems. Uh, of course, uh, today in an AI world, uh, it's accelerating dramatically the last 12 months, and you're going to see additional uh, acceleration dramatically the next 24 to 36 months. But I want to know with regard to these uh, decision-making processes, uh, historically, when you were there, uh, what percentage were manual versus those that were an algorithm that was driving uh, the process? So I, I know that when, as a content moderator, moderator, they did tell us that we were training. Part of our job was to train the AI with certain types of imagery. So we would recognize, like, if someone's wearing a bikini versus, you know, a bra or things like that or a swimsuit, we would train the AI that way. So that was one of our functions. Now, now Facebook would dump jobs into our queues, and so they, they, but they could choose what jobs they would dump. So they could. So when Greta, for example, this is a great example. So Greta Thunberg was being attacked by Trump or people are calling her retarded, like a play on words. And so Facebook dumps a lot of jobs into our queues that were of, of people attacking Greta Thunberg. So we, we actioned those manually, but we were actioning all for a week straight. It was all Greta Thunberg because they, Facebook chose what we, what we were moderating manually. So I know there is an AI that goes through and there's one called hive. I think that there's an AI that helps with content moderation. Um, so, there's definitely a component to that. I don't. I didn't have any specific access to what they were doing with the AI and how that filtered, but I do know that they could they could filter words and and dump those into the dump dump those into our our queue. It was called a proactive poll, is when they drop those into our into our queue to moderate. So, yeah. And what you, remind me, what was the last year that you were there involved, just to understand where they were on the life cycle of the technology? Yeah, I was there the last time. I was there, the last month I was there was February of 2020. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the so the AI has just dramatically accelerated probably since that time. Obviously, I'm sure it has. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and I would like to concur. I did briefly date someone that was on the content moderation team uh, at YouTube, and they 
uh, said that they were training artificial intelligence to do the job that they were doing manually. Okay. So does that mean in your assessment that the manual piece is going away completely? At, at, or, or what percentage do you think is manual versus leaving, uh, leaving it to the algorithm? Um, I think it has to be bootstrapped. So uh, the ha it has to be bootstrapped by initial, you know, sort of humans basically say, okay, this is, this is something that we all agree is the way that we want the content moderation to go. And then that is used as the training data for the artificial intelligence, which then takes over. And then they do periodic checks to make sure that it's performing as expected. Very good. Thank but you I just, very much. I just want to note, uh, so in addition to that, I mean, we, we had the, the policies and whatnot, but we had also Facebook could always make newsworthy exceptions anytime they wanted to make an exception for anything. So if, if they decided that, you know, Melissa Milano's doing hate speech for saying that um, – men shouldn't be allowed to law make laws about women's bodies. That's a violation of their hate speech policy, but Facebook made an exception that allowed hate speech for, for Alyssa Milano. Or when Don, Don Lemon said white males are terror threats, Facebook made a newsworthy exception. So they have all these policies in place, but they can change their, their rules willy-nilly. And that process you described, what does that look like? What's the decision tree matrix when it, when it gets to that committee to make that review? What does it take, if you will, to get to that point? Uh, it comes from the top, so so they would you know we would just get a memo or a message from, uh, from from our Facebook superiors, and they would let us know, hey, we're having all these jobs coming in your queue about Don Lemon or Alyssa Milano talking about abortion, and they would just tell they would instruct us specifically how to action it. Action it. So you would actually get a memo from the senior management of the organization. So it would it would stem from the very highest levels uh, down to the operational team. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and and how frequently did you see those kind of memos? that would come out, so to speak, with regard to giving direction to the field operating staff? It could, it could come, we, uh, it could be, be weekly, twice a week, anytime there was a major incident or a possible PR fire, like a public relations incident fire, or something that could cause reputa reputational damage to Facebook, they could, they could give us guidance on that. And, and, yeah. and the memo, do you, and I know it's been a number of years, but <clears throat> when you think back up to those memos, would it be the head of the operational group uh, that you were a part of? I know you were on the engineering team. Or would it come from a, a chief operating officer? Would it come from a CEO? Can you speak to that for a moment? So I wasn't on the, was not on the engineering team, but we, we internally used a group that looked a, a, a tool that look, kind of looks kind of like Facebook called Facebook uh, Workplace. And so it was a post made in the Facebook Workplace by someone at Cognizant. So it wasn't directly from a Facebook employee. But it was many times they would reference, they would say, hey, Facebook asked us to tell you to do this. So it'd be, it was coming from our, our management team internally with Cognizant, but it was, they were telling us that this is what the client wanted. Like we were, we were, made, our client was Facebook, our job was to make them happy. I see. And, and Zach, did you see similar things? What, how would, did it work within the shop when you were there? Can, can you clarify a little bit? Well, just with regard to the comment that was made a moment ago is that you'd get a memo, if you will, from senior management with regard to a particular exception that needed to be granted on something that was a current topic, something that was popular, if you will, out there in the bloodstream of the country or the world. And I'm curious whether or not you would see anything in writing, a chain of command, if you will, any kind of memo that would dictate uh, that something needed to be flagged a particular way or held aside with regard to reflecting the bias of the organization that was coming from a higher level. Right, so uh, yes, but only in the negative. So in order to censor content. Uh, so for example, um, when the Las Vegas uh, massacre happened in October of 2017, um, and also the Pizzagate files, when they came out, for both of those, there was a code red um, in which the whole company got together and said, there is a flood of fake news coming out. And what we need to do is we need to get all of our divisions aligned and to start censoring the information related to these events. Um, and it was, so for example, the Pizzagate thing, which WikiLeaks released, um, that was uh, when fake news became a common house, uh, household name. That created the fake news team and allowed them to design their systems to censor all of the information in America. It was, it was literally Pizzagate. Right, and if you look at Google Trends, you'll see that fake news trended one day after the Pizzagate release uh, the files. Uh, with the Las Vegas massacre, that allowed them to inject their YouTube blacklist, which didn't exist prior to this event. 
And from there, it was like uh, basically covering up, uh, you know, rumors that this was a false flag event. And then it went all the way down to, as I noted, uh, the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution of Ireland. Right. And the last term that I saw when I disclosed this list was AMLO. Now, what does AMLO mean? That is the nickname of the Mexican president at the time. So, you know, they they started off possibly with noble goals, but at the end they were censoring constitutional amendments for our allies and presidential uh, candidates in other countries. Thank you, Zach. And, and one final question. Were you uh, with uh, Google as an employee or a contractor as well? I'm just trying to understand the dynamic. I was a full-time employee. I was a senior software engineer. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. you all being here. Senator Middleton, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so I had a question on, obviously, they're, you know, censoring based on ideology and throttling uh, people's social media and, and news feed and searches. But what about paid sponsored ads? So, you know, where you'll have a, a conservative group, say they're like a pro-life group is trying to advertise their annual gala or something on Facebook or maybe promoted on, on Google. Have, do you think that um, they are actually, you're getting less for your money as a conservative group if you're sponsoring it on and paying for that promotion on Facebook versus a more left liberal group? In other words, you're not getting the same for your, your money. Essentially, the product is not the same product, even though they're advertising. It's supposed to be the same product. <sighs> what, what, let me mention real quickly. Um, what I can say to that is we did have a team called Brand, Brand Integrity. I was not on that team, but they would label certain things as, uh, with, with political content. So uh, they would, if, if, you know, if you're doing an ad about cats, then you, you put someone would pay for an advertisement for cat food, right? So we'd want to label that type of advertisement. So that was called Brand Integrity. So I know that they did, they did label political content a certain way. So that could impact if you're paying for ads, and maybe they could they had a way less. I don't I don't have knowledge of that of what they actually the actions they took. And then the other thing I, I want to mention is that when um, when Kavanaugh was running for the Supreme Court justice, um, Brett Kavanaugh, there were ads. Um, there was a campaign that they were promoting. Facebook was promoting. Told us to make sure to to look make sure to promote it and make sure there was not any fake campaigns for Christine Blasey Ford. So Facebook specifically, specifically had us make sure that that came, campaign didn't have any fakes or and then that, that the correct campaign was promoted. So that's that's one example. Um, and they have, I think, yeah, they have nonprofits who fundraise, and, and that was a fundraiser through Facebook. So it wasn't necessarily an advertisement. Um, th so those are the two things I, I know of that kind of connect to, to that question. Um, I don't know of any price differences. I wish I, I wish I did. Um, what I do know is that the majority of the efforts were based upon outright censorship. Um, you know, hey, this isn't brand safe, or we don't want this for advertisers. Then you know, you're, you're off. Um, you know, emails from Gmail for certain candidates going directly into the spam box are not even being delivered at all. Um, and so that's typically the the way that they did their censorship i don't know of any price differences right senator uh at the media research center we're looking into this question right now we have access to thousands and thousands of ads that were attempted to be placed by political candidates and what we've seen is that republican political candidates their ads are taken down at a far greater rate than than democrats uh and with very uh unequal treatment for example, the Donald Trump campaign tried to place an ad that referenced Antifa, and included in that ad was then a, the Antifa logo. And um, both Google and Facebook took down those ads, claiming that it contained violent representation. Yet, on Facebook, the Antifa account still exists with the same logo. So Donald Trump cannot use the logo, but Antifa can. Now. So far, we have not found a way to determine if people are getting the same bang for the buck. If when a campaign puts a, you know, a Democrat puts a hundred dollars behind behind an ad and a Republican puts a hundred dollars behind an ad, if they have the same reach. As far as we know today, only internal documents could show that. That might be another good way to 
look far, farther into what's going on here. That's what I'm getting at is the fraud and the inducement, and that is fraud. If you're advertising the, a uniform product and you're giving someone uh, basically less bang for their buck and taking their money and giving someone just because of their ideology more bang for their buck, then you have defrauded people. You know, So that is a crime, and that's kind of what I'm getting at here. It, if, in the, if I can just add, that was the nature of the – so I helped with the FEC complaint um, against uh, – and, and – in Michigan, the John James versus Gary Peters Senate race, John James was, um, John James made an ad about transgender sports, and Facebook took it down. And so, Facebook effectively made an in-kind contribution to the campaign of the Democrat. And so that's that's one example. Um, yeah, and I want to add that um, if there was a price difference, um, the way that Google would probably do it is um, they would allow some sort of exploit that a third party uh, system would know about um, and then use that to exploit it. So for example, um, let's say someone places an ad and then there's a bot network that clicks on that ad to generate fake clicks. Um, what Google's role would be in that scenario is that they would allow those fake clicks. They wouldn't register those as fake clicks. And then they would have that shield of liability where they can say, oh, we didn't know that that was like a bot network. But in reality, uh, there might be an internal bug, bug network where people are actually engineers are saying, hey, this is kind of weird, but then it just never gets looked into. If I could just give one quick example, um, you guys may know of Jordan B. Peterson. Um, he got his entire uh, Gmail account, YouTube wiped for uh, like a week. Um, and I was able to see the bug on that. And what happened was a, uh, someone got his email address and uh, some, some people started making similar accounts that were off by one letter. And what happened is that the AI flagged every single account that was related uh, and similar sounding, it just took them all off. Now, the original Gmail account was there for a decade, and all the fake ones were there, uh, were created in the last day, right? And so the question that, that the engineers had is, wait, this seems wrong. Why are we taking down an account that's been here for a decade? Why don't we just take down the other accounts? Like. And that problem was never fixed. So it's my expectation that they have certain exploits that they're giving to third parties and that those third parties are actually doing, you know, the fake clicks or the takedowns and Google's saying, oh, we didn't know. Thank you. Senator Parker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to follow up for a moment on the questioning from uh, Senator Middleton for a moment. Uh, so I understand the blatant blocking, so to speak, that, that you've experienced and what you just described. Uh, but is there a specifically different algorithm uh, for one ideological view versus another on the same topic? Do we know, is there any documentation of it? I mean, you obviously, Zach, had a unique perspective as a senior engineer. Is there a different algorithm uh, between one side of an issue versus the other. I want, you know, I just wanted to kind of I just drive down and get yeah, a yeah, let me, specific answer. Let, let me, yeah, let me give you, it, it's not even secret. Uh, it's their uh, SEO search rankings. Uh, it's like a report that they give out for people that are trying to do search engine optimization. And uh, their page rank algorithm, they're kind of like, they're, they're open about it. And what they plainly state in this is that every single page, topic, or website is given an EAT score. And that is an acronym that stands for Expertise, Authoritativeness, and Trustworthiness. And what they say and how they rank these sites is that they say, well, what does Wikipedia have to say? And this is like all over, like Wikipedia, Wikipedia, Wikipedia. Look, if you get a hit on your Wikipedia page, your website, your campaign is going down, right? If the media is like, they literally say that, what does Wikipedia have to say? What does the mainstream media have to say, you know, on Google News? And the thing is, is that they're ranking all of this biased content. And so all the stuff that the search engine, it's like that cycle that I said, you know, um, they're, they're, they're amplifying their own bias and then they're judging your campaign on their bias and then they're presenting this to the public is this is how we're ranking. So it's not even secret. It's open to the public. Um, and that's how the complex system works. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing that with me. And then, Dan, I'm curious whether or not uh, you and Brent and everybody at the Media Research Center uh, have seen similar, you know, uh, examples or stories specifically to the technical algorithm uh, that's driving 
bias one way or the other beyond just blatant blocking. Just curious as to your thoughts there, what you've seen. Oh, of course, we do not have access to the sure. algorithms. And, and uh, similar to that, it's, it's important when, when we're talking about artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence begins with people drafting algorithms. Yes. And these algorithms are, we know that they're biased based on two factors or two results. One is how we measure the output. Uh, you know, when you know, 20 times as many liberal links on Google News tab versus conservative links. Uh, Dr. Epstein, who will testify later, uh, shows the impact on uh, how people vote, and you know, six to eight million people's sw you know, votes swayed, and he'll testify to that later. Um, but you know, at MRC, what we know is that those algorithms are drafted in a way specifically to achieve outcomes, and. Uh, these outcomes oftentimes are articulated by the corporate leadership. So after the 2016 election, you know, the most senior Google employees specifically had an all-hands-on meeting vowing that, that this would never be allowed to happen again. And their resources were, were put into ch altering future election outcomes, and it's going on to, to this day. Um, and artificial intelligence is only amplifying that. And we've seen it in the most absurd ways, uh, but it's now very visible to the whole, the entire public. Thank you all very much for being here. Oh, yeah. uh, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One other question that is sort of ancillary, I think, around all of this is, um, as you're talking about this goal of programming uh, the public, do you have any data on how um, individuals 18 and younger are targeted, if, if at all, differently than people that are of the age of majority. Um, yeah, and you know, the, the person that actually has a lot of this data is um, Dr. Robert Epstein. Um, I, I would defer to him okay. to, to answer that sort of question, but yes, they do. Um, and there's there's a very disturbing thing that happened, I think it's called Ezra Gate or Elsa Gate. Mm -hmm. um, it's these cartoons that were being cycled on YouTube. They started off great, and then, um, you know, the parents would be like, okay, this is great, and they would leave, and then eventually they would switch to a really messed up cartoon I worked for Lucasfilm for a year, all right? Their licensing department is top. You can't do anything with Star Wars without them knocking on your door. For some reason, there were these cartoon farms that were creating these low-quality cartoons using Spider-Man, Batman, all this stuff involving drug use, alcohol, sexualization. These are aimed at kids. And uh, it was being snuck into these YouTube feeds. And um, at some point, everyone's like, it just – it just caught on fire and became this big thing. And then uh, YouTube took it off and kind of disappeared. But the archives of these videos still exist online. And I think it's called Elsa gate or Ezra gate. I can't remember which one it's called it happened in 2017. Um, but what, what Dr. Robert Epstein has discovered is that it's still happening, but on a lesser extent. And it sounds, it sounds wild, but it, it literally happened. So something that looks positive and wholesome or whatever, safe for kids um, at first glance, but as it continues into the duration of, of the, the video, it becomes something that a parent might have some issues with. So it sort of lures them into a false sense of security. Yeah, it's the up next algorithm. The, the, not, the up next algorithm is, is doing it over time. So it starts off good and then it, it goes Really bad. I think it's an ideological subversion campaign. Like, uh, if you've anyone ever seen like uh, uh, Yuri Bezmenov and his speech about how the KGB was doing their operations, like this perfectly matches like a, a, an ideological subversion campaign in order to spiritually weaken the population so that uh, it's easier to topple a, a government. So that's probably what's going on with that with that campaign. Thank you. Senator, if there's any other questions, thank you. I want to ask a uh, follow-up on one thing. Mr. Hartwell, you were talking about uh, you and uh, Senator uh, 
Parker had a discussion about when you have a, a policy, there was a policy and you would be instructed to uh, make a diversion from that policy. I'm rephrasing slightly. Did you call that newsworthy exceptions? Did I get, am I talking about something else? Help me, help yeah. us identify that process based on your experience there. Yeah, that, that is a correct phrase, newsworthy exceptions. So, you know, we had the, this, this very extensive policy that we, had, we were supposed to follow called implementation standards. But when we would deviate from that was when, you know, only when Facebook told us to. So Facebook t would tell us, uh, the example I gave was um, Don Lemon at one point on live air, on live air said that white males are terror threats. And so if we look at the hate speech policy, I think section 1.3 at the time of that policy, it, of course, that would be a violation of hate speech because you're, ta you're tar targeting a, a um, protected characteristic, a PC the whites and you're calling them ter essentially labeling them terrorists. And so Facebook told us to allow that, allow that phrase, that specific instance of Don Lemon's making that phrase, Facebook told us to ignore the hate speech policies in place and make a newsworthy exception. Okay. That's what I was curious about. Thank you. And then, uh, Mr. Snyder, I was going to ask you, uh, and uh, based on the research you do across social media platforms, we've talked about, uh, Facebook and Google, are there other social media platforms or entities like that that you guys look at and have concerns about? Yes, uh, the, the most the, the two platforms we believe have the most far-reaching impact are Google and Amazon. We've not talked much about Amazon. Its its impacts are um, how it uh, how its work impacts other corporations. Um, that might be a different topic. Yeah, than than the election I issue today, um, but Google and Facebook are the two organizations today that have the greatest impact on people's choices at the at the ballot box. Twitter, of course, uh, is now notorious for what it did in the prior elections, but we've seen a marked change in in the company's practices. But to this day, Elon Musk still says that he will limit the reach of posts <clears throat> that that. X does not prefer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, while we we've seen a great improvement at, at the company, we still do not believe that it properly protects free speech rights. Thank you each for your testimony. Thank you for being here and sharing your experience. It's very helpful to us, and, and uh, people need to hear it. I, I hope well, someone asks a question about foreign uh, agents or stuff. That's coming up on the next panel. We're going to talk a lot. We're going to hear listen a lot about that. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thanks for Thank being you. here. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> and the chair now calls Dr. Robert Epstein, Scott Walter. Daniel Cochran. Mr. Just take that one right there. Excellent. Mr. Walter, either, either of those middle seats that look good to you, they're very similar. You're welcome to it. Mr. Cochran, you pick the one you like. Thank you each for being here. We are sharing microphones, so Professor, pull that microphone over closer to you, Dr. Epstein, and when you're uh, ready, introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Welcome. You're recognized. I'm Dr. Robert Epstein. <clears throat> I've been to Texas many times because my late wife was from Corpus Christi. All right. She was killed, unfortunately, under suspicious circumstances the day after Christmas in 2019. It was during that year that I also first testified before Congress. Uh, Senator Ted Cruz was leading that session, Senate Judiciary. It's also that year that I gave a private briefing to AGs that was led by Ken Paxton. It was at Stanford University. After I came out of that hearing, one of the AGs approached me and said, Dr. Epstein, I don't mean to scare you, he said, but based on what you've told us, I think you're going to be killed in some sort of accident in the next few months. I was not, but my wife was. This could have something to do with the research that I do, because what I'm going to tell you now is how you can make Google and other companies accountable to the public. And 
we want to make sure and get this, get that microphone a little bit closer as you offer your testimony. Thank you for being here. Since 2013, I've been conducting rigorous controlled experiments published in peer-reviewed journals that have identified 10 new forms of influence that the internet has made possible and that are controlled exclusively by big tech companies. These new techniques are among the most powerful forms of influence ever discovered in the behavioral sciences, and they're almost entirely invisible to users, which makes them especially dangerous. I do not exaggerate when I tell you that our great nation unknowingly turned over its elections to big tech companies in 2012. I do not exaggerate when I tell you that the 2020 presidential election was only one of hundreds of elections that Google has flipped without people's knowledge. I do not exaggerate when I tell you that Google has the power this year to shift between 6.4 and 25.5 million votes in the presidential election. In 2019, I told that Senate Judiciary Committee about the threat that Google posed to our democracy, and I, I briefly described two methods for stopping them, one of which you could use. The first method which you could use is to declare their index, a database they use to generate their search results, to be a public commons. That's light-touch regulation that has been repeatedly applied to essential commodities and services in the U.S. for over a century. And believe me, what's in that database now, that's essential, essential services. Information is essential services now. Second method is to set up a large-scale system that will preserve and analyze the actual data that these companies are sending to real users. In other words, to track them, to do to Google what they do to us and our children 24 hours a day. By the time I testified again before Congress in December of last year, we had set up, after eight, uh, seven years of work and spending about $7 million doing so, we had set up our first nationwide monitoring system, which is now, at this moment, preserving data that Google and other companies are sending to our politically balanced panel of more than 14,500 registered voters in all 50 states. We've now preserved more than 90 million of what Google employees call ephemeral experiences, fleeting experiences like search results and YouTube recommendations that impact people, especially people who are undecided, and then disappear, normally leaving no paper trail. That's the key to their power. At this very moment, our monitoring system is revealing a wealth of disturbing examples of how Google and the gang are quietly manipulating our society. For example, right now, Google is sending registered to vote reminders to Democrats at two and a half times the rate at which they're sending them to Republicans. That's happening now, right this minute. Right now, Google's YouTube is recommending shockingly violent and sexual videos to children and teens. Check americasdigitalshield.com for graphic examples. Right now, Google is sending liberally biased search results to liberals, moderates, and conservatives in Texas. Right now, Google's YouTube is recommending liberally biased videos to registered voters in Texas at twice the rate one would expect by chance. We're collecting all these data right now in real time by the millions. But monitoring can stop them. In November 2020, after Senator Cruz sent a threatening letter to the CEO of Google about my research findings, Google that very day stopped its election interference in the Georgia runoff elections. And since we went public with our new nationwide monitoring system in November of 2023, there's just this past November, over the past six months, Google search results have been getting steadily and gradually becoming less politically biased. Monitoring works because it makes them accountable. It creates an archive of data which are normally lost forever. 
I've been working now with DC attorneys to file a complaint against Google with the FEC based on a massive amount of data, which has never been available before. And I'm working with AGs, uh, election integrity groups, such as Cleta Mitchell's group, parenting groups, and others to develop ways of using our monitoring data, using this new archive, to force big tech companies to stand down. We have court admissible data now in 15 states. That's how far $4 million in donations have gotten us over the past year or so. Now we need to rapidly expand the system so that we have court admissible data in all 50 states. It will take about $50 million just one time, one fee only, to make this system permanent and self-sustaining, protecting the entire United States and protecting the integrity of our election system. Without a permanent monitoring system in place, we will be handing over our democracy and the minds of our children, and I have five, to the new tech lords. We will quite literally have no idea what they're doing. Thank you for your testimony. We're going to have some questions for you after we hear from the other witnesses. Thank you for being here. Mr. Walter, welcome. Introduce yourself and uh, give us your testimony. Chairman Hughes, Vice Chairman uh, Paxton, uh, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the honor of testifying. I'm president of the Capital Research Center, where we've studied nonprofit world and politics for decades. An overwhelming majority of Americans want foreign money out of elections, and federal and state laws partially bar this outrageous intrusion, but loopholes remain and abuses continue. That explains why in other states, pressure is growing to close those loopholes. The most notable abuse involves the Swiss foreign national Hans-Jörg Wies, the billionaire who funds the Wies Foundation and its C4 dark money nonprofit, the Berger Action Fund. According to a biography written by his sister, his goal is to, quote, reinterpret the Constitution in the light of progressive politics, a shocking aim for a man who told a newspaper that he, quote, never felt the need to become an American. Federal Election Commission records document he's contributed over $100,000 in direct donations to candidates, an unambiguous illegality. Americans for Public Trust has produced disturbing reports on Vies, one on his giving to state and local ballot initiatives, another on his giving to influence American laws and elections, which total a staggering half billion dollars. Both reports document how Vies' funding flows into the massive dark money network run by Arabella Advisors. Its partisan stance is indisputable. For example, The Atlantic profiled Arabella under this headline, quote, over the past half decade, Democrats have quietly pulled ahead of Republicans in untraceable political spending. One group helped make it happen. The New York Times reports Arabella, quote, has funneled hundreds of millions of dollars through a daisy chain of groups supporting Democrats and progressive causes. Of all Arabella's parts, the most politically active is the 1630 Fund, a C4 dark money group that's received $243 million from Visa's C4. The 1630 fund has spent millions in Texas, including to oppose a local Austin ballot proposition that would have strengthened police. Other recent 1630 fund outlays in Texas include 115,000 to Caldwell Hayes Examiner, 275,000 to Annie's List, 537,000 to Avow, 45,000 to Blue Horizon Texas, uh, 160,000 to Lupe Votes. 50,000 to the Deeds Action Fund, 150,000 to One APIA, Texas, 50,000 to Texas Blue Action Fund, 150,000 to Texas Freedom Network, 200,000 to Mexican American Legislative Policy Council, 575,000 to Move Texas Action Fund, $15,000 to Texas Impact. Of course, a dark money group based in Washington, D.C. may legally fund this kind of partisan work in Texas, but it should only do so with entirely American funds, not hundreds of millions from foreign billionaires. I urge you to investigate the 1630 Fund and the VIS nonprofits. They've claimed the VIS money is kept apart from the election-oriented work, but they've provided no evidence. Arabella's network has also sent additional millions into Texas via its C3 New Venture Fund and its C4 North Fund. For example, 210,000 to Houston in action, 300,000 to OCA Greater Houston, 225,000 to Texas Equal Access Fund, 25,000 to Texas Gun Sense, 150,000 to Texas Organizing Project Education Fund. 
Another significant challenge to election integrity involves C3 public charities that violate legal prohibitions against partisan election work, a prominent abuse on the left for over a decade. Liberal journalist Sasha Eisenberg in his 2013 book, The Victory Lab, reported on the partisan nature of the Voter Participation Center. Quote, even though the group was officially nonpartisan for tax purposes, there was no secret that the goal of all its efforts was to generate new votes for Democrats. Unfortunately, the Voter Participation Center has made grants to Texas charities. For example, uh, it gave the Barbara Jordan Institute 250000 and it gave the Organization of Chinese Americans of Greater Houston 100000 Adding insult to injury, the group demanded in 2021 that Governor Abbott veto the legislature's, quote, anti-voter bill passed in the special session because it bans drive-through and 24-hour voting and places limits on vote by mail. The center's partisan schemes rely on the lack of such election integrity measures. That's why a super PAC founded by the mother of Democratic mega-donor Sam Bankman-Fried urged donors in a 2020 strategy memo to give to the Voter Participation Center and two other left-wing nonprofits because their efforts were the, quote, single most effective tactic for ensuring Democratic victories. The same Super PAC's 2024 strategy memo recommends Democratic donors only give to the third of the 2020 memos endorsed charities, the Voter Registration Project. In 2020, the project did not target Texas, but Texas is a ta target state for 2024. Uh, that project deserves intense scrutiny for its apparent disregard of the law forbidding charities from operating as partisan voter turnout campaigns. America has no shortage of non-charitable groups that may properly engage in partisan turnout, but charities betray their entire reason for being if they step into partisan waters. Another abuse by charities is the private funding of government election offices. The most notorious case is the hundreds of millions of so-called Zuck bucks in 2020. Roughly 350 million of Zuckerberg's 420 million bucks uh, passed through the C3 Center for Tech and Civic Life. The center received an additional $25 million from Arabella's network. The center was founded and is still led by three political operatives who previously worked at the New Organizing Institute, a C4 political nonprofit that Washington Post called the Democratic Party's Hogwarts for digital wizardry. The rank partisanship of the center's donations is clear in Texas. It sent nearly $39 million into 97 local government election offices across Texas in 2020. A whopping 94% of the money went to jurisdictions won by Biden. All 10 of the largest grants went to Biden jurisdictions. The center and all its dealings with those large counties deserve scrutiny. Its rebranded work under the name Alliance for Election Excellence is not, to my knowledge, active in Texas, but you should be on guard against that as well. Lastly, President Biden's Executive Order 14019, Promoting Access to Voting, is another example of improper collusion between nonprofits and government aimed at manipulating elections by ordering federal agencies to boost turnout and weaken election integrity. For example, it encourages finding ways to provide access to vote-by-mail ballot applications. The Executive Order appears to have been prompted by yet another charity, the left-wing Demos Think Tank. It aims for partisan turnout results as the Heritage Foundation's Oversight Project and others have reported. The Oversight Project details numerous federal agencies involved, uh, uh, as, and it also documents the entirely left-leaning, Democratic-aligned nonprofits with which the Biden administration has collaborated. Media reports confirm this. For example, the Washington Examiner's recent report, quote, inside the left-wing dark money voter turnout operation targeting vulnerable patients. This documents how federally funded health centers have partnered with the charity Vote ER to register vulnerable patients. Vote ER has also received funding from Arabella's network. It works with 14 centers in Texas. All this and more deserves investigation and documentation if your state is to maintain elections where it's easy to vote and hard to cheat. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We're going to have some questions after the Mr. Cochran, Mr. Vice Mr. Cochran, welcome. Introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Pack. Thank you, Chairman Hughes, uh, Vice Chair Paxton, members of the committee. My name is Daniel Cochran. I am a senior research associate in the Tech Policy Center at the Heritage Foundation, and it's an honor to appear before you today. 
As the testimony has made clear, big tech is out of control. Not only did these companies like Alphabet, Meta, TikTok, and X threaten free speech, they threaten the heart of what it means to be an American, our tradition of self-government. My fellow witnesses have done an excellent job presenting the ins and outs of big tech's political manipulation. But now you face the daunting challenge of responding to this threat. While there is no silver bullet for addressing big tech political manipulation, I would like to suggest a few ideas as a starting point. In the short term, the committee should, the committee should consider opening an investigation into whether platforms essential for political discourse are in compliance with existing election and campaign finance laws. Manipulating internet searches or user feeds to ensure results, ads, or opinions disproportionately favor one political candidate or party is akin to making a political contribution. But conventional corporate political contributions and related activities are strictly regulated under federal, under federal law and the Texas Election Code. Federal, ban, federal law bans corporations from using their resources to directly support a political campaign. And the Texas Election Code similarly restricts corporations from directly supporting political activities such as partisan get-out-the-vote initiatives, voter identification, or the distribution of political brochures. Despite these restrictions, big tech platforms use their enormous power to shape elections and political information in ways that likely violate the law. They do so in part by pushing voters toward content or sources that may bias their opinions and choices at the ballot box. In response, the committee should consider using its subpoena power to examine all internal policies, practices, and partnerships the platforms already have in place or are putting in place ahead of the November 2024 election. In crafting a subpoena, the committee should, should take into account the following factors. First, the technological methods, tools, and blacklists, as uh, my former witnesses, as my, my fellow witnesses have pointed out, are, that are being used by big tech platforms to censor and restrict accounts, news, and opinions to manipulate the political information ecosystem and inter intervene to influence election outcomes. Second, platforms, policies, commitments, and internal guidance around political content and elections. The committee should specifically look to policies that give these platforms wide discretion to censor disfavored political speech, like so-called misinformation or alter information environments in pursuit of political or social aims. Third, potential collusion between big tech government as well as NGOs or contractors working to manipulate the election and news information ecosystem under the guise of, of combating misinformation or disinformation or hate speech. Four, potential violations of state or federal laws that require corporate disclosure of political activities or that prohibit such activities altogether. In addition to the immediate need to investigate big tech's election practices, legislation is needed to hold these companies accountable and protect our democracy going forward. The following ideas would be an excellent place to start. First, designate certain technical interventions by large internet platforms to knowingly favor or disadvantage a political candidate, party, or advocacy organization as a prohibited or reportable activity under state election law. Second, to the extent platforms convey election information to their users, require that they disclose all factors used to target that information and to determine its visibility or discoverability to individuals. Third, require platforms to provide detailed disclosures about how they enforce their content policies, as well as all ad hoc changes made to algorithms that moderate or otherwise regulate the flow of political content, including the rationale for each change during reporting periods. Four, require platforms to publicly disclose requests by governments or private entities to censor accounts or connected content, as well as the platform's response to each request. Five, mandate that platforms disclose all blacklists used to restrict accounts or content and require them to notify any user added or removed from such lists, including the specific reasons for their inclusion and options for appeal. Finally, consider requiring the largest internet platforms to regularly assess and mitigate the potential for their algorithms to impede the free flow of political information during election years. Assessments should specifically examine the impact of algorithms on the ability of users to communicate and receive information from or about a public official, political candidate, or election on an equal basis, regardless of viewpoint, religion, or political ideology. 
With the 2024 election on the horizon, it is critical for states to use every tool at their disposal to rein in these companies' unchecked power over our political information ecosystem. I am deeply encouraged by the committee's attention to this important issue and welcome any opportunity to engage with you and your staff further. Thank you so much for your consideration and for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Senator, is there any questions for uh, any of the witnesses on the panel? Senator Parker, do you have one? Please proceed. You're recognized, Senator Parker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I first wanted to start uh, with Mr. Walter. Uh, appreciate uh, all of your comments with regard to foreign dollars influencing our elections. We all obviously are extraordinarily concerned with that topic, uh, as we are with everything that's been discussed. Um, but specifically, you, you talked about, obviously, a number of these uh, bad actors, what's taking place, and so forth. Uh, do you have recommendations for us with regard to uh, how best to address it? I know uh, earlier Mr. Epstein's had very specific recommendations with regard to monitoring. I'm just curious about your thoughts on, on uh, what that looks like and how we'd recommend that uh, Texas would attack this challenge. Uh, well, first of all, uh, your own officials have the ability to investigate charities to see if they're in fact carrying out entirely charitable operations, because some of the things I talked about were C3 charities, which, of no course, question. are absolutely not supposed to be involved in partisan activities, and, you know, at this point, that doesn't pass the laugh test. Um, and then on uh, the foreign monies, uh, you know, in the uh, federal legislature, they are considering uh, the possibility of, uh, and conceivably, Texas, I'm not a lawyer, but can I believe Texas could examine such things uh, as if a 501c4, which is allowed to be uh, engage in electoral work. Uh, if a C4 has received money from foreign actors, uh, it would then not be allowed to engage in electoral work, or at least not be allowed to uh, donate to super PACs, uh, because, of course, that's one of the most common ways people uh, believe that foreign money uh, is channeled, right? The foreigner can legally give to the C4, but not to a super PAC. But once he's given to the C4, the C4 can give to a super PAC. Uh, so that's one thing. Another thing is, uh, so there are states, including Ohio, that are considering laws that would say uh, no foreign money going to state or local ballot initiatives. Now, I realize you don't typically have state ballot initiatives. You do sometimes have uh, local ballot initiatives sure. here. So those would be um, – and then, of course, just subpoenaing all of, you know, all of the groups and actors that I described and more uh, richly deserve uh, being subpoenaed on questions like – uh, well, for instance, in the Zuckbuck uh, Charities case, um, we'd like to see everything, all of your communications with local government election offices. That should be on the public record. No, and we've, of course, done a lot here in Texas to address the issue of uh, Zuckerbucks and so forth, so I appreciate your comment there. Uh, when you talk about uh, the influence of foreign dollars, uh, one of the things that comes to mind, just my knowledge globally of some of these things uh, with regard to OFAC filters, uh, is there a role for OFAC filtering, uh, you know, maybe adding this as another component piece to what they do in their review? Just curious as to your thoughts on that as well, if you have any. Well, it's not a subject that, I, that I'm that uh, i expert in, but I think, you know, uh, sunlight is always the best disinfectant, and there's clearly no so much going on here that's very eyebrow-raising um, that the more you can put on the record, just as the other witnesses earlier were saying with the tech companies as well, um, there's so much that we don't know and can't see, uh, even though this is obviously the public's business. No, no, no question. Appreciate your commentary very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Walter, we were each waiting for the right time to say sunlight is the best, best disinfectant. So thank you. That was, it's, and, it, and you're right. It's so true. It's the theme today. And you're so right. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Madam Vice Chair, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Epstein, could you talk a little bit about the up next? algorithm and how that affects uh, political opinion, um, how – I'm always also interested in how that is affecting um, the opinions of children. It's not just the, the up next. It's all of those recommendations along the – usually along the right side of the screen. And uh, that's all ephemeral content, so that's – that's ideal for Google. There was a leak of emails from Google to the Wall Street Journal in 2018 in which Google employees were asking, how can we use ephemeral experiences, their phrase, to change people's views about Trump's travel ban? 
So getting back to YouTube, we are now preserving all of this ephemeral content. We're preserving the up next recommendation. We're preserving all those other recommendations and we're analyzing them for bias. We also have coming out very shortly a paper that was accepted for publication in one of the top scientific journals in the world called Plus One uh, about VME, the video manipulation effect. And it's all about experiments we've run that show the power that those recommendations have to change people's thinking and opinions and votes. And the numbers are very disturbing because what we find is those recommendations can push people who are undecided in either, either direction by 40% or more without anyone having the slightest idea that they have just been manipulated. That's how powerful these recommendations are. Moreover, we have new research that's about to be published showing that if you hit people with the same kind of manipulation over and over and over again, which is exactly what Google and to a lesser extent these other companies do, the numbers just keep going up. In other words, these effects are additive. So in one experiment that we uh, just uh, completed on that topic, we show that if you just hit people once, we can get a shift of 20% in that particular context. If you hit them twice, the numbers double. You hit them three times, the numbers triple. And these companies are hitting people with similarly biased content dozens or hundreds of times in the months leading up to elections. We're talking about unbelievable power. And when it comes to kids, those YouTube videos, they're just not what they seem on the surface. We know because we're collecting them now by the hundreds of thousands. We're seeing the actual content that's coming onto the devices that children and teens are using. And it's extremely, extremely disturbing and parents have no idea that this is occurring. I'm keeping a tally of the number of times we use the word disturbing mm -hmm. um, today. Uh, mm -hmm. So ephemeral experiences. Um, could you define that? These are fleeting experiences uh, which uh, affect the user uh, and then they disappear maybe because you click on a search result which is ephemeral or maybe because you click on a search suggestion which is ephemeral and it disappears. So they affect the user usually but the user clicks on something and then they disappear and they're not stored anywhere. They're gone forever. And that's what is important about the monitoring systems that we have spent eight years developing because we're doing, we are Google's worst nightmare. Because by definition, they rely on the ephemeral nature of content to get away with all of their machinations. They rely on that. They count on that. And we have, dis have developed methods for preserving this content. We're past 90 million of these that we've preserved just over the past year. And if you go to americasdigitalshield.com, you'll see the number going up in real time. And you'll see how many of these we're preserving. And Google can see this too, which means that my life is pretty scary, by the way. And my staff is very brave. We, we take a lot of precautions, but not nearly enough. Did you say earlier that the user, um, when they're interacting with this, the user is somewhat unaware of the influence uh, that this is exercising on them? So it's somewhat, uh, I mean, would you say it's um, subconscious or... Um, Thank you for that wonderful question. I'm going to answer it in a way that will probably surprise you. It'll be disturbing, won't it? <laughs> Everything we have found has been more disturbing than the last thing we have found. Mm -hmm. And this has been continuing now for 11 years. Um... Okay, how do I explain this? We have learned that any particular manipulation that we 
explore in our research, we can mask it. And believe me, if we can mask it, Google can mask it better than we can. We can mask it so that not a single person is aware of the manipulation. Not one. Now, if we do a big study, a big nationwide study, like we did in the U.S. a few years ago with more than 2,000 people in all 50 states, if the study is that big, even with our masking, there's still going to be a few people who see the bias. Very few. But guess what? Their opinions, their opinions shift even farther in the direction of the bias. So merely being able to see the bias, which is very hard, does not protect you from the bias. Why? Because people trust algorithms because they don't know what they are. People trust computers because they think they're inherently objective. So the bias, which is, the, which is par part of the problem here, a big part of the problem, can be hidden. And even when it's not hidden, it still does damage. And now I'm going to tell you about some new work of ours, which will really floor you. All these years, we've been looking at the impact of bias content. And it has unbelievable impact on people. The most vulnerable group, by the way, we've ever found with 80% shifts in undecided voters is moderate Republicans. Mm. It's easy for Google to get shifts of between 20 and 80% of undecided voters. Most vulnerable group we've ever found is moderate Republicans. Mm. Why do you think that is? Not sure. I'm not a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. But... To make matters much worse, we started last year adding another feature on. Not just bias content, but personalized bias content. Because Google takes great pride in personalizing its content. My wife, Misty, loved Google because she considered Google to be her personal shopper. So they personalize content. They brag about their ability to personalize content. Guess what happens when you personalize bias content? The impact is greater. And in the most recent experiment that we completed on this topic, and this is now under review with a journal, in the most recent experiment, in the, in the first shift we get be, before personalization, we get a 20% shift. We show the same content to other people, but personalizing the content. So sending the same content, but sending it from news sources that we know they trust, we get a 60% shift with the same content. That's triple the impact just because they're personalizing. And that's what Google does. When we think about all of these these things, the impact, um, how opinion is influenced um, in all of these different ways. Um, I, I would think, you know, I mean, we're, we're talking about generally speaking, I think you're talking about with adults, generally speaking, but it would seem to me that um, these sorts of things with children have another layer to them um, because Adults' brains are basically the infrastructures uh, fully formed. Um, with a child, that neural infrastructure is forming. And so, would uh, do you have any comments on that? On on the the impact that's different on children than on adults. We've, we've started expanding our research in the last few years to look at the content going to children and the impact it has on children. <clears throat> this is the scariest area of all, because you're quite right. Kids can't protect themselves from biased content or personalized content. They, they don't have the ability yet. They're not skeptical enough. They're not skeptical at all. And Google knows this. One of the leaks from Google a couple of years ago was an eight-minute video made by their advanced products division. It's called The Selfish Ledger. If you look online, you can actually get my annotated transcript to this eight-minute film. It was never meant to be seen outside of Google. It is about the company's ability to re-engineer humanity. 
they call it resequencing human behavior according to, and this echoes something that Zach Voorhees said earlier, according to Google's values. That's in the film. How do you do that? You start with the kids. That's exactly what Adolf Hitler said in Mein Kampf. You start with the kids. And that is what they're doing. And kids are far more vulnerable to all of these manipulations that we've discovered than adults are. Well, thank you for your very disturbing answer as well. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Parker, you're recognized. Um, Dr. Epstein, thank you uh, for your testimony. I get just a question. I mean, obviously, your recommendation to us as a Texas legislative body is to focus on the monitoring, uh, coming back, obviously, to the commentary around transparency and so forth. But uh, I want to better understand your organization for a moment. Are, are, are you all today uh, effectively monitoring all this activity? Obviously, you're capturing all these records. But are, are you looking at uh, just a, a subsection uh, if you will, or some sub-segment sub of all of the, the searches that are taking place in North America or a particular region of the country or the world. Can you kind of speak to that? And then I'd like to just, to the extent um, you, you can share it publicly, I'd like to understand how you're monitoring. Uh, that'll give us some insight, I think, as well as to how to address these challenges for the state. The organization, the American Institute for Behavioral Research and Technology, is a 501c3. It's nonpartisan. Uh, I am the co-founder. I personally lean left politically. The reason I've spoken out on these issues as I have is because I value our country and our system of government much more than I value any particular candidate or party. I hope all of you here would agree with that. Yes. And so the organization uh, started looking at online manipulation back in 2013. Uh, we were stunned, shocked by what we found. I thought that with biased content, we could shift people's votes by 2 or 3 percent. We, in the first experiment we ever ran, we got a shift of 43 percent. I thought it was a mistake, so we repeated it. We got a shift of 66 percent. I said, what is going on here? What's going on? And we've just gone from there. Uh, there were other pieces to your question. Please let, remind me what those are, and I'll answer them. Well, so you are monitoring yourself as an organization, and are you monitoring – how do you make a determination whether or not you monitor a search or not? Are you doing the country as a whole, a subset of uh, a particular geographic region of the United States or North America, or a particular type of search? I just want to kind of understand, understand. what you're collecting, and then I want to understand how you're collecting it, if you wouldn't mind for a moment. The system has grown and changed and matured over the years, but right now what we do is we reach out one by one by one to registered voters. We literally call them on the phone. We try to explain that we're looking for some patriotic people who will let us monitor content coming into their computers. We don't use, uh, as the MRC does, we don't use so-called clean machines because clean machines don't show you what Google is actually sending to real people. We actually have to recruit real people one by one by one, and we make sure that we get a politically balanced group. At this point in time, we've successfully recruited more than 14,500 registered voters politically balanced in all 50 states. And we then install software on their computers. We train them. We vet them. They sign NDAs. And now, whenever they're doing anything of a political nature on their computers, we're getting copies of it. The information is transmitted to us instantly without any identifying information. We preserve their privacy. The information is aggregated, and in real time, the information is being analyzed, and we display summaries of what we're finding on America's digital shield 24 hours a day. Thank you for that uh, excellent overview of kind of the operating program, so to speak. So you're literally calling into uh, known voter rolls across the country, every type of uh, identification, Democrat, Republican, Independent, all of it on a, on a balanced view, and you're installing software on their individual at their discretion, at their request, with their approval explicitly, and you're entering into a, a confidentiality agreement to do so. And then you're capturing that information on your own servers. Is that, is that right? 
That is correct. And um, um, we've also now recruited through these individuals whom we call field agents or watchdogs. We've also now recruited um, uh, more than 3,000 of their children. So this is done with, obviously with the cooperation of their parents. And that's how we're beginning now to collect data that's actually being sent to real children. I have to emphasize here that uh, we're the only group in the world that has ever done this and that is doing this now. I have to emphasize we're the only group in the world that's looking at real content coming into the computers of real people. Everyone else who's tried to look at this issue, they're doing it in ways that are completely invalid scientifically. Doctor, and, and how do you track these 14,500 individuals uh, to be a part of uh, your organization? How do you track them? I mean, you're going to you call them. Kind of take us through that so you understand that a little bit, too, if you don't mind. Well, we have to call a lot of people to find one person who's willing to help us, of course. Uh, we also pay them a token fee, just like the Nielsen Company does with its families. They pay them a token fee each month. We pay our field agents $25 a month uh, to allow them to continue to help us. And But they don't really have to do much once we've signed them up and once the software is working because we're just getting constant flow of data coming from their computers, again, without identifying information. So it's effectively just like the Nielsen rating model where, uh, you know, what's happening during sweeps week or whatever amongst the major networks in the country. Uh, Nielsen was my inspiration, and Nielsen, uh, they've been doing that since 1950. They're now in 47 countries. Uh, they're very careful about their recruiting. They're very careful in protecting the identities of those families. When they think an identity, uh, the identity has been compromised, that family's out, they recruit another family. And we're doing the same thing. We keep a very close eye uh, on our people. Uh, we want to make sure that we're getting valid data all the time. Uh, and I think, frankly, you do want to have a nonprofit or a consortium of nonprofit, nonpartisan organizations doing this. I'm not sure, especially with the federal government, that I would trust the government to do this. Yeah, that's fascinating. And, and, and so all this information that's being collected, how far back does your collection go? I mean, is it based just on um, a storage level, or does it go back to a certain number of years? Or I'm just kind of curious as well. Well, the first system we set up was to monitor the 2016 uh, presidential race, but we only had 95 field agents in 24 states at that time. Uh, by 2022, we had 2,742 field agents located mainly in swing states, because that's where the action is. And then I made the decision to set up a permanent system in all 50 states. So the system has grown and grown. I have to emphasize also one other thing, that right now we have court admissible data that is a representative sample, politically balanced, meeting certain scientific criteria in only 15 states. So right now, if we really want to push Google and these other companies out of this year's elections, we have to very, very rapidly increase our recruitment efforts. Uh, and we have to make sure that we are covering all the uh, swing states uh, fully and, uh, frankly, if we can get into all 50 states with, with representative samples, these companies, they would be insane to continue what they're doing now. Insane. And how do uh, the states or courts access uh, your repository of data? Well, we're working with uh, some AGs. Uh, we're working with a couple of election integrity groups. Uh, some parenting groups, uh, some lawyers in D.C. who are helping us prepare a complaint for the FEC. And frankly, we're all just trying to figure out how can we use these data. That, is, that in fact, is the question because it depends on which laws you're going you're gonna to kind of throw up against the wall to see what sticks. Uh, but the point is if, you, if you, you have to have the data. Last year, the, uh, or was it 2022, the Republican – party sued Google because Google was diverting tens of millions of emails from the RNC into people's spam boxes. So if the RNC sued them, the case got thrown out almost immediately because they had no proof. We have the proof. We have the evidence. And now we have to work together with lots of different people to figure out how best to utilize this proof. But I know how these people think. I'm a nerd myself. I'm a programmer. I have been my whole life. And there's one thing that they take seriously, and that is data. 
the mere fact that we're collecting the data, that is extremely threatening to them because they never imagined that anyone could ever collect ephemeral data. And you know those search suggestions they flash at you when you're just typing a search term? You're being manipulated from the very first character that you type, by the way. We've shown in our research that those search suggestions, if we manipulate them properly in experiments, can turn a 50-50 split among undecided voters into a 90-10 split with no one having the slightest idea that they have been manipulated. Think how fast those things flash up on the screen and then disappear. We're capturing those by the millions. Thank you very much for your testimony, all of you. Uh, Madam Vice Chair, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You mentioned uh, 15 or so states where you have court admissible um, data. Is Texas one of those states? No. And in fact, I'll tell you the actual numbers from Texas. Normally, I don't reveal this, but we have just a, somewhat over 400 field agents in Texas. But we need, because Texas is so, so big, we need 1,600 field agents in Texas before we think we will have uh, data that would be acceptable both for scientific purposes and for the courts. Uh, all we're talking about here is scaling up what we've already figured out how to do. And by the way, that quote from, from Justice Brandeis, what he actually said was, it is said that sunlight is the best of disinfectants and street lamps, the best policemen. Thank you. That's for the record. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dean Zaffron, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The members of this panel and the men members of the previous panel obviously are very knowledgeable, very experienced, very qualified, and have experience as witnesses, I believe. And you seem to be in sync with your testimony, all six of you. There weren't any contradictions that I heard. You seem to be perfectly consistent. And I'm wondering, as you've testified before, have you heard either from Facebook, Google, social media, big tech, call them what you may, have there been any generalized reactions or rebuttals of your collective or individual testimony before any committee, including, well, not ours yet, but any, any committee? May I? Sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we've seen three cases so far in which Google has backed down when they've become aware of certain kinds of data that we are preserving. So we have seen that. And we've been contacted by lots of people uh, in the United States and even from other countries saying, we want to help build these monitoring systems. Or in the case of seven other countries, can you please uh, help us build monitoring systems? My answer has been no, because we're going to build, make sure we have a permanent self-sustaining system in our country first. So yeah, there have been some consequences, some movement forward. But on the other hand, there are problems too, because what I see, and this is engineered by the tech companies, think about it. Think about why they're doing this. I have seen too many of my, my new conservative friends, since my own Friends and relatives won't talk to me anymore. <laughs> but I've seen too many of my new conservative friends. Some of them have become dear friends, by the way. Peter Schweitzer is one of them. And uh, uh, Becca Mercer, another one. And the point is I've seen too many of them obsessed with, with all due respect, foreign money, uh, ballot stuffing, ballot harvesting, uh, all kinds of phenomena like that, which are inherently competitive. They're inherently competitive. Gerrymandering, okay, that's usually one side has had an advantage there when it comes to, but basically even gerrymandering is inherently competitive. The kinds of manipulations that we have been discovering and naming and quantifying, they're fundamentally different in nature because they are not competitive. If the platform itself wants to support a party or a candidate or a cause, there's nothing you can do. If you buy a commercial, Senator Hughes, I can buy two commercials. But if Google wants to support your candidacy, which is 
no chance in hell, absolutely. <laughs> if Google wanted to support your candidacy, no one could counteract what they're doing, and except for the monitoring system that we build, no one would even see what they're doing. It's a fundamentally different kind of manipulation. It's a fundamentally different kind of threat to democracy. President Eisenhower, you're familiar with his farewell speech in which he warned about the rise of the military industrial complex. Go back and look at that speech. He also warned about the rise of a technological elite that will someday control public policy without us knowing. And he warned us to be alert, to beware. And we have not been alert. And I, ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you confidently that since 2012, the technological elite have been in control. Is there a response from the other two witnesses? Uh, and again, what I'm looking for is a generalized response or rebuttal to the collective witch. Sure. Um, uh, Dean, thank you very much for the question. Uh, in the half dozen times I've testified in the U.S. Congress, uh, one political party has never asked me a single question, uh, which I take to indicate something about whether they have a response. Um, the, uh, in the case of the Arabella Network, uh, there is a page on their website that claims uh, that we have uh, had factual inaccuracies and mischaracterized things, but there is not a single example of that, nor have they ever contacted us in our years of research on this with any, uh, with any rebuttal. Um, in the case of Hans Wies and his work, uh, even when I think they were working closely, shall we say, with the Bloomberg News outlet on a story trying to defend him, um, they were still unwilling to provide any evidence whatsoever that monies are segregated in the way they claim to be. Um, so, uh, no, I am, I am not aware. There, I, you will see in the media occasionally in the case of Zuckbucks, uh, it will even be called conspiracy theory, but there's been no criticism whatsoever of any of our statistics relating to it, all of which, uh, you know, like Dr. Epstein, all of our data on Zuckbucks are in spreadsheets posted online and have been from the beginning. You can download uh, the spreadsheets and crunch the numbers yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I, I think the, the most common response I've heard from these social media companies is, well, we just didn't know. It's either we didn't know or it's a, you know, it's a big platform now that we're using algorithms. The algorithm made a mistake. And the problem, I think, that has been reflected across the pa both panels today is the opaqueness of these platforms. The fact that we don't understand how they actually are policing their policies and enforcing their policies is, I would say, the root of the problem. Because we don't understand that, it's impossible for us, really, aside from the work of Dr. Epstein and some of my colleagues who've blown the whistle, it's impossible for us to actually make judgments about did they get it right, did they get it get it wrong? Was this fair, you know, was this intentional or was this something that they uh, just truly made a mistake? I mean, surely there are examples where because they're, you know, they're policing speech for billions of people, literally, I mean, I'm sure mistakes get made, but we can never separate the mistakes from the actual, the actual malice because there's no transparency into these decisions. There's no transparency into their algorithms. There's no transparency into their internal policy processes. I think that's, that's, so that's, I think, the, the response and the answer to that, that rebuttal. Thank you. Let me ask a less open-ended, more specific question, and that is, have their efforts failed in Texas then? Uh, I did mention a couple of things uh, when I was speaking earlier, and you probably can't really see this very well, but do you, do you see three blue lines going down? Blue means liberal bias. Can anyone see that? Maybe if Senator Hughes would just say, yes, it's there, then everyone will believe it. <laughs> okay. But the, these blue lines going down, that's data we're collecting right now in Texas. And it's showing that Google is sending liberally biased content on its search engine to liberals in Texas, moderates in Texas, and conservatives in Texas. They're shameless. They're absolutely shameless. Even though they personalize when they, wanna, when they want to uh, 
to, to further one particular perspective, they, they'll send whatever content they want to everyone. So that's happening right this minute in Texas. And also, you can't really see that, but it's a pie chart that's mainly blue. This is also Texas data right now. This is Texas data today. And this is showing you that on YouTube, Google is, rec is when they recommend news videos to people in Texas, no matter what their party affiliation is, that, uh, that 79, 70, 79% of the news videos they're sending to people in Texas have a liberal bias, uh, which is more than twice uh, the number you'd expect to be sending by chance. So they are manipulating people in Texas right now, and they are sending out registered to vote reminders in Texas at two and a half times the rate to Democrats than to Republicans. That's happening in Texas. And again, if we had a lot more field agents here and did a much deeper analysis, I'm sure we'd find lots more disturbing things that are happening right now in Texas. But that was the basis for my question. The consensus among the members of this panel and the members of the previous panel was basically that the, the big tech was left-leaning, but in Texas, our results are overwhelmingly Republican at the general with statewide level. The legislature is dominated by Republicans, the Senate is, the House is. So that's why my question, have they failed in Texas, based on those results? I, I wouldn't say they've failed. I would say that our data indicate that they are pushing as hard as they can in every single red state, not just Texas, to, to, to push as many people as they can in one direction. That's what they're doing. Obviously, they don't, they don't expect to win in Texas, but they're, they're trying to push as many people as they can in one direction politically. That's the goal. They're not, in other words, they're not skipping some states just because it, that state's going to go red. They're still pushing every possible per person that they can push. And I, 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 I think it's just arrogance on their part, And personally. I'm trying to interpret your data. So then my interpretation based on your latest statement is that perhaps they have been more successful within the Republican Party between moderates and conservatives than between the Republicans and Democrats. Let's put it this way. What we've figured out how to do now, and if you go to AmericasDigitalShield.com, Digital, you'll actually see we have a list of some of the elections they flipped. We have figured out now how to, how to, how to factor out Google from elections. So we could factor out Google's influence in Texas, and we could tell you what the numbers would be. All I can tell you is the numbers in Texas would be even more red than they are now if you factor out Google. And this is critically important in swing states because it's Google that's going to determine who wins each swing state. Bottom line is if you have a projected win margin of 4% or less in any state, Google determines the outcome. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question, Dean. Uh, and, of course, my, my first thought is that, you know, uh, attempted robbery and attempted murder are still crimes, uh, wh whether or not one succeeds. Um, but, the, uh, the, but, but you are right. You know, hu human beings, thank God, uh, do have capacity to think for themselves despite all these various influences we're all talking about. Um, I will say, uh, as an example of, uh, of how uh, people's ability to think for themselves doesn't, isn't yet conquered entirely, uh, George Soros' uh, philanthropies uh, just some months back announced that a number of, I forget if the, if the amount was in the hundreds of thousands, I think it was in the millions of dollars, uh, but a number of grants they had planned to make to uh, Hispanic groups um, to push, uh, get out the vote efforts would not be made. They were being withdrawn, and, you know, that's rather obviously a function of the fact that uh, Hispanic uh, preferences for their George Soros' preferred political party were declining. So, uh, but of course, that only proves all the more that what I'm saying about uh, nonprofits trying to influence elections is in fact happening and is in fact the intention of these uh, entities that by law are absolutely forbidden to be meddling in politics. Thank you. I, I would just add to that, I mean, the, the, a lot of races, including the presidential race in 2020, was really determined by some very, very tight margins in states like Georgia, for instance. And I think the, the point that to Dr. Uh, Epstein's data, I think his data suggests that their greatest influence is where you have very, very 
sort of close political races. So when it comes down to the margins, at the very least, when it comes down to the margins, on the whole, they're going to be able to shift votes. And that will result in different electoral outcomes. I think, to, though, to, to the thrust of your question, Senator, there are other data points to look to in terms of their influence beyond election outcomes. I think Dr. Epstein's research, and frankly, the research Heritage Foundation has been doing for years on the impact of social media on kids. I mean, we now have I mean, mountains of data on how, for instance, social media use at young ages is rewiring, rewiring children's brains and how this is resulting in all kinds of antisocial behaviors. I mean, look at depression rates, look at even harassment online and how that's affecting mental health. I mean, I could go on and on and on. So I would say if you look, if you expand the data points beyond just election outcomes and we're thinking about sort of social influence, how do I, as a young person, for instance, perceive um, the issues of the day? So 150 million Americans use TikTok, which is controlled by ByteDance, a Chinese company, okay, under the influence of the Chinese Communist Party. And ByteDance is mainly, it's what, what, 12, you know, people in their teens or 20s, early 30s? Young Americans are having their worldview shaped by this app, controlled by a foreign adversary, on top of the fact that it's a toxic social media platform. So I think if we look to that data, you can actually see the, the sort of from a larger perspective what the macro influence is on our culture and why it's so, I think, deleterious, not just to our elections, but our social fabric. Okay, thank you. And my third and final question is, are you aware of any Texas universities that are conducting research in this area? Not in my area. So this is a sort of indirect answer. I believe um, there is a – I believe one of your public universities was involved in disinformation research. I, I believe it was – I'm not going to say the name because I can't remember the name, but I believe it was one of your public funded universities was actually involved with doing disinformation research around – and this was the case mentioned earlier um, – Murphy v. Missouri, which was where the Biden administration was coordinating with – social media companies and these third-party groups to identify speech they didn't like and to censor and to suppress it. So from that angle, I think your you know, public universities in this state and other states are involved, and that's probably something that warrants attention as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dean. Senator Bencourt, uh, you're recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, sorry it was late, but we had uh, a, a, a very impor important person to uh, the grassroots uh, uh, take suddenly ill in the next room, and uh, myself uh, was indulged with the chairman for being late this morning. Um, I do want to ask about this two and a half times registration rate uh, in your in your paper, Dr. Epstein. I, I think that was covered earlier, but I just want to make sure I understand the the um, uh, the research basis for this because you people can debate, you know the. Uh, the the uh, bias being sent to liberals, moderates, and conservatives. But when you see a data point where you're, where Google is sending registered to vote reminders to one party at two and a half times greater than the other party, that statistically is way past one sigma, um, you know, and, and that is obviously a, 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 a clear point of bias. If you would elaborate, anybody else can add to this. I'm curious on this. I just want to know what the statistical basis for it is. Let me just go back a little bit in time, first of all, to 2022, because in 2022 we had we had several thousand field agents located mainly in just a few swing states. And in Florida, which was one of them, uh, all day long on Election Day, uh, Democrats were getting go vote reminders on Google's home page, which is seen 500 million times a day just in the United States. Only... 59% of Republicans were getting go vote reminders on that day. That is a blatant and extremely, extremely powerful vote manipulation. So what we're doing now, what we're seeing nationwide is this two and a half times as many registered to vote reminders going to Democrats than to Republicans. Now think ahead a little bit. That's going to turn into partisan mail-in-your-ballot reminders, and then that's going to turn into partisan go-vote reminders. The net impact of those three manipulations is staggering. No, I, that I agree with, because I just want to understand. So there was a clear bias that uh, you saw on GOTV, okay, which is notices going to one party at a much higher rate than the other in Florida. 
And again, I'm just trying to get a statistical basis where that sample of two and a half is it? Is it in the states you're monitoring? Is it in Florida? Is it in Texas? Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Uh, oh because we have, we're, we're getting data 24 hours a day now from the computers of a politically balanced group of more than 14,500 registered voters in all 50 states. And that's where we're getting those data from. We're getting a tremendous amount of data from those people 24 hours a day. And how, how long has this two and a half times the rate trend been going for? That started at roughly uh, beginning of January. It was very uh, a trickle at first, and that's gotten larger now. And at some point, it's going to shift over, and we're going to start to see partisan mail-in your ballot reminders. Well, yeah, because you have three steps. You have a registration step, and then you have an absentee ballot step, and then you have a go vote step. Uh, and you're expecting that shifts to occur, right? Well, we know this from from published data published by Facebook with some of my colleagues at the University of California, San Diego. We know that in 2010, Facebook sent go, go vote reminders on Election Day in 2010, the midterm, to 60 million of its users. And they calculated very cleverly that that caused 340,000 more people to vote that day who otherwise would have stayed home on their sofas. So we know exactly what the impact is going to be of these reminders, and so does Google. And, Mr. Chairman, I would just say that uh, if you have a sample group of 14,500 uh, nationwide, that is a substantial group, and a two-and-a-half times you know, rate is way past a one sigma. It, I'm, you know, I'll do the math here in a little bit, but it shows, you know, very significant and methodical bias, actually, uh, in this case. And I'm just, Scott or uh, Daniel, if you all want to comment on that, I'd be happy to open that up. And thank you for the, letting me ask the question. Uh, well, the only thing I would say is that the, um, in the case of the nonprofits that I was talking about, uh, you can see the same sort of just ridiculous bias. Uh, it is very common for one of these charities, completely forbidden to operate in a partisan way, to spend two-thirds of all their money in an election year on for-profit Democratic micro-targeting firms. So, again, it's, you know, no question whatsoever of the high partisan bias. Right, and that's a follow the money's, you know, uh, obvious conclusion. Daniel? Yeah, I, I think I, going back to something I said earlier, it's the opacity of these these algorithms. So, for instance, we talked about um, Gemini, the the, AI, the the woke Google AI. Sure. They're using Gemini now to police political ads. So, what does that mean if you're in a let's just let's just be really practical. You're in a state race and you want to run an ad, and your opponent wants to run an ad, and Gemini essentially takes your ad down but doesn't take your your opponent's ads down, whether it's a mistake, whether it's explicit bias, whatever it is. Or whether it's just throttling. W right, what, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Right. So, so I'm saying – so the problem is they're integrating the, this throughout their systems and through AI, they're able to – they're able to um, – they're able to do it at a, at a scale and on a, to, to an extent that they weren't able before. And, and even as, uh, as both Ryan and Zach testified, even before it was significant, now, now we're going to see AI in everything, and they're just going to be able to take this to a whole new level. Thank you. Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Epstein, I wanted to follow up on something Senator um, Betancourt mentioned with – uh, as you were discussing these um, go vote reminders are are those back under the category uh, of what you call ephemeral experiences those are those are ephemeral experiences yes uh, you know we're talking about Google's home page now and where they which is usually blank but sometimes they put these mm -hmm. big splashy colorful notices of some sort or other and sometimes those are go vote notices mm -hmm. and i'm telling you that uh, without a monitoring system in place you would never know mm -hmm. never that they're sending these out in a partisan fashion you have to monitor and by the way if legislatures or regulators eventually find out maybe discover some actions they can take some legislation they can pass you won't know that there's compliance unless there are monitoring systems in place. That's been the problem in the, e the EU. The EU has passed very strong laws uh, trying to curtail the activities, especially of Google. 
Uh, but uh, Vestager, the, head, the woman who's in, head of the European Commission that has led those investigations, she recently said they have no idea whether there's compliance. Mm -hmm. They think that Google is aggressively non-compliant, mm -hmm. but they have no way of knowing. Monitoring is critical here. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. So these and, – and these ephemeral, uh, ephemeral experiences – Ephemeral. Are, ephemeral. Ephem thank you. Ephemeral. ephemeral. Thank right. you. Um, these ephemeral experiences are incredibly manipulative. Um, is it too much of a stretch to say that these are basically subliminal manipulation? This is a new form of subliminal manipulation because you don't know it's occurring. You don't know that that particular search suggestion or the news feed or the recommendations, you don't you don't know you're being manipulated. They disappear. They, they're there only briefly. So, yes, this is the new kind of subliminal manipulation. And it's occurring on a scale that has never occurred before. It's not just affecting Americans. It's affecting more than 5 billion people around the world. And by the way, Google doesn't always favor the left. They favor whoever they want to favor so that it suits the company. In Cuba, they favor the right. So as, as we look at this, um, you know, we're talking about election manipulation um, in this context today, but that's really just one, that's a subcategory of all sorts of manipulation that's occurring. Oh, you're, that's right. Okay. So now I'll scare you again. <laughs> Disturb me. Because we have lots of new, new projects and ongoing projects, and we just published a paper uh, on showing that biased search results can change people's views about probably anything at all. In this paper, we show that we can change people's views about sexual orientation, artificial intelligence, and fracking. And what, I, what, what this means is, this is, this is really nuts, because what this means is, that their algorithm around the world is every single day changing the opinions of people who are undecided about something. Whichever way the algorithm goes, it shifts people in that direction. Billions of people without their awareness. When you add in AI to this picture, that means as we move forward here, we're not talking about years, we're talking about weeks or months. Mm -hmm. As we move forward more and more, AIs are going to be deciding what billions of people around the world think. Mm. The matrix. Mm. Um, social engineering on a whole new level. But it's actually here. Mm -hmm. It's here. It's here, and it's monstrously large. I, I, I just can't even tell you how exciting the work we do is and how disturbing, because we keep finding more and more and more of these things and it's nightmarish, exciting and nightmarish. It's so disturbing, especially for those of you who have kids. Mm -hmm. And you think about all of these different phenomena and you think about kids and how vulnerable they are. To me, that's an even bigger issue than the election issue. Mm -hmm. It's much larger. Thank you. Uh, Senators, any other? Uh, Senator Middle, you're recognized. Uh, not, not for the panel, but <clears throat> Senator Betancourt talked about it. A lot of y'all know Bill Sargent. Uh, he's been very active for many years in improving our election administration and election integrity, and uh, he had a, some sort of cardiac episode, so if you'd keep him in your, in your thoughts and prayers here today. Um, and he's at the hospital now. We don't really know the outcome. So. And, Senator, and I was going to suggest at the end of this panel, so let's do this. Nobody is compelled to pray. But we're going to take a moment of silence. Those who want to can pray silently. So, again, uh, someone well known to this committee, a, a wonderful volunteer, uh, expert in elections, and was here prepared to testify. And in the overflow room, had a cardiac event. And so, we we believe he's been revived on the way to the hospital. But let's let's take a moment of silence. Those who want to or are inclined to can pray silently. Nobody has to, but we're going to pray. Those who want to, just for a couple of moments.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Senator Betancourt. If I could add, um, I've sent Ed Johnson, who is well-known, another person. He's at the hospital with uh, Bill and been uh, already in touch with Bill's wife. Um, so, uh, so if you have uh, prayers for everybody that was in the overflow room, I know that was a big shock to a lot of folks. So, um, you know, and uh, but Bill, I like our friend Albera, you know, came and came and came to this committee uh, because he wanted to do it, and that was his uh, his choice. And uh, and and as an 80 year old, uh, he had my highest respect. Uh, because uh, he would, as a constituent of, uh, of, of uh, Senator Middleton's, uh, knew no bounds when it was up to, to make sure that we did the right thing. And uh, so I thank you for his prayers, and uh, let's hope that uh, there's good news for the family. That's right. Thank you. And I thank each member of the panel, Senators. Any, any other questions for these witnesses? Thank you for traveling here, for sharing your research with us. We're going to be following up with you, and please make sure we have all your written testimony. Anything else you want to share with us, thank you very much. has also been charged with evaluating countywide uh, polling place program in Texas, and so we're going to have a, a panel of witnesses to uh, help us work through that. The chair now calls Christina Adkins, Jackie Doyer, and Beth Beasel. Ms. Adkins, Ms. Doyer, Ms. Beasel, welcome. Christina, we got you on that one right there. Thank you very much. Have each of you here, and uh, I know Miss Atkins is a, is an expert, runs a, the elections division, and helps us with a lot of questions. And so, uh, I know you're here as a resource, but we're going to need you. And, and so, uh, on this topic, and probably call you for some others as well. So, I will ask, uh, starting with you, introduce yourself, Miss Atkins. If we know who you are, but tell us who you are and, and give us your testimony. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Christina Adkins, and I am the Director of Elections for the Texas Secretary of State. And I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for inviting us here to speak a little bit about the Countywide Polling Place Program. Um, so what I'd like to do for you right now is just give you a little bit of an overview of how the program works and talk a little bit about some of the legislative history there and then, of course, answer any questions that the committee might have. So the Countywide Polling Place Program, as it's currently known today, uh, was codified in 2009. We had a pilot program first, but then it was put into laws as a permanent program. Uh, what happens in countywide voting is um, if a county is participating in this program, uh, they have the ability to replace their precinct-based polling locations with countywide polling locations on election day. It is an election day program. Um, and so this has the effect of allowing voters in the community to vote at any of the locations that are open on, open on election day rather than just uh, an individual location in their precinct. Um, since this law was put into effect, there have been a number of legislative changes that have addressed certain components of that program. Generally speaking, the legislative changes have served to expand uh, countywide polling places and expand those opportunities. Um, we've seen uh, the expansion of eligible elections. When, the, uh, bill, when this legislation first came to be, um, it was limited to just those elections that occurred in the entirety of the county. Uh, in the ent entirety of the county. Um, over the years, it's been expanded to include other elections, for example, cities and schools that may not span the entirety of the county, but if they're running their election jointly or with the county election official, they can participate in the countywide polling place program or even runoff elections or legislative vacancies, special elections for legislative vacancies that might just take up a portion of the county. Um, in addition to that, uh, when the program was first put into place, it was limited to just those counties that use DRE or direct record electronic voting machines. These are the paperless voting machines. And so uh, the legislature did take action in this area to expand the available voting machines uh, that could be used to include our modern paper-based systems today. 
There have also been a number of other legislative changes to provide some clarifications on the allocation of polling places, the allocation of workers, and how we select and place locations and workers uh, within these election day countywide polling places. To date, there are currently 96 counties in Texas that are participating in the countywide polling place program. These 96 counties contain 14.9 million registered voters, which is approximately 83% of our registered voters in Texas. So on election day, about 83% of our registered voters have access to the countywide polling place program. The Secretary of State's office was charged with administering this program. So in administering this program, counties can apply to participate in the program. There are limits on the number of counties that can apply for any given election. Um, as part of the application process, a county has to have a public hearing where they solicit engagement from the public and um, feedback on the, the idea of moving to countywide and the possible reduction of polling places. They also have to submit an implementation plan that covers things like how, how they're going to reduce their polling location, what their methodology is, how they're going to allocate workers, um, and how they're going to provide notice to the public. Um, in this implementation plan that they submit and in this public hearing that they have, our office is charged with reviewing those materials. Um, we actually have very little discretion on the approval or rejection of counties. Uh, the law is, we're making sure that they meet the requirements, those minimum requirements, and that we don't have more counties applying for a given election um, than we have spots for. After a county is approved for use in the countywide polling place program, they will have their first election where on election day they will utilize countywide polling places, or, or what folks refer to as vote centers. After that election, a county can apply for what we call successful status. Um, if they are deemed successful, that means that they can utilize countywide for any election that they are having in which the county election officer is running the election or any elections conducted jointly with the county. Uh, they don't have to come back for additional applications or approval. At that point, it's up to the county to make those determinations on how and when to utilize countywide. Um, we have a lot of information available on our website. We try to provide guidance to our uh, county election officials on how to apply other election, election day procedures and laws uh, to the countywide polling place program. Um, and I'm available to answer any other specific information or any other specific questions you might have. Thank you for your testimony. We're going to have questions for you shortly, I'm sure. Mr. Order, welcome. Introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present testimony to the committee this morning. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Doyer. I pull, am the legal pull that microphone a little bit closer sure. to the legal policy director for the Honest Elections Project. We are a nonprofit organization dedicated to the de defending the right of every American to vote in free and honest elections. But prior to my role at the Honest Elections Project, I was the deputy and legal director for the Forensic Audit Division at the Texas Secretary of State, where we audited election administration practices to ensure compliance with Texas law and good practice. Uh, countywide voting presents unique challenges for post-election audits and transparency with the public. Uh, to sum it up, the current reporting practices that exist by law for countywide polling places are inconsistent with how voters vote, so it causes there to be a level of opacity with regard to what the results actually were when whether or not processes were followed. Um, when we conducted the audit, we really started at what is reconciliation? What does reconciliation look like? How do we do, you know, just basic reconciliation, the foundation of a model of accountability and transparency? And what we were trying to do was really just validate through comparison. Can we validate that the number of voters who voted is consistent with the number of ballots that we have at the other side of an election? And there were some really unique challenges that existed because the counties that we audited for the 2020 general election were all participants in the countywide polling place program. So we audited Collins. Dallas, Harris, and Tarrant counties. All of them use that program. When we're looking to reconcile those two numbers, the number of voters versus the number of ballots, uh, there's different sources of information that are divorced from each other, but that we would try to balance. And so the, the source of information for the number of voters we're going to look at is a poll book or a poll book roster, some piece of information that is generated from that poll book software. 
what we're going to look at to see the number of ballots cast is going to be something that's generated from the actual voting equipment or the election management software. And so those things are what you would ideally want to look at. But because reporting was and currently is required to be done by precinct or by contest or you see summary level data, it's not very accessible, right? We had the ability in by the authority of, you know, working on this audit under the Secretary of State to be able to request that information, and that is initially what we did. We asked every county to give us a list of polling locations for which there was a discrepancy of 1% or more between the number of voters who voted and the number of poll uh, ballots that you had cast. And three of the counties were able to comply with that, but Harris County was never able to produce a report of that nature. And that's not good for election integrity. But we had to ask for that information because it's not required and it's not readily available in reporting, right? So that information does, however, exist. It's captured by your poll book software because all counties that participate in the countywide polling place program have to have a computerized voter registration system so that you can verify that the voter who shows up at one location in the county has not already voted in some other location in the county. So there is an electronic record that exists there. And there are also records that are captured and generated by your voting equipment and can be, as we learned during conversations with vendors, can be generated to show you what the totals are by polling location. When the public and your general average voter gets a hold of the information that is publicly accessible, the summary reports, your precinct data, that type of information is either impossible to reconcile or very difficult to reconcile, and that is corrosive to confidence in the elections. Um, I have provided some handouts. I wanted to kind of walk through what it looks like, you know, what you see in terms of what's publicly available and what is actually you know, been made available through an open records initiative that Dallas County engaged in. So you should have a packet that looks like this. No. I sent those to Ms. Corkle. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I have one copy, and I can pull it up on my computer if that would help. If if there's, if, like, if y'all have it. Let's do this. If you don't mind, if, let's, if you'll, if you'll give us that hard copy, we'll go make some copies. Okay. We can let these people testify. That sounds great. Is that okay with you? I'm sorry. It's okay with me. We'll let Ms. Beasel testify while we're preparing those hard copies, and then we'll come back to you, Ms. Doyle, if that's okay with you. Okay. Ms. Beasel, are you okay? I know you're prepared, okay. but I was a little bit ahead of when you were expecting. Are you? Uh, no, that's fine. I was expecting to be on at 9 o'clock. So. Right. <laughs> now, as long as you've been coming down here, you weren't really expecting that, were you? <laughs> no, not really. We appreciate you. Welcome back. Not really. And, uh, introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. Okay. Beth Beasel. I'm with Texas Eagle Forum. And Chairman Hughes, I got to tell you, I prepared way too much information, okay. way too much content, but I am reading the room and I'm reading the dais here. So all morning I've been deleting, deleting, and deleting. But I got to tell okay. you, there is a lot That's to okay. say sure. about countywide voting. So what I hope to be able to do for you guys today is to make the case. And is this mic okay where it is? Are you all yes, able to hear me? We can hear you yeah. well. Thank you. Yes, All right, good, good, good. Um, what I hope to be able to do is to make the case that the perceived advantages of countywide voting are not real, nor are they worth the tremendous negatives of countywide voting. Um, she right beside me, I think, will help to make the case. And as uh, the uh, panels before me were talking about technology, 
and countywide voting is full of technology. So I, they couldn't be a better segue to what I'm going to say. Uh, countywide voting has many, many vectors for fraud, many opportunities for voter disenfranchisement. It costs a lot more than precinct only voting, and it is tremendously inefficient. And as we've recently seen, I think the case will be made that it is unconstitutional, just at, ask Matt Rinaldi, and I think it's unwise. And wisdom does need to prevail here. You know, it's not what we want, it's not personal opinion, we need to look to wisdom. Anyway, also, after the complete disaster yesterday in Dallas County, after the severe weather blew through, I don't think anybody here would be able to make the case that countywide voting is a good idea. In Dallas County, we had to close, I think it was 108 locations. They actually asked me to close my vote location. We did. We shut down everything, and that's not mild. We did shut down everything. We were doing the final paperwork, and then the lights came on. So I called one of the candidates, and I said, do you want us to open up? And she said, well, yeah, because most of her votes would be coming out of my vote location. Not a mild thing to do to shut it down. Well, open it up at 5.30 in the morning, shut it down at 3.30 in the afternoon, open it back up at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and then stay till 10.30 at night. And I've had about three and a half hours of sleep and no caffeine. But moving on, before we get um, begin to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of countywide voting, I think we need to ask ourselves, what are we actually trying to achieve? Okay, what are we actually trying to achieve? Be it countywide voting or anything else, addressing problems and solutions in our elections is meaningless outside of the framework of what our overarching goals are and what our standards are for achieving those goals. Bear with me. If countywide voting is the problem and precinct voting is the solution, the discussions surrounding both must be guided by a mutual agreement on what we are trying to accomplish. If I may, I'd humbly suggest that our ultimate goal, what we all want, I think, what we all want is an election that everyone trusts. You use the word confidence, same thing. Not an election that is convenient, not an election that's easy, but election results that we can all trust. Democrats, Republicans, independents, NGOs, industry, lobbyists, nation states, everyone. I think we all want an election that we can trust. However, this trust in our elections does not exist today. Numerous credible pollsters have shown the serious lack of confidence in our elections over the past uh, couple of years, and this lack of confidence is not sustainable in a free republic. So getting to a place where we all trust our elections requires, I believe, addressing the countywide voting problem sooner, not later. So thank you for this opportunity. You're doing that, and I applaud you guys. I am so happy that y'all are taking this bull by the horns. Okay, when discussing the pros and cons of countywide voting, we need to consider the key criteria that we use to measure the merits of or the marks against countywide voting. Hoping that everyone in this room agrees that we must restore trust in our elections, I'd like to suggest that there are four things to get us there. I believe the most sensible way to restore trust is to have an election process that is secure from inside and outside intruders, transparent to all. And again, the previous two panels talked a lot about transparency, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Um, we need an election process that's verifiable by all and of course accessible to all. The question here today I should think is, whether or not countywide voting meets that criteria. And right up front, I'm going to suggest that I don't think it meets or passes muster on any of those fronts. So let me explain by detailing the many marks I have against countywide voting that I see from uh, numerous perspectives. My experience as election judge, as a voter, as a recount poll watcher, and as a student of the nation's premier cyber experts, database analysts, and military operational testing experts. 
I'm not special, but those guys are, and they know their subject matter well. So here you go, and I will try to put it on speed dial, and I did edit out a lot of what I was planning to say earlier. So the number one problem with countywide voting is that it's failure to protect the secrecy of the ballot makes it unconstitutional and therefore I think unacceptable. And again, you can ask Matt Rinaldi about that, and there may be other people you could actually ask about that uh, in the near future. There are other people in this room that will handle the constitutionality uh, unconstitutionality of countywide voting, so I'm not going to go into detail. There are others here that um, are going to be addressing it, and I hope that you will ask some questions because I think they only have two minutes, and I don't think they can pack it in in two minutes, but there's a lot there about the unconstitutionality. Okay, the number two problem in my mind is that countywide voting necessitates the use of electronic poll books. I believe that's a huge drawback and a huge liability because e-poll books are the Achilles heel of countywide voting. Now, I'm going to go quickly over some of my reasons about e-poll books. I had a long list. I'm just going to give you a few highlights. E-poll books, that's electronic poll books. I guess all of you all know that. You've all voted. Okay. Um, electronic poll books actually makes it easier to double vote or triple vote or quadruple vote. We even had that yesterday in my polling place. I had to go to another place to vote because my polling place was shut down, no power. Do y'all all know about the storm that hit? Okay, everybody knows? Okay, eight mile an hour wind. So I went to my daughter's polling place, voted there, plugged in my computer, charged it up, and then went back to from her polling place where I voted. I went back to my polling place. And when our... Um, Power came back on, and we brought everything back online, um, and we invited voters to come in and vote. I don't know why someone was looking up my name, but they said, Beth, you can vote. My name was active eligible. Now, you know and I know why I wouldn't do that. It's against the law. But this system makes it possible. Now, I have other examples from previous years, but that's the most recent. Um, also, electronic poll books allow voter check-in records to be manipulated, and y'all may know the story. I won't go into detail, but my poll books, again, I don't know why things keep happening to me, but in November 2022, midterms, my uh, poll book numbers escalated by thousands a year later. The poll book, that's the check-in records numbers escalated. I did not have voters in the polling place. The numbers were going up, up. The Secretary of State's office put out a statement that was before our um, current wonderful Secretary of State administration here, um, they put out a statement. I happen to believe that um, that doesn't tell the accurate picture. Won't go into those details. Um, another thing that I would not be in favor of, it, there are pros and cons, but electronic publics, because of countywide voting, allow the escalation, the up and down movement of our voter rolls or voter registration database during an election. So if your voter registration database is going up, and by the way, sometimes it goes down. I don't quite understand that. Christina could probably answer that. But it, I believe it makes it almost impossible to audit an election if you don't have a fixed list. There may be an answer, but from a layman's perspective, from an outsider's perspective, I don't see it. Okay, number three, and I'm going to try to keep moving fast. Um, some people have said, well, countywide voting is very, very efficient. I'm going to tell you this could not be further from the truth. So let the record show if there's a record being recorded here. Um, it is, in my humble opinion, very, very inefficient. It starts again with the necessity of using electronic poll books. There's a low reliability in the poll books. They freeze, they won't boot up, or sometimes they just go haywire. Again, I've got personal examples in my own polling place. And then, again, if you have a power outage, you can't vote voters. Now, if we had precinct-only paper ballot paper poll books, you we would not have been shut down, and I would not have had to send away hundreds and hundreds of voters. Poll books are very tedious to manage with mail-in ballot returns, provisional voters, voter uh, mistakes, clerk mistakes. I think they're very rigid and inflexible. And just, yet, just yesterday, 
I had a voter come in. She was not in a precinct. She came into my countywide polling place. We could not make the poll book pull up a proper ballot for her. I don't want to go into details, but it took one hour just to do a provisional ballot. And I was on the phone with the hotline people, and they were great. They were actually great. Um, but it took one hour to go through all these machinations. Anyway, I could go on. Okay, slow check-in. I've got many, many things about here, how slow it is, the check-in process. Again, this call is not about e-poll books. I recognize that. However, in some form of fashion, it really is, because countywide voting necessitates the use of electronic poll books. Okay, moving on. Countywide voting disenfranchises voters. Here's another example right out of my vote location. Had a voter come in, and this was um, a municipal a year ago, had a voter come in out of precinct, taking advantage of the countywide convenience and ease and all that. His voter registration card said he was supposed to vote on a particular, in a particular district for um, co a Dallas College Board of Trustees. We could not make the poll book nor the ballot marking device pull up the ballot that would allow him to vote for his neighbor, next door neighbor, who was running for a Board of Trustees position. Details abound. That's just one example. I think countywide voting has the potential to disenfranchise a lot of voters. Number five, countywide voting closes the door to hand count options. Not to say that you couldn't hand count ballots in a countywide polling location, but with countywide, particularly in early voting, you're going to have, at the close of early voting, you're going to have in that countywide location 14,000 ballots or 11,000 ballots. If you're going to hand count, that's a real, that's a, that's a big climb to hand count that many. But if you're in precinct only, where our precincts are much smaller, you, that is a much more manageable lift to hand count ballots. Number six, uh, countywide voting costs more money. Now, I, I'm not an accountant, and nobody invited me to do a cost analysis, but when I'm looking around at all of this equipment that was ushered in because of countywide voting, I'm not sure which came first, the chicken or the egg. I just know that the two go together, and particularly the e-poll books. But um, we've got this big, do you all know what the big ballot marking device is? It weighs about 35 or 40 pounds. I had to carry it out to a car, do a car vote yesterday. Um, so it's really heavy. Well, this ballot marking device, I know it costs a lot of money. Maybe you know how much it costs. I don't know. We can address that. But $1,000, 2000 3500 I don't know. But when I asked the trainer when we were first trained on this ballot marking device, I, I really couldn't figure it out. And the trainer looked at me with a straight face and literally said, just think of it as a pencil. So we are spending thousands of dollars on a pencil that you could use on a paper ballot and hand mark it with a paper poll book. Just saying, again, that's um, just one example of expense. I, I, I could, there's so much, y'all, uh, there's just so much. Okay, I'm going to skip number seven. Number eight, countywide voting. This is a real problem. Centralizes our voting process and increases the vulnerability factor. Vulnerability from outside intruders, inside intruders, um, because what you have is, like in Dallas County, we have, oh, I don't know, the number varies, 55 to 60 um, countywide vote locations in, in, in our county. We do anywhere from 67 to 70%. A large, large majority of our votes come in to our, um, in our early vote, countywide voting locations. That's, that's a centralized big um, pot that is much more easy to manipulate than if you had in Dallas County 800 different precincts. So if you're going to flip an election or move an election in a particular direction, if we've got precinct-only voting, you've got to manipulate 800 different precincts. It's a lot harder to do. But if you have a few big pots... 
it's just a few, and particularly if they're using technology, it's just a few buttons on a computer screen um, or, or, or keyboard by five guys in Belarus or wherever they are. I don't know. So it's, I believe the case can be made that it's a lot more difficult to manipulate something if it's more decentralized. And there's a lot more to say about decentralization, but I need to move on. And by the way, I'm not saying that we can have a fraud-free election, of course. Um, we have gold standards. And by the way, I am going to give to Katriana our gold standard elections uh, paper uh, for all of you. But I just have a copy of it uh, uh, right up here right now, just one copy. I'm not saying we can have fraud-free elections, but the goal is to have an election that's so transparent and so verifiable that when, not if, but when a cheat happens or when a mistake happens that not, is not necessarily nefarious, we can catch it because it's so transparent and verifiable. We can catch it in the moment or within a day or two. We can catch it correctly and we can correct it. Back to um, our sunlight thing. Okay, number 10, voter turnout. People say with countywide voting, I've heard this. I don't know if y'all have heard this, that voter turnout's better because it's so much more convenient. Here's the thing. Voter turnout may or may not be higher with countywide voting because without the ability to verify our election turnout, our voter re vote results, we have no way to prove what the actual numbers are for turnout. We're told what turnout is, but we have no visibility into these machines, the tabulators, okay? So we really don't know what turnout is, but let's just say turnout is 100% accurate and the number's what it is and, I don't know, 70% turnout, whatever. My question is, is high turnout more important than what I believe the key criteria are, which would be transparency, verifiability, accessibility, security. I think you know the answer. Uh, number 11, countywide voting was never a bottoms up, free market driven solution. It was a top down solution, forcing counties to do a more expensive, less efficient, more cumbersome process that yields little to no trust and who knows what kind of election results. Top-down solutions rarely work when governments decide that it knows, it knows what's best for the consumer. Countywide voting is no different. Last and finally, countywide voting frequently, and I've mentioned this, but I want to hit on it one more time. Countywide voting frequently violates the secrecy of the ballot. So do you know that if you are one voter from your precinct, you're the only voter from your precinct, and you go to a particular vote location, and you vote in that vote location, you're the only precinct voter there. Because of the way we publish our results, we can find out how your, how, who voted that ballot and how you voted. Okay, again, ask Matt Rinaldi. That's what happened. Now, some people might be quick to jump to the conclusion of, oh, well, we just won't publish that information. We will redact. We won't allow the public to see these, um, this data that we now publish. Well, we publish it because it's the law to publish it. And to think that the answer to withhold is to withhold the information, that would be wrong because doing so, withholding the information, is actually forced admission that the secrecy of the ballot is violated and withholding the information for the public doesn't make it secret. It just means that we can't know it, but somebody knows it. And if somebody can see it, they can probably change it, but that's another story. But withholding this information from the public also makes it easier for that information that would be votes and voters to be manipulated. If you don't let us see it, then how would we ever know if this is a legitimate vote or a legitimate voter? So I don't know what we're going to do about the constitutionality of countywide voting. As I said, there are other people here, including an attorney in the room. He knows so much more. I move that we get rid of countywide voting post haste and get back to precinct only voting, which means that we will have to use paper poll books. 
And while you're at it, you might as well give us some paper ballots that are marked with a 60 cents pencil, and we can decide about hand counts later or not. But that's another story. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Best I could do. No, uh, you thank you for your testimony. And uh, and we're going to hear from you in just a moment, Ms. Doyer. And we are going to have to conduct some committee business for a moment, some more committee business based on the previous testimony we just heard. And y'all stay put. We're going to have questions for y'all if you'll give us just a couple of minutes uh, while we do this. And so uh, a lot of testimony this morning about outside uh, influences on Texas elections. And, and interestingly, from the left and the right, we heard the very first witness say uh, these uh, big tech and other entities, it's not always a partisan bias, but it is a bias in favor of their candidate of choice. And it's hidden from the public, and it's illegal corporate contributions. A lot of good reasons. We heard a lot about what's happening, and we all had questions about what may be happening. And so this committee will recall that previously we have exercised our authority under the Senate rules and Texas law to issue subpoenas. We did this a couple of years ago with some uh, financial firms that were uh, – we had evidence and certainly confirmed were, were you know, doing some things they weren't supposed to be doing with some Texas funds, we believe, uh, money that belongs to the people of Texas. So I'm going to walk through that process for the committee. You'll recall – thank you – you'll recall that when we uh, – when the way we handled those subpoenas a couple of years ago, uh, because the committee rules and the Senate rules uh, require a vote of the committee – the committee voted to authorize those subpoenas, and then I made the commitment to the committee that before issuing subpoenas, we'll contact each of these entities, we'll visit with them, we'll be real nice, and we'll try to get the information we need, we'll give them a chance to comply, we'll send a request to them in writing, and we'll let them know in writing that if you do not comply with our request, then a subpoena will be coming. Last time when we did this, most of those entities complied without the necessity of issuing a subpoena. We had to issue only one subpoena to those four different entities. So my humble proposal that I've discussed with each of you individually is that we follow that process here. And so in a moment, there will be a motion in writing offered by Senator Betancourt, and the clerk will read it to make sure we get it right. There will be a motion in writing that you have seen, and of course it's going to be open to the public, that will authorize subpoenas against those entities we heard about this morning. And I can certify, I can attest to you that the, uh, the, uh, the subpoenas would be on the subject matter of our interim charges. Those we heard today, we talked about, my goodness, we talked about some of the influences on children. So the subject of the subpoenas will be limited to our interim charges. That's what this is about. And so I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to ask the clerk to read the motion writing, and then, of course, we'll discuss it and take all whatever we need to do before we vote. But I will uh, – there's a following motion in writing, and I'll ask the clerk to read the motion in writing. I move that the State Affairs Committee of the Senate of the State of Texas, under the hand of the chair of the committee, and as the chair deems appropriate, in accordance with Senate Rule 11.20, Issue one or more subpoenas to compel Alphabet Inc., Meta Platforms Inc., TikTok, PTE Limited, X Corp., or any other relevant company or entity, including any subsidiary or affiliate of one of those companies or entities, as well as any officer, employee, agent, or representative of one of those companies or entities, or of a subsidiary or affiliate of one of those companies or entities, to appear before the committee at a time and location specified in the subpoena. Produce for the inspection of the committee those books, records, documents, and other evidence specified in the subpoena in a manner specified in the subpoena that are in the recipient's possession, custody, or control, or both appear before the committee to testify and produce books, records, documents, and other evidence as provided by the subpoena. Thank you, Madam Clerk. That's the motion, and uh, Senator Bettencourt is the movement. Of course, we can have any discussion and questions about that before we vote. Welcome, Senator. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody got questions or concerns, I'll let Senator Bettencourt, and I'll be happy to talk about it since I'm the one that's asking you all to do it. Madam right. Dean, Thank you're recognized. You. Thank you. Will the books and records, et cetera, produced be available to all the members of the committee? Dean Zeffernie, that's very important. This, the answer is yes, and let me expound on that briefly. By this motion, the chair pursuant to Senate rules and Texas, the, the committee pursuant to Senate rules and Texas law would authorize the chair to issue subpoenas Whatever we get from those subpoenas is not for the chair. It is for the committee. So, yes, ma'am, everything we get, just like last time, is for the whole committee and will be available to the entire committee. And, Mr. Chairman, if I could speak Senator about Bettencourt. last time, I think in my experience was 
this was a very important step because, as the, as the chairman already indicated, three out of the four companies complied just by, uh, by written request, uh, and this was only used with one company. But that information was, en it was enlightening uh, to what we're looking at, and I think we've got areas here uh, that relate to the charges that are specific for the committee. Um, but, you know, as more testimony comes in, like the monitoring issue that we heard today, um, this is the type of information that we'll need to be able to construct a monitoring bill of, uh, because that would appear to be what the, one of the things that's coming out of, the, uh, out of this testimony. I can't speak for the committee, can't speak for the chairman, but I can speak for myself. Uh, and that's why I, I wish to, uh, to uh, make the motion to authorize these subpoenas. Members, any questions at all? We don't want to rush this process. It's not something we do every day, but we do take it seriously. And, and as the committee knows, whatever evidence we, did, we, we uncover will be shared with the committee. And as a committee, we'll follow the evidence wherever it takes us, whatever we find. And uh, this is about sunshine and about uh, streetlights. Uh, this, is, this is what we do around here, and it's great for us to be able to come together and do this. So if there are no questions on Senator Betancourt's motion, we'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Betancourt? Aye. Birdwell? Aye. Lamantia? Aye. Menendez? Aye. Middleton? Aye. Parker? Aye. Perry? Aye. Schwartner? Aye. Zaffarini? Aye. Paxton? Aye. Hughes? Yes. There being 11 ayes and no nays, the vote is unanimous. Uh, I thank each of the members. We will take your trust seriously and work with you and alongside you and, and your teams and all the people we represent to get this done right. So thank you very much. I thank the witnesses and folks here for letting us pause to do that because sending subpoenas is a big deal. A two-thirds vote is required. And so when we have the committee together, we have to take advantage of that, having heard the evidence this morning. So I thank you each. And thank you for your testimony, Ms. Beasel. We're going to have questions for you in just a couple of moments. Uh, I hear it's not rude to point if you use two fingers. Is that right? <laughs> My mother doesn't like that. Even when I hear with two fingers, it's okay. It's, it's a friendly point. Uh, Ms. Doyer, you, you were so kind to open, and then we were able to get your document distributed. So we'll recognize you again. And please uh, tell us who you are again and offer us your testimony. Sure. Thank you, Senator. And my name is Jacqueline Doyer. I'm the Legal Policy Director for the Honest Elections Project. And what I had testified about previously was that current reporting practices with regard to countywide polling place counties can create some some problems right in terms of whether or not it's transparent to the voter and what an auditor can look at now reconciliation can be done our division did it when we audited the four counties for the 2020 general election it took requests from the counties it took going to the counties and looking at very detailed level records and it can be done and when that type of reconciliation is done you can identify locations where there might be issues we found a, a location in dallas county where the flash drive never made it back and was never tabulated there was significant breaches in chain of custody in harris county but when those reconciliations are done you know from the audit perspective and that type of reporting is transparent and accessible to the public it increases confidence in election results and that is ultimately what everybody wants um, it is easy to talk about in the abstract. I find it much uh, easier to understand if you can look at, you know, an example. And so hopefully, thank you for your patience, this example will illustrate where some of the limitations are in terms of reporting. All of this data is from Dallas County. Um, under a new administration, they have started an open records initiative where they are putting a lot of their election records up on a like data portal that's accessible to the public. While all of these records are public records and can be requested through a Public Information Act request, yeah. these are not all ordinarily available to the average voter. You would have to go through the process of requesting these through a FOIA or Public Information Act request. Yeah. But the first few are what you would take typically see. So Dallas is a participant in the countywide polling place program. Figure one represents that summary results report. So it's going to show you the total number of ballots cast. And you can see that number is 231, 465,000. If you wanted to look down at uh, results by a particular contest, that's what figure two would show you the results for the presidential race in the Republican 
primary and you can see the total number of votes cast. And I want to differentiate between votes and ballots because when we're conducting reconciliation, we're looking at the number of ballots cast, right? You can have somebody that walks into a polling location and might mark two candidates and so that's an overvote. The ballot card is still there. It's still a, you can still account for it in a poll book check-in, right? You should have one and one. However, that won't count as an actual vote for a candidate because there's two. You can have the opposite, an undervote, right? I might go Go in and I know my best friend is running for a particular judicial district. I'm only going in to vote for her race. And so everything else I might leave blank. That's an undervote. But the ballot card is still there. And so right there, though, you see the numbers can already cause confusion to the average voter. Not everyone is going to know what an overvote or an undervote is or how to reconcile that. But if you do, it does correlate to what you see in terms of the totals for the Republican ballots cast. If you look at the next page, figure three, you know, this legislature has already made some tremendous strides in terms of, you know, requiring reconciliation at the countywide level. So this is a new form required by Texas's Senate Bill 1. Their reconciliation form is looking at number of voters and number of ballots. And that figure that's uh, boxed around figure in M, 231,465, it matches, which you see coming out of the voting equipment uh, system, the software system, in figures one and two. That, that total matches. That's something that we can feel good about. But the limitation here is that it's countywide level data, right? So you're not looking at the individual polling locations to see whether things are working well at the polling location level. I'll give a quick example of how this could uh, might matriculate. In Dallas County, when we got that list of locations that had discrepancies, overall, the number of voters versus ballots was pretty balanced. When we started looking polling location by polling location, that's when we found the flash drive that never made it into tabulation. So you can do a countywide reconciliation and things look decent, but then when you start going polling location by polling location, mm. you might uncover areas where there needs to be some work, further training, things of that nature. So if you flip the page one more time, uh, this is a summary results report for Precinct 1004 in the Republican primary. I can see that there were 149 ballots that were cast at some countywide polling location. We don't know which one in the county of Dallas, but that's really as far as you can get with what is publicly available. So if I'm a member of the public and I wanted to try to do a reconciliation or I wanted to see if this balanced, that's as far as you can get with what is typically publicly available on a county's website or on the Secretary of State's website. Now, Dallas, like I said, they've made far more records available and, and should be applauded for this effort. Um, if you flip the page, you'll see that they've published their election day roster. So if I take that roster and sort it and filter it by the precinct and the Republican primary, I can see I have 148 voters who voted. And if you looked at the report before, I had 149. So that's fairly close. But if you have questions or wanted to know, well, what happened or why is it off by one, that's as far as you can get based on the current state of reporting in Texas. Because these voters all voted, but they all voted at different polling locations because we use countywide voting. So there are, but there are solutions, right? I mean, this data does exist and it is captured. It's just a matter of compiling it and requiring it that, be, that it be reported and publicly accessible. So if you flip the page, Dallas, again, has already done some of this, and we can kind of see how this would work in practice. Um, you see voter turnout by location. The poll code is V0003. They had 79 voters who voted at that recreation center. So that's that first part of the reconciliation. We're looking at the number of voters who voted. If you turn the page again, using that website roster, and you can sort it by polling location, you see 79 voters who checked in to vote. So those two numbers are consistent. One limitation of poll book records is that they are generally snapshots in time, right? Dallas does this. They're proactive. They take a snapshot of poll book check-ins at different points in an election. That is something that should be required, that we take these snapshots, because what ends up happening is these poll book records get exported from the poll book system, integrated into a voter registration database, and then uploaded to the state. Or if they are online or they participate in the statewide voter registration database, then those are automatically getting sent up to the state. Any changes that occur to those voter registration records will change what the data looks like just because it's a living database. 
and I'll give an example. When we were doing the audit of the 2020 election, we were in 2022. When we asked for vote history files, who had credit for voting, those, those, that data looked very different in 2022 than it would have looked in 2020 had a snapshot occurred. There was redistricting that had happened. We had voters who had moved. There was list maintenance that occurred. So requiring snapshots in time is critical to this transparency. So you have these 79 voters, according to that record, at that location. Now, if I'm looking for that other piece, how many ballots are cast, then I want to look at what's been generated from the voting equipment. Dallas puts on their website the tapes that are coming from the equipment. Um, and if you look here at what they've published, I have a public count of 125 ballots that have been processed. So that's going to cause questions, right? People are going to have questions about what's going on. So I know from our experience that there are other records that might help me in determining why is there this discrepancy. So if you flip the page again, there are official ballot and seal certificates that the election judges have to fill out. They must sign them. And they're um, line, and section two, line B, they read this off of the actual tabulator in the polling location at the end of the night. There were 79 ballots, according to this record, and witnessed by two election judges. That makes me think perhaps there was an issue with the tape or the record that purports to be from that polling location. The way for me to identify whether that is my hypothesis is accurate is to look for other tape records. So if you flip the page again, you see the zero totals report because at the beginning of the day, they also print a tape from the voting equipment to show that no ballots have been cast on that particular piece of equipment. And I see that's correct. There were no ballots. But if you flip the page one more time, I think we'll see get to the root of the issue. The difference between the zero totals report and the voting results report are the serial numbers on the tabulators, the precinct tabulators, which indicates that there was probably a mistake in labeling one of the tapes as having come from B0003 when it really wasn't from that location. But that's something that I was able to do by piecing together multiple pieces of information based on my training and experience where that is not in the ordinary voters access. And then I wanted to show you what it would look like ideally if you were to be able to reconcile. The very next location, V0005, shows 511 voters that checked in. The voter roster shows 511 voters that checked in. And then the results tape shows 511 voters that checked in. And that's what you would ideally want to see. And if I'm a voter that voted at that particular location, I feel pretty confident that my ballot was properly processed and cast. And that's what we want for all voters, right? So there are some gaps in terms of what's legally required to be reported in terms of data and opportunities for improvement to that process to bring more transparency to the process. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you each for your testimony. I, uh, I've got some questions, but I want to yield to the members of the committee, and my questions will probably be covered. So uh, any members of the committee have questions? Senator Perry, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman Hughes. Um, sorry, my commercial airline today or my company airline was a little bit off pace. So. Uh, and I'm Senator, sorry I missed did, part of the testimony. I'm, but Senator, yes. I'm sorry. Did I understand Y'all so took the off air. from Lubbock and then... Yeah, so just just commentary. We're in the air and they decide that the oil may not be right. So I don't know. <laughs> I'm just saying it's kind of that old adage, sit in the front or the back based on weight. How many pounds is too many? So I, I'm not sure, but uh, it is traveling the 21st century. We're glad you're here. Uh, a couple of things that, that you said, and, and, and let me kind of layman's perspective. I'm not an expert in this. I really am not. Don't claim to be. But... Basically, what you've just said is we can get there. It's just not easy. Is that a fair statement, first of all? Yes, I and, would agree with that. And, and I guess the, the perception is or the, or the driver behind the conversation is public transparency so that the average Joe could literally look at something and say it's accurate. Is that, is that kind of what we objective of the day would be from your perspective? Yes, Senator, that, that and, you know, people are asking questions about elections. Sure. They, they want to understand. They have a right to understand. And if we can make it such that they can understand and, it. And I, I'm going to go there a couple of things that just for food for thought or ponder, and they may have no um, way to implement, but a couple of things. First of all, it's complicated. Let's say that uh, we'd like to make it. Uh, 
as transparent and easy as possible. The truth of the matter is, we got people involved. Anytime you get people involved, it's not it's not easy. So, and we've accommodated the voter to the point that they can do so many different ways to have their vote counted that the reconciliation part of that process is tenuous. And, and tedious and requires a lot of knowledge on how the back end of the system works to reconcile. And, and you can get there, but it's not for the average citizen. So, so I'd, I'd just caveat is I don't know that it's ever going to be as easy as we would like for it to be. And the, and the conversation today is countywide voting or are, are adding a complexity level that's unnecessary. That's what I'm discerning. So a couple of things you said, you know, on a, on a whole level, and speaking to Dallas and it's page three, you said – we determined there was not a flash drive turned in. Mm -hmm. And and so that that gives me a lot of pause for a lot of different reasons, but I guess the conversation is that it was close and on a 10,000 foot view it looks okay, but then we, we got behind the weeds and figured out that a flash drive, had you not done that, a flash drive wouldn't have been counted, correct? Well, by the, the flash drive wasn't counted, I guess. That's correct. And that gives me a lot of heartburn because uh, it's really easy to, to, to lose a flash drive conveniently. So, so I understand, but but let's go to the root, what the root of that. It's human error, right? It wasn't a system error; it was a human error, and the system provided a reconciliation opportunity that, because of our timing, is too tight to catch it and have the votes counted. So. Will we ever be able to eliminate human error? And the absolute answer to that, if you're honest, is no. No. Even under a hand ballot, what do we have with hanging chads and then we had fill-in ballots? And we, so we've tried every version in the world, but you're always going to have the human factor. Secondly, you made a statement, and I, I, I get the nuance. If you're uploading to the election database at the statewide level, so if I'm in Lubbock, Texas, and want to know what the race did in Dallas County, it's there for me. So that upload is not real time. It's batched, I would assume. So depending on when you're looking, and then there's a final cutoff where we're not going to count any more votes. We're, we're going to say this is it. So in order to kind of expedite the audit process, I'm going to make a statement if I'm wrong. Just tell me. I would assume you can pull, and maybe you can't, a date range to know that you've got the full universe of votes at some point from both locals pre-upload and prior to. You made a statement, we need a snapshot. That's too complicated to, to take a picture today and say, this is what we sent. Because you know that there's going to be, subsequent to that, changes made. So if there's a date in the system that you can pull both that local and can compare it to the same date range all uploads, why would you not be able to reconcile the two? In other words, if it's real time, that's one thing. If it's batch driven, that's another thing. But there ought to be a way to pull a batch date that is synchronized with the final acceptance at the Secretary of State and that produce without having to go through all these hoops to, to reconcile. Is that so you know I what I'm asking? I think so. I can't speak specifically to the statewide voter registration database, how it works and how those batch results are processed. That would be more appropriate for Ms. Adkins. What I can tell you is dur during the audit, they were not in the process of capturing that data as it existed at the time because the audits were new. Once counties knew and we were training them that this is something we were going to be doing, we were going to be doing these reconciliations, they were capturing the data as it was being exported from the poll book so that they had that snapshot in time. And it doesn't need to be daily snapshots, but at critical points in the election, right? So, you know, right before the election begins, after early voting, election night, and after any late arriving, you know, ballots have been processed and provisional. So you're really talking about four snapshots that would look at things in that, in that order. That way you can capture all of the activity for a particular election. And so the... So I'd, I'd guess... When you just when you say snapshot from a an old accountant slash programmer's language, is that a physical barrier you cannot add or take away from prior, and, and you can still go back and get it, or is that can still from on this day forward there still can be changes made to that data? Because if you're going to have a real time system effectively, you're never going to have a snapshot that makes sense. You you would have 
issue when this is something we had to deal with during the audit, right? Is if you're do, even if you have those snapshots, what has changed in between the snapshots? And, but that's a lot easier to analyze when you have discrete points in time when they're captured. Versus you got less amount to look at, I guess, is what you're saying. But if you're having an electronic connection and you and you can date range it, so you don't care if it was, you know, my area early voting's this many days versus this many days in some same same area. So those those specific cutoffs, and then you'd have to get into the weeds of when that cutoff. And I guess if, if I'm asking, can we not pull it from just dates? to say this is when we know this should have been a, quote, preliminary final without subject to mail-ins and, and provisionals and stuff being counted to know and, and avoid a lot of the work that you had to do to get there. I mean, is there not an easier way to capture uh, those reports by date? So it was my understanding all four of these counties are what we call offline counties where they're not using this, the state's database to manage voter registration. They use a vendor to manage voter registration. And so all of those counties, they were offline. They were not able to generate anything that was tied to a specific date range. They were able to give you the current and that would give you who had voted in that county in that election in, in 2020. But that may not be the full picture because things had changed, obviously, in those two years. So that might be more a limitation of an offline versus an online county. And like I said, I think the statewide registration system would be more appropriate for Ms. Adkins. Yeah, I, I can appreciate that. I guess I'm trying to get to what is the ultimate. When we say we're done, it's the Secretary of State's records, right? They canvass them and we come down here and vote on them, correct? <clears throat> yes, sir. I think what we're talking about here is actually two different types of data. So I think what Ms. Doyer was, rep was um, referencing was voter registration data and snapshots of what our voter registration list is at certain points in time. So just the voters. And I agree with her. I, I do think that um, a, a county, I think it's probably as simple as uh, downloading a specific report and retaining that report so it's a record as of a certain date um, is something that would help provide some of that clarity in the process. The voter registration list, so the actual people that voted, that is different than the results from an election. When a county locally has their election and they tabulate their results, for some elections they have recording, reporting requirements to the Secretary of State's office. They are not uploading the actual results to their election, the actual votes. They are just giving us the outcomes and totals. So we're not getting the votes. We're not getting that data. They're just giving us what their results were for those particular races. And so those numbers are not connected to voters and they're not connected to ballots. We don't have access to the ballots. Um, that is all maintained locally. We're just presenting that information to the public. So I think that those are two different points that they I think, are. I think and, it's important to make that I, distinction. I agree that it is. I appreciate that distinction. I'm just trying to get it down to where you don't have all the backdoor hoops. But what I'm also hearing is because these were four new auditable entities that are participating, we've adopted best practices from that going forward where a lot of this conversation in my mind is going on. We won't need it. It'll be part of the system. Is that to say? That's the hope, yes. Well, that's a, that, 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 that the hope is, is, a, is a problem for me because we're here because people believe our vote doesn't count. And if in the best practices you've determined they need to do A, B, C, and to your data, to your credit, you reconciled. And you got there. Now, you can, I think, electronically make that more streamlined to where less human hands are touching it. And I know there's people in the room that are going to go, oh, wait a minute, that's worse. But I'm telling you, the fact that we can put a flash drive in our pocket, meaning well-intended as it was to transfer it and didn't do it, that's a human error that, that is a problem. So I just want to be real careful here that human error is always part of it and how we can minimize it is where we should be. But when you say what the hope is, so out of that auditable process, is it up to this committee to put in statutes that force rules to make those best practices that you have determined through the audit process into the, into the, into the process? Is that, is that where we're going? 
There are reports that should be required to ensure that the process is streamlined and to ensure that all counties are complying okay. and that are not right now currently required. Out of 254 counties, what would you say the percentage is that are uniformly providing something that is useful? So my audit was limited to the four, right. um, and we began the process, obviously, of auditing the next, the statutory counties, and they were in, I mean, so that my review is limited to eight counties, essentially, of 254, and they were starting to do those things. I don't know, I mean, I've, I'm no longer with the Secretary of State's office, so from the outside in, I haven't looked at all 254 counties to be able to answer that question accurately. So back to the central pool, I think was your your hesitation about just pulling everything into central. And and I, I again, I don't know. So are those electronically connected to the Internet or are those not? Because that was a big concern in the last session. We should have no outside connections to the Internet anywhere in the system. Is that a is that is that true or not true? Or so when you're say? asking, are those connected to the inner? When you're those what? Policy, I'm assuming that the the you're talking about the electronic poll books, poll, right? Are those submitting those electronically to a central pool? They are the the because of countywide voting, each of these poll books have to communicate to each other so that when I check in at one location, I'm not allowed if your router is working. I would not be allowed to check in to vote at another location. Right, exactly. So, and what they say is the Legion Dallas County, the poll books are on a local area network. That's what I was going to ask. Is but it we, a local network that, or is but, it accessed? Well, the local, okay, get a little bit above my pay grade, but I'm going to tell you what I've learned There's some as best as loops. possible. There's no closed loop. Okay. The, the local area network is... Um, uses Wi-Fi technology. Wi-Fi necessarily has to go up to a, and I can't remember that word up there, but um, no. it there is access. I mean, my router is a Wi-Fi router. So if you're smart enough, if you're, uh, you don't even have to be a tech, high technology expert. I'm not a technology expert, but computer geeks can get into that local area network, they can manipulate poll book data. I know people who have done it. They have evidence of names of people who are in our poll book whose status, that would be active eligible or deceased or um, suspense, that's another category. Um, I can't remember all the categories. But basically, eligible or not eligible would be your two big buckets there. We have computer network geeks who have been able to see those fields being changed where a voter's status has been changed from inactive eligible to active can, can eligible. You, can you produce for this committee those geeks to come and show us? Yes, I can. I would love to have that. Yes, I can. My personal uh, yes, satisfaction I can. to have those people set and show me where someone tapped into your precinct, precinct and changed a voter eligibility via that router. And I don't know if it was my particular precinct. I do know that my voter check-in records at my vote location, remember, not precinct, but my vote location, those voter check-in records went up. That's a different thing from voter so, fields changing from active, eligible to ineligible or back and forth. And, and but I'll, I can produce the I'll person get off who can this, do it. Just as soon as I get my head around it a little bit. So mm -hmm. you would have someone vote countywide, or it doesn't matter really, mm -hmm. this could happen at precinct level. And that vote could go up into the portal and cloud, basically. The cloud, a record and of that. something could change in that before it goes to the central pool, or would it change at the actual precinct vote level? Well, what I'm changes... I'm trying to figure out, is there a spell safe? If you got a flash drive where it was sent after the flash drive was made, is there a check for that? In the okay, system? there are two things. There's 
votes and there are voters. So I'm talking about yeah, I'm voter talking about status. Voters. You're talking. You are talking about the vote. Votes. Okay, that would be in um, the actual um, record of the vote result. That's going to be on a flash drive. Right. So that is separate from the poll book local area network. So, right. So to make sure, if I vote. I'm not talking about registration. I'm mm -hmm. obviously registered if I'm voting for you. Mm -hmm. I'm coming into that precinct. Mm -hmm. I vote at that precinct. Ultimately, that goes to a flash drive and is mm -hmm. transferred to Central Pool, or is that going up through the process? Is that flash drive is plugged in, plugged in, I don't know what you call it, put into an accumulator, what we call it, accumulator at in Dallas level. County. And then, and it's put, that those vote results are put into a database. I think it's called... Um, Postgres database, maybe? I don't know. A little bit above my pay grade. But those vote results are stored on a central computer somewhere. Now, do you know that? I, I, if I, if yeah. I sure. may. Yes. So there's a difference between the voters that voted and the actual votes that are cast in an election. Mm -hmm. And what I think Ms. Beasel was referring to was the electronic poll book that contains, that contains the list of registered voters. Those have to be connected to the Internet. Uh, in order to utilize countywide, and that's because they communicate with each other. In addition to that, they are, uh, that, that information mm -hmm. is ultimately uploaded to uh, a different server so that they can compile that data and, and provide lists of who voted in that election. Just to be clear, that is not directly connected to our statewide election management and voter registration system. We do not allow e-poll books to connect to the voter registration list maintained by the state. We do not allow that. Now, some counties locally may have a connection between their e-poll book, those that use offline counties that Ms. Doyer referenced. Um, they may have a connection to that e-poll book to their local voter registration database. But again, that is just talking about the names of the people that voted and the, mm -hmm. the registered voters. Both of you guys are making the distinction between register and vote. And I'm trying to be very clear, very clear. I understand if you manipulate eligibility and kick me out as an eligible voter, or not before I ever vote. I get that. If that's happening, we need to we need to work on that. But my actual physical vote today is it y'all's testimony that it is subject to manipulation through the cloud. I you yes, say sir. no. You no, say sir. Yes. the actual vote itself. Yes. The vote. The, my vote. Not, not the for, voter registration. I'm voting vote. for Mickey Mouse for president yes, today. Sir. Can that be manipulated through the cloud? That information, our voting systems, are not permitted to be connected to the Internet at all. We do not allow yeah. wireless connectivity on our voting devices. We test that in the certification process. So those, when you cast a ballot in a polling location, that scanner, by law and through the certification process, cannot have any kind of wireless transmitting capabilities. So it is local to that scanner. There's a thumb drive that will contain those totals on there. That information is physically transported to an election office and read into a central computer that is also not connected to the Internet, not permitted. No, no Thank you. Internet connection permitted. But and I would differ with that. And she differs. But mm -hmm. So that would be a reconciliation where you would catch the flash drive didn't make it. My vote did not make it over. I made it. But it didn't get to the place where all the totals for the county are being accumulated. Correct, because that that system that she's talking about is required to produce an audit log, and that audit log will tell you when those flash drives are read into the system with the number of ballots right. that can be reconciled against. So we the have that parse. But to be clear, y'all made the distinction between register and vote, and I get the distinction and I get the importance. But I I need to have clarity here that our vote, my vote, cannot be manipulated from some outside. Uh, Russian bot of something today. You say yes. Why, I say why yes. is that your perspective? I say that yes. That flash drive. Okay, have you ever heard of the Stutznik virus? You're military. You might have heard of that. Anybody? Senator Parker? Okay. That was a virus on a flash drive that caused those centrifuges or centrifuge, singular, plural, I don't know, to start spinning out of control and melting down. There was no use of the internet to manipulate the mechanisms or the control mechanisms of that nuclear facility. So the internet is not the only way that we can have access to our votes, I appreciate which are stored in a database. There are 
many different protocols. Bluetooth is one. That's not an internet protocol. There are other protocols that I couldn't begin to tell you because it is by my pay grade, but we do have evidence of the ability to manipulate using things that are not internet. Social engineering, by the way, that's another vector. But we do have evidence of vote votes, actual votes being manip manipulated. And why would you need to change a voter check-in record, not talking about the voter registration database, but a voter check-in record, which in 2000, uh, 2020, our geeky cyber guys, ninjas, found evidence, this was before y'all's time, well, you might have been there, found evidence of 50, over 57,000 records of voter check-ins. People who had actually checked in to vote during early voting, over 57,000 records were purged from the database as if they had never voted. And then over time, remember that was when we had three weeks of early voting, it was during COVID. Over time, there were approximately 51,000 records of voter check-ins reinserted into the, I think it's Postgres database, I could be wrong, but into the voter check-in record database. 57,000 removed, 51,000 added back. They didn't all match, but why would you do that? Why would you go to the trouble of manipulating voter check-in records? I'm going to give you a theory. I want in the room. I'm not a bad guy, but I'm going to tell you what a, why a bad guy would want to do it. If you want to change a vote result, take away a vote for me, give it to Ms. Doyer or vice versa, or add a lot of votes to me. If you want to change a vote result, you're going to have to change the number of voters because at the end of the day, and this is what you're testifying to, you have to have votes equals voters. But if you're going to inject electronically extra votes, you need to inject extra voter check-in records so that we get close to a reconciliation of votes equals voters. I, I, and I can put you in a room where we can show you exactly how it's I, done. I appreciate your perspective. This raises the whole concept here. Is this disturbing? Well, it is. I, the I whole just, morning is disturbing. I need, I, need to, I, I need to see. I need to see. I'm kind of from Missouri today. But here, here's the thing. It sounds to me, in, in, in my old, old, old days coming out of college with programming backgrounds, we've got way too many different databases that represent the same amount of data or the same, the same data. And we end up creating these problems, real or perceived. I'm not here to judge up or down because we've got all these different reconciliations of different databases with the same information for different purposes. So at some point, we've got to figure out how, how they all become uniform or you're never going to answer these questions and you leave the public with really, honestly, a heartburn. But that's, that's it, Madam Chair. Well, the way to, way to do that is if you vote in your precinct, you have a paper poll book so nobody can manipulate that. The voter checks so in on nobody paper. Nobody has an eraser. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Senator Perry, and thank you for yeah. your um, responses. Um, Senator Birdwell, do you have a disturbing question? <laughs> no, I'm just a simple old soldier, so I have a very simple mathematical question. Um, uh, Jackie, in your slides, uh, and, and this may have been discussed while I was out briefly, so I apologize if it is. The delta of about 500 and something votes between 105,410 and 104,972 between votes and ballots, does that mean, is that number provisional ballots? What, what would cause a delta? Sure. So that this. If it isn't provisional ballots, how do I have one person and not one vote? Tell me how that happens. Sure. Well, the, if you're, are you looking at figure two there on the first slide? Yeah, but I mean, the, I, 
Yeah. I need you to synthesize it for me to sit. There. I mean, it's like reading the spreadsheet from hell. Just tell me no, what you're trying okay. to tell me. So what I was hoping to illustrate there is the importance of when you're doing reconciliation to talk about it in terms of a ballot, right? Because what you'll see there, you have the 104, 972. That's how many people voted for a candidate in the presidential primary. But there were also people who voted in that election who did not either cast a, a vote for a candidate in the in that presidential contest, or they might have voted for two candidates. And so when you take that, that delta right there is actually explained by the two numbers right underneath it, so the that, overvotes and the undervotes. So that delta can, can reflect either error, voting voter error of voting for two candidates instead of one, or it could reflect the potential for fraud of people voting without their knowledge being a vote being cast, but they didn't show up as a voter. Is that what you're telling me? No, because the total number of ballots cast is the same. So you still have 105,410 total ballots. The way you would, what this tells me is that I had 436 voters in the Republican primary who chose to abstain from voting for a presidential candidate in that primary. They may have voted for other candidates in other contests in the Republican primary. So it's an primary. undervote. It's an undervote, it's an undervote. correct. Okay. okay. Um, Christina, let me ask you this, this question. The... The question about flash drives uh, that Senator Perry was, was uh, conversing with Beth about. The flash drive is, look, when I, Granberry, I go into Hood County, I vote it early, and I put my paper ballot in there, and it, the paper ballot's recorded on the electric machine, but it's fed into this other machine before you exit. There's a flash drive connected to that machine that's tabulating my vote as my paper is slid in to tabulate the vote. Is that yeah, yes, sir. It's doing two things. It's recording the vote and also taking an image of that ballot. Correct. Is that, is that ballot or the image of that ballot retrievable under open records? Because we figured out what happened with Matt mm -hmm. Rinaldi <clears throat> because of the distance in voting in the countywide. But can my vote or anybody in here's vote be recovered 60 days, 90 days, whatever, in an open records? Because that is a that is a dreadfully leverageable record. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm glad you brought this up and asked this question. Well, because it's disturbing, I'm sure. So, And, I'm, so. and I was going to say the same thing, sir. It, it, it is disturbing, Madam uh, Vice Chair, to use your word on this. Um, what we have happening right now, just based on some of the discussions and some of the things that have come up on this particular issue, um, our laws in Texas are very transparent when it comes to elections. Um, we have erred on the side of transparency, and we've had a lot of laws that make sure that this data is publicly available regarding our elections. And that's to provide confidence and auditability in the election process. The more data you put out, th out there and the more granular and detailed that data gets, the more likely you are to run up against ballot secrecy. And what we're seeing right now is that conflict between transparency and secrecy. Right. And so I, I think to, to get to the, your original question about is that ballot image is that record of, of that ballot, is that publicly available? And the answer to that is yes. It, so right now it is currently publicly available with some restrictions. And I, I will say there was a, a bill from last session, it was HB 5180, that um, put the specific requirements in place that that ballot image is now available to the public after the canvas, after that final canvas. That provision also has some language in there saying that any personally identifiable information on that ballot must be redacted. And I think what this discussion is leading to and what some of these articles that we've been reading is showing is that what we thought was personally identifiable information is much broader than what we envisioned. Uh, I think what election officials en envisioned but, originally. Because what I want is, a, is I want enough granularity to determine that whether it's at, at, at as you're being a, a, a precinct captain and managing a, a site that the non-citizen, the non, is is filtered out. But we're not on the other side of it where somebody can say, hey, you know, you were supposed to go vote for so-and-so. Yes, sir. And now we're going to leverage, you know, you didn't vote for the way we wanted you to vote. And where's that fulcrum on that balance beam? Yes, sir. 
Um, um, I, I understand what the, the point that you're making, sir, and I think I think it's important to acknowledge that there are some short-term solutions right now that address this issue, and it's through the Public Information Act and through uh, the ability to redact personally identifiable information. There, there was an opinion that was recently issued. It was May 1st of this year by the Attorney General's office. It's KP0463. And this provision, or this opinion, has very strong language in it, the very last paragraph, the last two lines, that make it very clear that election officials have the ability to redact uh, any information, any personally identifiable information, not just on a ballot, but in, a, in an election record that can tie that voter back to their votes. But you ought to be able to audit by name, but not see the ballot, but if somebody wants to see the ballot, they can't see the, the yeah. identifying Yes, sir. That, that's the tension Why? that we have right now in this, um, is that... And right now, there's not a clear line between those two. That's correct. Yes, sir. Because what we have discovered, and I think what a lot of election officials as a community have been very worried about, is that as we've increased this level of transparency, it has made this information easier to discover. And that what we've discovered is it's not just any one feature on a ballot. It's usually a combination of records, maybe certain information about polling locations and where people vote combined with the precinct number on that ballot or um, the ballot number well, that's, that's it, on there. And, and that's what we're finding. It didn't just Matt is, Rinaldi, when, when President Bush and Laura voted in Crawford, same thing. They were the only two votes and, cast that day. And, and what I would say is, um, I, you know, I'm glad that Ms. Beasel brought this up because this is a concern. And it is a very valid concern with respect to countywide, but it does extend beyond that. It extends to early voting. It extends to voting by mail. And I would say on a much larger scale uh, when it comes okay. to voting by mail. Okay. And so if, if the committee is considering ways to address this particular issue, it may involve you know, changes beyond just addressing countywide. There may be some other protections okay. to consider in this area. And I just hope we don't fall off the other side of the slope because the less information that we have, then the less ability we have to make sure that these aren't fake voters or fake votes. Right, right. But I want to give you something even more disturbing about that ballot image. Well, we're in the business of disturbing today. Yes, we are. So that ballot image, if it, it can be accessed by a bad guy, um, and it can be photoshopped. So they could actually make you look like you are voting for Joe Biden. For, oh, sorry. I probably shouldn't have said that. Um, but yeah, I know that, that you, is, that is you're, it's from a personal perspective. Yes. Okay. I, I the, guess it's okay the in this room to say, but what I'm saying is there, there are concerns about access to ballot images because they, we've, I've, I've seen it done. They can be photoshopped. I'm just simply saying we need to get back to precinct only voting on paper. So we don't have ballot images. We don't have CVRs. We don't have all these computer records and databases. We have a metal, locked with great chain of custody ballot box. You put your ballot in there that's been marked by my pencil here from a paper poll book, and then you count your ballots right then and there. They don't move. You don't get lost. They don't get lost. And then election night reporting is you stick your vote results on the front door of your precinct, and then you maybe phone it in or drive them in. But you've got to simplify because right now the complexity that we have introduces such a level of opacity we can't audit, we can't verify, there's no transparency. But if we give too much transparency in this scenario, we're going to fall off on the other side of the slope. Then we can't audit. So you're going round and round in circles. We need to simplify and get back to at least y'all can me, start with precinct only voting. Let me come back to you, Christina, one last question. What is the chain of custody for that flash drive from precinct to central count? Is it handled the same way two-person control for nuclear weapons? What, um, how can that be manipulated? I, I wish that I route? could make that strict. Um, I, I think chain of custody is extremely important in the election world, particularly as it re relates to securing this kind of information, your electronic media, your, your even your voted ballots. And so the election worker at that location, that presiding judge, they're the ones that take it's in their custody, and they're the ones that are required to deliver that information back to the central office at the end of the night. There should be chain of custody checks at every step of the it, process. Is it the, the reason I mention nuclear weapons is it's always two people? Is the election judge by themselves transporting that flash drive, and is the flash drive capable of being manipulated 
prior to between point of collection and point of delivery? So we direct election officials when it comes to chain of custody to perform two-person validations. We also, in our laws, allow poll watchers that are there to sign off on the records so that they're also providing another level of validation. You allow it or require it? Um, if they are present, they I wouldn't say they're required, but they can sign it if they would like to. But not every location is going to have a poll watcher, but there should be multiple people laying eyes on that and multiple people performing that validation check. Um, and then it also should happen again at the location that they're delivering supplies to. Multiple people should be performing that validation. There should be records where you are signing off on the transfer of ballots and the transfer of records. Um, poll watchers actually can, by law, are permitted to drive behind an election judge. Um, in fact, I think the law says that the judge has to drive in a reasonable fashion to make sure that poll watchers are allowed to follow behind. So the chain of custody element is extremely important. important. Um, but a lot of that, you know, with poll watchers is going to be contingent on whether they're there, whether poll watchers are there. Other, otherwise, it's the, it's the workers at that location yeah. that are responsible for that check. Right. They've, Nobody they've follows be, me. Hold on, hold on a second. Sorry. You've got to be technically and tactically proficient mm. and trustworthy. Yes, sir. And, and I will tell you that when, um, you know, we, with, especially with election night reporting, you know, we are monitoring counties, uh, their submission of election results. And when we don't hear from them, we start calling them. And when we, uh, when they have locations that are outstanding, um, they get very nervous. And um, it has happened on many occasions where we've had to actually wake up a sheriff and have them go out to try to figure out what the delays are, yeah. um, either at particular locations at a county office. Okay. Beth, if you wish, I'm done, but if you wish okay. to add Beth's comment, Madam Chair. Please. Mm -hmm. 44 flash drives went missing in Dallas County several years ago. 44. So and, I asked the question. Okay. <laughs> and then another example in um, just a few years ago, a flash drive from one vote location ended up in the bag of another vote location, that vote location's flash drive ended up, they, the, they, the flash drives got mixed. Mm -hmm. Well, I happen to know that the flash drive that came from this church was put in there because my daughter was there and I knew the uh, judge there. They testified that, that their proper flash drive went into that bag. How those two flash drives got swapped is anybody's business. It, we don't know. Right. Okay. And then there, there was no recourse. And then about chain of custody, I was going to say, nobody's following me. And I know what keeps me from messing with that flash drive, but I'm just saying it's, you know, there aren't a lot, of, there aren't enough poll watchers in the county to follow us all there. But um, in this recount where I was a poll watcher just recently, chain of custody was blown to smithereens. We had missing seals mismatch seals and what i mean by that is on closing night you should have a seal let's just say seal one two three and then that box was later determined to be part of the partial manual count so the opening seal for that box should have been the same as the closing seal it was not there was a different seal number why would those seal numbers not match what has happened between point A and point B, or seal number one, two, three, and a different seal number. We have missing signatures. We, the, I won't go into it, but it was an utter failure of chain of custody from that, just from the data we collected in that recount, utter failure. Okay. Not, it is not our Secretary of State's fault, by the way. Let's be clear. You guys have the procedures in place. They're not just being, not, being, not followed. Followed. being followed. And and maybe we could beef them up a little bit. But if we did everything at the precinct and nothing left the precinct, then we wouldn't have to worry about chain of custody anymore. Okay. Um, let's get to some other questions. Uh, Dean Zafferini. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question for Ms. Adkins. If a county has suffered countywide voting for years, what would be the benefit and the cost of it reversing its policy? Um, we have a number of counties that have been participating in the program um, for, you know, 10 plus years. Um, I think those counties would have to make some adjustments. They would have to increase polling locations um, and, and plan and prepare for that. Any benefits? Um, I think that would depend on, I mean, I, th I think the testimony today has offered some interesting things to consider, that there are some concerns there, and perhaps it could address some of those concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. 
um, Dean and Senator Menendez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Atkins, as I reviewed the uh, <clears throat> legislative history of countywide polling, am I correct that the first legislation was uh, back in tw 2009? Yes, sir. And as I look over all the bills that have touched on clarification or expansion of countywide, we had one in 2011, 2013, 2017, 2019, 2021. And as I review all of these bills, the votes on most, if not all, seem to be almost unanimous. They seem to be. And every one of the bills seems to have, well, I think every one of the authors, except for one, has one side, the Senate, only one of all those bills has one Senate author that was a Democrat on all the other bills, both the House and Senate, and the uh, Senate authors are Republicans. Um, since the inception of countywide voting, our Secretary of State's been Republican, correct? I believe that's correct. Yeah, I mean, we've had it, we have, it's been 20 years that we've had a Republican governor and Republicans. My, my thoughts are, I don't, I don't know that, you know, we're, we're looking for reporting irregularities, and I'm glad to hear, I was glad to hear Ms. Beasel said that she didn't think the Secretary of State's office has done anything wrong, but I, my understanding is that the number of people using countywide voting may be as high as 80 percent. Is that an accurate number? 83 percent, yes, sir. 83 percent. And I do, I, I share the concern of having any irregularities or having any uh, issues with inaccuracy in voting because, I mean, if, if there is that option and there are people who wanted to have elections be I mean, obviously, if if it were the party that's not in charge, then they must be pretty bad at it. If there was an opportunity to to influence these elections, I don't see that. Do you see any weaknesses or any areas that you can strengthen the countywide? Because I'm, my concern is that we've got something that 83 percent of the population is using, and yet I don't see the the the, the benefit to changing it, and all the legislation that's created it has been authored by the party and the majority. So I'm not sure I understand where the problem is. Or so, Do you see anything we can do to improve on this? Because I'm trying to identify what the problem is with countywide voting. What I would say, sir, is that the other panelists that are up here with me today have identified some very legitimate concerns. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there may be some considerations there. Um, from an auditability perspective, there may be a way to improve upon the reporting. Mm -hmm. um, I think particularly on the ballot secrecy concerns that are there, sure. um, we may need to look at how we draw our precincts. Um, our precincts in Texas are very small and we have very strict rules. And so um, there may be some improvements that can be, ma can be made to address some of these individual concerns. And I think some of these, some of these ideas or some of the items discussed by my panelists today, um, you know, looking at some of those issues, I think would extend beyond countywide in providing benefits as well. Yeah. I mean, I remember the days where you had to vote in your specific precinct and some, for some reason, the, the polling place was changed and then people who were on a tight schedule would show up to vote and they were told, no, it's not here, it's somewhere else. And they just leave and not, and not come back. Um, I am going to be continue to be listening, but I'm, I'm a little perplexed at, at what we're trying to solve here today, but I, I appreciate your, your bringing this up. My concern is that I heard Ms. Beasel bring up going back to pencils and precinct base and all of that, which I, I was part of that as well. And what would the res how long would it take for us to get results if you had to wait for the ballot boxes with all the Scantron sheets to show back up? So I think there's a couple of different ways to implement that. Um, I think Ms. Beasel made reference to um, you could still put a ballot in a scanner and that, that scanner would tabulate those results. And so I don't know that you would see much delay in reporting if the tabulation is occurring in the same method that it otherwise would for countywide. If we're talking about going back to hand counting uh, ballots, 
that's going to largely depend on the size of the election and the number of precincts. Um, you know, recently we had Gillespie County for the Republican primary. Um, they hand counted their election and um, I think they did a very good job with their training ahead of time and a really good job organizing ahead of time. Um, and, it, and it did take quite a while. Um, they were one of the later counties to report their results. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Senator Lamatia. Yes, thank you. Um, so I guess my first question is for Christina. Um, so I know a lot of the election rules changed recently uh, regarding hours for polling locations. Does the Secretary of State offer funding to help uh, county polling locations, you know, meet those requirements and expand voting locations or make sure that they have enough staff to have that, you know, two-person check and on, you know, chain of custody issues in that regard? Um, so I, since we're talking specifically about countywide, that is an election day program. And so those hours are set by statute and the state does not provide additional funding. Counties are funded locally by their uh, commissioner's courts. And so that funding has to come from local sources. Got it. Okay. And then, um, Jacqueline, I've got a question for you. Um, I know that your report, you said that this one had to uh, cover Dallas County. You all also audited three other account, larger counties. I imagine those are over a million in population that you all audited. Yes, ma'am. We, we looked at uh, Collin County, Dallas County, Harris County, and Tarrant County for the 2020. This data is what's publicly available now for Dallas County mm -hmm. for the 2024 primary. So, and you made some recommendations on things that you think should be in place for, to make sure that we can verify and validate voters, voting records, and make sure that all the ballots are cast correctly. My question is that would those recommendations be different or maybe not necessary for some of the smaller counties? I've got a county with 260 registered voters and 71 only vote. So I imagine we wouldn't need as many steps, recommendations to validate 70 votes as opposed to, you know, a couple hundred thousand votes. I think the, the process should be fairly streamlined in terms of the first part of the equation, number of voters, that's those snapshots of vote history, right? And so you would just take those kind of four, right? Right before the election, right, you know, after early voting has ended, election night, and after any late arriving or provisional ballots. And that's looking at, you know, the vote history file. And then on the on the side of ballots, if you're if you're hand counting or things of that nature, then there would be reports that you could generate by polling location. If you're doing using voting equipment, that data is already captured, right? It's already on the flash live, it's, it's printing onto the actual receipt that comes out of the voting equipment. It's just a matter of either having the vendors know this is gonna be a new reporting requirement or asking the counties to generate those reports. The data exists. It's just not required legally to be publicly accessible. Okay, because I just wanna make sure that when we're looking at, when we're making these recommendations, when we're looking at changing the law, we're also considering that it's not necessarily one size fits all and that when we're asking our smaller counties, whether it's a couple hundred, a couple thousand or 10,000 uh, population, that we're understanding the additional steps we're asking them to take is going to cost money and cost funds that these counties may not have. And if the state isn't willing to help fund that or uh, be able to give them additional funding for that, we're going to see polling locations closed, which we've already seen in a lot of counties, and we're going to make it see it harder for people to vote in the name of transparency and security. So we just want to make sure it's balanced in regards to what policies you're recommending for multi-million dollar counties versus a couple hundred population counties. Well, you know, we audited other counties besides those once we started the statutory mm -hmm. audits. We looked at Eastland County. We looked at Guadalupe County. Those are much smaller counties. Eastland is 12,000 registered right. voters. And those processes and procedures were welcomed by the election administrators because it gave them something to turn around to their voters and say, here is what we're doing. Here's us showing our work in terms of an election. We're not doing anything or asking anything that would be making it harder for anyone to vote. It's really a matter of reporting and clicking a couple of buttons to export a report and click save. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, Senator Betancourt. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I let the old voter registrar ask a few questions here now, okay, because this uh, some of these issues about cleaning the voter roll, et cetera, go back to, for me, back to 1999 when we found 50,000 deceased and felon registrations on the Harris County voter roll, of which 1% were voting. And at the time, if Florida had not taken the lead in that presidential election, 
uh, Texas would have decided the outcome with uh, what were clearly over 500 illegal votes. So I go back in time uh, and and want to start asking some questions about uh, getting y'all's ladies' opinions on a couple items. First off, we've all talked about audits, and just for the record, I want to be clear, you've got four audits underway for 2022. Has anybody asked you what the status is and when they're ready? I will answer that question for you. Thank right you. Now, I'm sir. happy yes. to ask it first. Um, yes. Okay. So um, when uh, about a year ago, the audit program that was previously under the Forensic Audit Division uh, became part of the Elections Division. So uh, my team is now in the auditing business. Um, we have been working on those four audits. We are releasing um, each county, uh, doing a comprehensive report for each county, not just single elections. And uh, they're about to start rolling out. They will all be rolling out this summer. Okay. Like this summer, like June? Um, I, we're going to start with the smaller ones. They're coming out very, very, very soon. I don't want to okay. overpromise. And, and which two counties? And so I know Harris is one. And yes, then sir. Right, go ahead. So it's Eastland County, Guadalupe County, Cameron County, and Harris County. And that's smallest to largest. Now, it, this brings up uh, a comment, actually, that Bill Sargent was going to make, and I'm, I'm going to make that in a second. Um, the the scale of the magnitude here is fa is really large, okay? Because, you know, you're looking at Eastland with uh, how many registered voters? Twelve thousand. Right, and then you'll go up to Cameron County, which has over I think a hundred. Pick a number. I'm, 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 That's I'm, higher than that. Yeah, two hundred thousand. How, how big? Four hundred twenty-five thousand population. All right, then you go to Harris, which is our blockbuster. Yes, sir. Okay. You know, at 2.3 million. So with, I think Jackie made the comment, it's very important for the audience especially understand, we've got a tremendous granularity issue here from Loving County, which has probably more voters than residents, but that's another problem, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that we'll deal with later. Um, and, and, and you have to have that in the back of your mind in any, any discussion that we're talking about. Um, what, what Bill Sargent had told both uh, uh, my staff uh, and, and Johnson was that um, he's very much in favor of countywide voting in Galveston because it works, but he was very concerned about the scale of what happens when it goes to in Harris County because that literally is a 10 to 1 jump from Galveston up to Harris at, at one shot. Now, um, if uh, – what, what I'd like is some comments on the scalability issue, what we're hearing on complaints. And then, and then Christine, I'm going to go into the difference between equipment because there is a huge difference between the ENSS commit, uh, equipment that Beth is so well documented. I think you were the person that did the video when it was updating. Is that you? Okay, right. And what a hard inner civic does. And specifically about the four-letter codes, one system deletes them. But the ESS system uses them as a ballot style indicator, which explains the party chair's situation. But could I get some comments on this, Christina, starting with you? Sure. Specifically on the equipment differences, um, I think what you're referring to is the difference between HART and ESNS. We have two vendors currently in Texas. Um, the HART system, to activate your ballot, to get your ballot, you... Um, this is done through like a, a central component to it. It's not done through the e-poll book. That doesn't help you activate the voting session. Um, with the ESNS equipment, um, the way you activate a voting session there is you have the blank piece of paper, and in most counties they are printing a code on there that identifies the precinct and that will allow that voter to put the ballot into the voting device, and it will call up that person's ballot style. Right, so so in that ENS case, because you will literally have a code on a on a, a coded piece of paper by by precinct, yes, and then that will actually assign the ballot style code. Yes, sir. And so, in the case of the party chairman, because I've spoken to him about this, is that apparently or possibly we'll say okay, is that he might have been the only person voting at that location with that specific. With that precinct. With that precinct location, right, that had that specific ballot style, true? That's possible, yes, sir. Right, that's a possibility. Now, if that's a possibility, short-term fixes are what? That you could do from Secretary of State and not – because it's going to be a while before we can pass legislation, obviously. 
Short-term fix is that uh, we do have the ability to redact personally identifiable information on a ballot, or I would say the counties have that ability. It's a matter of identifying what that personally identifiable information is that needs to be redacted because it's usually going to be something on the ballot itself, either the precinct number or the ballot number, both the electronic number or a preprinted number on that ballot, um, and something in your other election records that would identify <clears throat> either – uh, you know, that would identify the precinct to a particular voter, a location to a voter, or even a range of ballot numbers being yeah. from a particular location. Now, I location. think that part of the issue is whether that should have been released or not, there's obviously a question because there's, you know, when, when ballots are released like that, there's a question of legality, okay, that I'll, I, I don't know if you're, anybody's ready to answer that question, mm -hmm. you know, at this point, but, uh, but you, there is a short-term fix that can be applied to this. Yes, sir. And I think that those ballots were released in accordance with the law because right now the law does say that um, election officials have to make those ballot images available to the public. Oh, I know. After right. the canvas. No, I'm just saying that, that once they're available, OK, the question there is kind of a secondary question of once they're out there, can somebody actually then talk about it? But that's another. Yes, sir. That's 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 kind of a secondary issue. Beth, you had a comment? I, it's really a question. Um, if we are redacting personal identifiable information like a precinct style or ballot style or something, um, does that make um, – is that a violation of the law, the code right now that says our elections must be auditable? And I'm thinking auditable means that we need to know who voted or, or how many votes and how many voters. And we need to know if these are legitimate voters and legitimate votes. So if we redact information, does that violate the law? So the law is very clear that you can redact anything on a ballot that constitutes personally identifiable information. And I think that if a number on that ballot can tie back to a voter, I think because of the express language and statute, and I think because of the attorney general opinion I referenced, KP0463, it makes it really clear that the law allows for that redaction. And I, I think we have to be cautious. You know, we want to make sure that we're redacting as little as possible to maintain transparency. So we have to look and really see, you know, what is it that provides that level of ballot secrecy? You know, I, I will say I've heard of situations where, you know, you have you know, five voters in an election and um, it's going to be hard to redact a number on that ballot and still protect that person's right to privacy. And, right. And if, that and may a, call before for I forget redactions. that comment, I think it's important to understand that other states – uh, members take those small fragmented precincts and amalgamate them with others to basically protect the voter from being pigeonholed by like what happened in, in, in this case. And that may be something that we, I think we could get bipartisan agreement on is that, uh, Dean, you know, that, that when we're looking at these very small precincts, you, if you have like five voters, oh, it's really easy to figure out whose ballot style is the one style. Maybe with 10, less difficult, more difficult, maybe 25 at some point. At some point, you get enough of a ballot a sample that it becomes very difficult to pin it down. Um, and that may be a solution we need to go to. Now, to Jackie, if I can get you in real fast. You're, you did how many uh, audits of, the, of which counties? Because you would want to be able to maintain the transparency to do your audits, true? Yes. Okay. So we audited in the within the Secretary of State's office. We audited the four counties: Collin, Dallas, Harris, and Tarrant. And we had completed um, the audits of two elections in two of the smaller counties um, that Ms. Atkins just referenced. Now, Beth, so you know, as bad as the what you ran into in this first 2020 audit in Harris County, uh, there was 184,999 votes that had no chain of custody. If I remember, I'm going from memory. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jackie. That's correct, Senator Beckford. Okay. So, so the so you have equipment differentials between these major urban counties, but quite frankly, you have acumen and willingness to follow the law, and that's one of the reasons why Beth we passed Senate Bills 1750 and 1933, which took away the in my mind what was a corrupt elections administration office and replaced it with elected officials with oversight by the Secretary of State. So this may be, I mean, you're, you're looking at solutions. You know, part of this is you have to make sure that you've got 
the right equipment base, but you also have the right reasoning and the right work acumen. And quite frankly, you got to follow the law. Well, we have to follow the law, but there needs to be teeth in the law. I don't know, Jack, if you were part of this, but just recently after this, your bill was passed, I think it was the very first audit that was done, and it, it looked like one of your pieces of paper there. There was a 3,000 number differential between votes and voters in Dallas County, but nobody did anything about it. So, okay, we reconciled, we followed the law, but there's no consequences if there are differences. Yeah, 3,000 is a big number. That the reconciliation forms are actually a suggestion from Uncle Paul. Okay, so part of that is what gets measured gets fixed. Okay, other people may have had the same ideas on the committee as well. Um, but no, you're absolutely right. The reason why we have those is to have some idea of what was happening. Because quite frankly, in Harris County, under the prior election administration office, we had no idea what was happening. After reading your report, Jackie, that's what I came to the conclusion of. Okay. Um, now, so let's go back to this. So, uh, so there's probably a short-term redaction fix that can, that can stop this from happening. And I think the public needs to know that. Um, and, and also, too, that um, uh, now let's go to countywide voting in general. Um, we had a Senate bill, oh, gosh, 924, I've got the right number. Which one? Springers. Um, and not to belabor my vice chairman, wasn't the best bill that was passed ever. So we've ended up with a lot more polling place at locations. Can you describe that problem and how it relates it right now in countywide polling? Um, yes, sir. Uh, with that with that bill that you're referring to, Senate Bill 924, um, what that bill had the effect of doing is there was some language that was repealed that allowed counties to combine the very, very tiny fraction precincts that exist or sliver precincts sometimes folks refer them to with an adjacent larger precinct. Um, so we no longer have the ability to combine those in certain circumstances, and that has the effect of, of creating more polling locations. Right. Now, we're going to have a fix to 924, so anybody has ideas, but we're – we have to change this because otherwise we end up with way too many polls. Uh, and we have had some countywide elections recently that have had hundreds of polls as a result when dozens could have done the job because we're looking at nonpartisan elections in May versus partisan elections in November. Now, I want to go back and make a point and make it crystal clear to everybody. Now, so in from my investigation and understanding this problem with the former Republican Party chair, that problem would not have occurred with a heart system because you don't have that unique identifier printed on that ballot. So what I would say to that is I, I don't know the exact method that, they, that was used to make any kind of claims or identifications there. Um, so there are components to it that could be system specific. But I think it's also important to consider that because of the granularity of our records, we, we, there is a possibility to discover or to find some in, in, an individual's ballot through process of elimination. Effectively, right. And that's really what I think occurred if you, if you had to hazard a guess that there were so few specific votes at this one precinct using that, that, that coded ballot paper and then you layer on top a recorded, you know, from the, from the I think the poll book itself, if I've got yes, the memory of this, and so there you've got a unique identifier on a precinct number. So it becomes, if there's only five votes and four are Democrat and one's Republican, boom, they have the same ballot style, it's over. That's the obvious conclusion. It was the former party chair. And just to be clear, his, Chairman Rinaldi's ballot was not discovered or identified because of that uh, alphanumeric serial number at the top. That's not why his ballot was so he was, it was the one voter from one, yeah, one precinct, precinct that they did yes. process of elimination on. Right. Process of elimination. Okay. But that, that, that still, y'all, is a slippery slope because just by um, not disclosing that information to us still doesn't mean that someone else doesn't have that information. We might not be able to see it as a public, but the vendor or whomever – has access to some kind of identifiable information. Beth, I that, agree. Right? I understand. Right. Now, the difference here is that it was also part of a lawsuit where there was discovery 
to allow him to get that information in the first place. I think this goes to. Uh, I don't think it, that the lawsuit was per, uh, oh, pertained I the at all. Was, mm -mm. was integral in this. Two different. They were put in two, one article, but they're disconnected. Okay, then maybe. All so right. there's also litigation on this, and in the litigation, there is an assertion that there is some kind of formula or algorithm or something that can help tie a ballot back to a voter. This has never been presented to us. And so if there is something that's specific to systems or software, we don't have it. And Christy and I would agree, and I think best comment is so I think a process elimination is what happened here. But now that now, but however, this does mean that consolidating reporting consolidation from small polls to some a larger number is another way. Because if you get only if you only have five choices, you can take a random guess and be 20, right 20 percent of the time. The higher the number, the less likely this is to occur. And this is all the things that we need to consider um, with that one case. Um, I don't want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't want to take too much of the committee time because we can go on all day um, on you know on this. Um, there uh, there is when we look at allocation of polls. In urban areas, there is a formula that allows twice as many polls per precinct, uh, for commissioner precinct, true? Yes, that's correct. Right. Now, um, that unfortunately has been used from time to time, in my opinion, to put an ex extraordinary amount of, of polls in a certain commissioner's precinct mm -hmm. and less in others, okay, by observation. Um, now, I think we need to look at that. Now, would a potential granularity be better than commissioner precincts in urban areas are huge, okay? Uh, there are one million, uh, you know, plus constituents in, in Harris and, you know, almost, you know, half that in many of the urban counties. They're, they're really large places. Would breaking polling places down by, are those type allocations by state representative districts get a little more granularity in the process? Um, I have heard that. I've had a number of counties bring that to our attention, that they think that the parity issue is not working out the way it was intended, and that has been proposed. I have heard counties mention that, that, that they believe that would be another way to allocate. Right. Mm -hmm. Comments? Jackie, any? Beth? Just that whatever, you know, solutions are considered that the reporting requirements would match whatever solution is required because right now countywide polling exists but the reporting requirements don't match with countywide as as a practice right no and i mean there's and you started with a comment with training on one issue and then things have a tendency to you know go into entropy and everybody fall off the wagon okay um beth so i have a question for you are you are you saying not do precinct only Polling places. No, no. And what I'm saying is, I'm, I'm talking about the number of polls per place, per per precinct. Okay, the, uh, excuse me, commissioner per precinct. Co commissioner precinct. Okay. But we could, we because could. Because the problem right now in the code is that one county precinct can have twice as many polls as the next one, and that's way too much variability, and and unfortunately that leads to outcomes that are favorable to higher density polling versus lower density polling. Well, we have polling places in Dallas County across the street from each other, or maybe one block. So I agree with you on that point. But if we were to go back to precinct only, so you're basically voting in your neighborhood, then you would eliminate that commissioner. No matter what you do, Beth, whatever polling system you have, you've got a problem with early voting. You have, see, these formulas affect an early voting scenario. So, no, so I, I'm trying to get a, for lack of a better term, agnostic solution here. I, sorry, I'm a Catholic, to fix this problem because I don't think we should have commissioner precincts having twice as many polling places Agreed. as their neighbors. And that's why I'm trying to get a granularity that everybody can agree on. Maybe they can agree on state reps because those already have a, you know, more of a partisan flavor and a, mm -hmm. and a more granular solution. That's when it comes to that, asking. yes, but early voting kills us every time for precinct only voting. So we would love to take up that charge later because okay. that is well, another that's, vector. That's above a pay grade that I'm currently yeah. at. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time and your indulgence, Madam Chair, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Okay. Chairman. Uh, Dean Staff, for any and then Senator Parker. I have one follow-up question for Ms. Atkins. Ms. Atkins, if we were to implement precinct-only voting, requiring more locations, would you expect some counties to have difficulty in finding more locations and more poll workers? 
we do currently hear a, quite a few reports from counties that are struggling to find suitable buildings and to find locations to use in their counties, uh, particularly those that are very rural, that, that may not have a lot of available public buildings. And I think it's a persistent, well-known issue that it, it's hard to recruit and retain election workers right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Parker, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank all three of you for the excellent uh, panel discussion. Um, there's nothing more important to the people of Texas and to the country to knowing that their vote that they cast uh, is, in fact, accurate. Uh, and restoring confidence in our election process uh, is essential for uh, a healthy republic in the future of the nation and the future of the state. So thank you for the seriousness with which you take up the issues. And thank you, Beth, for working so hard to get here after uh, all that you went through last night. Uh, appreciate that very much after all the storms we had in our area. Um, I, I've got a number of questions. I'll try to uh, pair them back and keep them as tight as possible. But I've, I want to start, first and foremost, uh, Jackie, talking about the audit process. Uh, and I, I know the advent of countywide uh, polling in this regard started roughly a decade ago. Uh, can you take us back just briefly and describe, if you will, the audit processes prior to countywide uh, polling versus where we are today, just to kind of describe the auditing then versus the auditing now? Uh, I'd like to start with that, if you wouldn't mind. Yes, sir. So audits were implemented in 2021. So prior to that point in time, there, any auditing that was done would have been done internally or if they were doing a partial manual hand count to check, you know, whether they, they had voting equipment that was actually properly tabulating races. And I don't know which counties were specifically doing that and at what point the partial manual hand count became required. But that was really where we were in terms of audits prior to 2021. In 2021, then we added the randomized county audits, which is four counties in the state of Texas are drawn randomly every two years, and there's a population differential. So you have two small counties and two large counties, and you look at all the elections held in those counties over the past two years. And that's what the procedural audits that are done currently. What our charge was when our division started was to look at the 2020 general election. And so when, when I started in 2022, that's what the audit process was. And to start, we had to look at, you know, what can we streamline? Because we knew that moving forward from 2020 general, we were going to be looking at smaller counties, counties like Eastland and Guadalupe. What are the processes and the audible points along the election process that we can say, where's the data that we can compare and validate so that voters can feel confident that the process was followed? And so that that's where, you know, how we streamlined our audit process. We started with reconciliation. If we saw discrepancies, then we went down to let's look at the tapes. Let's look at the records that came from the polling location. We interviewed election workers, staff, things of that nature to really get a picture of what was going on because each county is different. Those were four large counties, but they all run completely differently. So that's a high level view of that. Thank you. And so effectively, there really wasn't anything happening before 21. I mean, it was each individual county was up to itself, up to its own accord, whether or not they had any kind of audit uh, structure. Is that right? In terms of procedural audits? Yes. yes. Okay. All right. And then um, the, the training that you had to be an auditor at the time you were working inside the Secretary of State's office, maybe just describe that training and... I guess that's the first question. The second question is, how many individuals like yourself uh, have the level of competency in auditing elections to the degree that you have in the state? I want to get a sense of that. Our division, when we left, had approximately 13 uh, members of the staff, including myself and a director. We might have had up to 15. And the the staff ranged in terms of their prior experience. Some of them had experience in audits, but not in elections. Some of them had experience running elections, and we showed them what were the processes were and how we were going to analyze them. Some of them worked within the Secretary of State's office, so they had that background knowledge. But this was really, uh, a, Texas was a leader and a pioneer in establishing this, so this was really the first of its kind in the nation. Um, I had an investigative background, so we took the approach that we were going to find these auditable points, and then we were going to take a look back and see what can we do to build out the audit and show through a paper trail and through records and in interviews and things like that that things were properly done in those counties. Okay, very good. And with regard to, I know a big concern of the public today broadly uh, is, is concern with non-citizens being able to, uh, to vote. Um, can you speak to what we're doing today? And I know Christina can give some comments on 
the present. I know you're no longer with the Secretary of State's office, but let me talk about what you were doing previously and then what Christina is doing, if you don't mind, Christina, today with regard to addressing the issues from an audit perspective uh, with folks that are, uh, in fact, here illegally. So the audit that we did in 20, of the 2020 election, um, phase two is what we did. The first part of the audit was before any of us had started on staff, and that looked at list maintenance procedures, non-citizen voting, things of that nature. So that would probably still be more appropriate for Ms. Atkins because that was before our division actually started. And so I would defer to her as to how that was done at the time and is currently being addressed. Very good. Christina, if you don't mind. Sure. And so we're asking, the question is specifically about what's being done with <clears throat> with respect to eligibility, non-citizens, and how we're Specifically that. today, yes. Okay. Um, so in Texas, we have, let, let me just start by saying that list maintenance is something that happens every day in Texas. This is not a once or twice a year thing. It's a daily, it's a weekly, it's a monthly thing. Um, in Texas, one of the things that we do, we've actually been one of the, the states that has been on the forefront of this particular um uh, concept is we obtain data from the Department of Public Safety, DPS, on individuals that have driver's license transactions uh, where citizenship has been validated. If somebody shows up to register, or I'm sorry, if somebody shows up for a driver's license transaction and they present evidence uh, that they are not a U.S. citizen, um, that information is provided to our office and we look to see if they're currently a registered voter. If they are a registered voter uh, and they were registered prior to showing up to DPS to present evidence that they were not a U.S. citizen, we send that match out to a county for a county to investigate. And this is something that happens on a weekly basis right now. There are many other states out there that have started to model uh, state legislation and, and programs after what we've done here in Texas. Okay, very good. Um, to talk topic of chain of custody for a moment, um, uh, Ms. Atkins, you comment on the fact that there's a lot of things that should <laughs> Be happy to use the term should on many occasions in describing what's happening. Um, how many, in your assessment, counties at this point uh, in the state are, are really following uh, policy and statute as it is currently on the books versus not? I'm just curious as to your perspective from the SOS. View. So I'm going to borrow a line from Senator Betancourt uh, when he says that which gets measured gets fixed. I think that the implementation of the audit program, starting with those four audits that were done in 2020, have made enormous strides in improving compliance and improving local procedures. Um, when counties understand and know what we as a community have, def has, have defined as good practices in an election, when they understand and know how reconciliation should work, and they know that there's the potential for an audit, I have found that counties are making great improvements in their process. Now, can there be, is there room for more improvement? Absolutely. Um, I think in the, in the audits that we've been conducting, um, you know, taking over some of the, the good work that Jackie had done before she left the Secretary of State's office, you know, we've, we've identified a couple of areas that we're seeing as being particularly concerning, um, training issues, paperwork issues, something that, that was, that were, that Jackie and her team identified in the 2020 audits, we're continuing to see uh, as, as something to be concerned about, but we are seeing improvements. Okay. And, and, and in terms of the plans, I know you're obviously in the midst of a, a couple audits now. Um, what are the plans for the 2024 cycle for audits? Can you speak to that? Yes, sir. We are wrapping up those current audits. Um, I mean, they are very imminent to be released. Um, what we will be doing as soon as those are released this summer is we will be drawing four additional counties through a random selection uh, to bring into the audit program for the two-year cycle. Okay. And that will happen, I guess, in what, August, September time frame or um, something goes along? I think probably around the August time frame. Okay. Okay. All right. And then, um, you know, we talked on some of the technology pieces earlier. We talked about local area networks and so on and so forth and uh, the concern with regard to uh, the consolidation that's taking place today uh, with this countywide approach um, and obviously uh, concerns with regard to uh, data uh, being impacted, if you will, uh, or uh, corrupted by outside forces, whatever they may be. And I guess my question is, you know, Jackie, from your perspective and what you saw in, in that era when you were working in the audit function and, and also, Christina, from your perspective, uh, what, what, I mean, you guys have seen a lot of different uh, bodies of evidence. What have you seen thus far uh, that concerns you in that regard? 
during the audit, I did not have any evidence of any external manipulation or anything of that nature with regard to poll book records or to the actual ballots that were being tabulated. That was not something that ever showed up. What we saw was, you know, what is inherent in elections is human error, humans not following processes and procedures and things of that nature, things that the audits and further transparency can can remedy. And, you know, the audits are four counties every two years. And so bringing more transparency and more of these reporting requirements so that all counties are doing the, this and so it's more streamlined is going to benefit the public because you don't have to wait for your county to be under audit to be able to look and see are things running properly. An audit will do a deeper dive, be able to review it more in depth, but the reporting that you know can be done in a countywide polling place program county so that a, an individual voter can go and check that would be hugely beneficial. So if you want to comment on that? Sure. Speaking specifically to voter registration, um, I, th I think that's what we were we were starting on with Absolutely. that discussion as it relates to, you know, the, the voter list in e poll books. Um, there was a piece of legislation from 2023, it was Senate Bill 1113, that gave our, our office the ability to monitor compliance with list maintenance activities. Um, that piece of legislation also did quite a bit in holding counties accountable to ensure that they were performing the required list maintenance activities. Um, I think what we have learned in that process is when folks know that that we are checking to make sure that these processes are completed, that they're very careful and considerate about making sure that they're done timely and that they're done thoroughly. And so that, I think, impacts our underlying, the accuracy of our voter registration list. Um, one thing I will say on that is, you know, we, we mentioned earlier there is a difference between offline and online counties. You know, those counties that di directly use the statewide voter registration system, we call them the online counties, I have a lot more insight into what they're doing for compliance when it comes to voter registration list maintenance. I just have a lot more insight into how their day-to-day -day operations run with respect to managing even new registrations with our voter registration list. Um, on our offline counties, I can't see quite as much as what they do, um, but I but we do follow up with them from a compliance perspective because of that legislation. Okay. And go ahead. Okay. I have a question. On It's been brought up to me that regarding list maintenance, that names aren't actually dropped off the um, voter registration database, but their status is changed for list maintenance. What does it look like in Texas for list maintenance? Um, if there is someone who's moved out, of, moved out of state or deceased or changed counties or whatever, they're ineligible for any reason. Are their names completely removed off of the database or in Texas is their status changed? Seconds. If you don't mind answering that question, that would be great. Of course. Um, so with, with the way our voter registration list works, it, it is a dynamic list. It changes every day. We have new registrations. We have people that are canceled. And that's why, as, as Ms. Doyer indicated earlier, you, from an auditing perspective, uh, it's hard because it changes all the time. You can't go back and retroactively look and see what the list was two years ago. But as far as how these registrations are managed, um, we have legal requirements that say we have to maintain records for two years after a voter is canceled. Um, so those records are retained for a certain amount of time after, after so many years, the record falls off completely from the voter registration system. Okay. And uh, I guess from an audit perspective, in terms of comparing uh, precinct by precinct voting as opposed to countywide, can you speak to the inherent advantages? I think they're inherent advantages to precinct by precinct auditing as opposed to the countywide approach here to, to voting. But can you comment on that, your, your thoughts on advantages uh, versus disadvantages? On precinct level auditing versus countywide auditing? Yes. Um, well, what I would say, um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to echo some of the things that, that Ms. Doyer indicated. You know, I think for the countywide program, auditing is a little bit more complex. Uh, there's more documentation, more records that need to be looked at in order to see that path from uh, polling location to final result. Um, I think that complexity you know, could be improved upon if we had more specific requirements regarding reconciliation on a daily basis, reconciliation you know, for early voting. Um, there, there are some things that we can do to add a little bit more visibility in that path, whereas with precinct-based, um, I think you know, when you are looking at a particular precinct, you have a limited data set that you're looking at. What worries me is just the variability at, at the county level. You have so much more control at the precinct level, and I think that's what inherently we find to be attractive about it. Uh, maybe just for a moment speak to when we had, before we went to this countywide model, just in terms of 
the, the, st the, the election spectrum at that point uh, a decade ago with regard to speed and with regard to turnaround of election results. It's obviously one of the concerns we hear about going back to where we were 10 years ago and getting out of the countywide model is people being concerned. But uh, do we really have long delays 10 years ago, uh, any longer than we have today with all the issues that we see on a countywide basis when we see delayed results and so forth taking place? I've been working at the Secretary of State's office for about 12 years, and I don't remember seeing any kind of consistent or or I don't remember, I would say I don't recall seeing any kind of inconsistency in reporting delays. Um, I think that it, I'm, I'm, I just don't see any consist inconsistencies in that area. It wasn't, we didn't have a problem 10 years ago, I mean, in, in terms of delay. Not that I recall, sir, no. Yeah. Mm -mm. Jackie, do you want to comment on that further, do you, your perspective? No, I just, I don't have anything to add with regard to that time frame. Okay. okay. Are, are you talking about delays in voting? Just, just delays in reporting. Long lines? Just or ultimately re reporting, reporting results. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think I think the answer is there's no impact, right? I mean, historically, we, we didn't have these long delays that were unacceptable when we did it on a precinct by precinct basis. I think the thing that delays your reporting is going to be um, two things. The, the method of voting, uh, you know, if we have large jurisdictions that are looking to hand count ballots, the larger the jurisdiction, the more time that's going to take. So I think how you vote um, and how you end up tabulating your results, depending on your jurisdiction, can take more time. Um, so, so I think that's something. And, and I do think, I, I will say the transition to paper-based systems, I think was a very good thing from an audit perspective, but um, it does take a little bit more time to manually review ballots. Yes. And, and with regard to Dean Zaffarini's question earlier with regard to personnel, I know that's one of the big things we hear about is you can't find enough personnel, you can't find facilities to do precinct by precinct everywhere in the state. Um, I, I disagree in that regard. I think you can achieve those things. We did it historically. Uh, what is your perspective on the, the difficulty of that, right? I mean, it seems to me, I mean, each county is obviously going to offer a pay package uh, for any employee of county government, whether or not they're working in the voting office or the water department. Uh, it's just a matter of working to, uh, to have an attractive package, right? But what is your concern or, or, or what are your thoughts on that broadly? Is there any inherent concern from the Secretary of State's office with regard to complexity and getting uh, employees to, to work in those roles? You know, I think that we've heard for a long time that there's a difficulty in, re in re recruiting and retaining workers. This is not new. It's not specific to countywide. I think not specific every, to precinct based. Everywhere, any, this every, is any field of human endeavor today. Yeah. Yes, sir. And I would say, you know, the one thing to consider is um, I think if counties are concerned about adding a lot of additional locations, uh, one thing to consider is looking at the rules on combining and consolidation, something that Senator Betancourt mentioned earlier, to help alleviate some of those pressures. Yeah. Senator Parker, I would like to address that. Um, I've been an election judge for a little over 15 years, so I did start out with mostly paper, although we did have a tabulator. But in the good old days, all the little old ladies and all the little old men would show up and they would run the elections. And in fact, I had a hard time getting on because they owned the polling places. When we brought... You had to break in, Beth. I had to break in. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, I had to wear scarves and aprons just to show that I could do the job, you know, because that's what they did. And I had to decorate, you know. But when we introduced electronic poll books, ballot marking devices, and, and you know, you could not drive a Prius and set up my polling location because I have 10 poll books, and they will tend of those boxes. And I brought some back. There's a demo, but that maybe somebody can show it. But when we brought in all of this heavy equipment and the computer-based equipment, the DS-200, you have to, you know, program it and put passwords in and do all this. All the little old ladies and little old men quit. So I think if we go back to a less complex system of voting, they'll come back. They loved to do it. They loved to work. And we could get, now we do get student clerks, but I think we would get even more student clerks. I think our participation rate would go way up if we took out the complexity of our current election system, the way we vote, the way we count, everything. And one more thing on that note on hand counts, Germany, which is bigger than Harris County, Berlin is bigger than Houston. Germany hand counts their ballots. They get it done in a day. They use the jury pull system. They send out a summons and say, you can count ballots or you can serve on a jury. Most people actually want to count ballots. Okay. I don't know if they get paid or not. Um, all the European countries, 
hand, hand count ballots. Argentina hand counts ballots. By the way, they also won't serve alcohol the night before an election. That's um, just something maybe we should consider. But it can be done, but not all hand counting is, is equal. So time is a factor, but it can be done. Take out the complexity, and people will come back, and they will work. Thank, thank you, Ms. Beasel. Um, another topic, I guess, for discussion here, in terms of snapshots in time. We had this discussion earlier here at the beginning of your testimony today. Uh, Christine, I guess from your perspective in the Secretary of State's office, when you talk about snapshots in time and being able to capture data, uh, you know, we obviously had Jackie take us through a, a great overview here of what happened in, in Dallas County here recently. But what are your recommendations with regard to snapshots in time? A and can you really piece the meal together adequately <laughs> all those snapshots to be able to have a, an accurate understanding of what really took place? What's your perspective as the, our head of auditing today in Texas? So I think Jackie brought up a great point that it's really hard to retroactively look at particularly when we're talking voter registration, what the list was at that particular date and time. And I know that there are other states that have requirements that, that um, entities or counties have to download and retain a copy of a report on certain intervals, certain time frames, so that you can go back when you're, com when you're completing an audit, when you're looking to see uh, who was on the list of eligible voters for that election, you, you can see what it actually was as of a certain day. And so I know that there are other states that do that, that where it's been legislated, and um, I have not heard any particular concerns about adopting this as an additional election record to maintain. Okay. All right. And then my final question or two, just a technology question. Um, with regard to the process today uh, that we see, obviously, in e-poll books and so on and so forth, uh, I'm, I'm going to stray out briefly outside of countywide just very quickly. But, um, you know, what do we know about uh, overseas uh, servers today and uh, any Texas data that is being stored or uh, temporarily transmitted back and forth from overseas servers? Would you give us a snapshot of that today currently in the state, Christina? Sure. Um First, I want to emphasize that our electronic voting systems, where you are actually casting your ballot, those are not connected to the Internet, and those records are required to be maintained locally. So we at the state don't even have the ballots. We don't have a record of those votes, all maintained within that county, maintained locally. So I just want to make sure I clarify that because I think that's an important point to mention because that, that is what state law requires. Um, with respect to voter registration data or the information on the e-poll books, I think that's where you, you may see a little bit more variation. Um, there aren't as many laws that would restrict where those servers can be located um, or restrict what other data can be contained on those servers uh, with respect to different e-poll book vendors, and so that may be something to consider and look at. Yeah, no, thank you for that uh, very candid feedback of the situation currently. And then I, I think with regard to your comment that all those ballots are being held at the county level, I think that's another area where we need to really focus, uh, because I think the state really needs to have control of those ballots, in my opinion. Um, and what would that take? I know you all study these things 24-7, 365. What would it take for the Secretary of State's office to be able to maintain uh, those ballots and so not just be decentralized on a county by county basis, but to be able to actually have control and custody uh, as a state through the SOS office. What would that take from a manpower perspective, logistically? What, what, what are we looking at there? Maybe an NFL stadium? No, I, I, I joke. Um, I mean, I think that when we think about that, it's, it's about storage because in Texas we have paper-based systems now, and so we have actual voted ballots. That, that's our ballot of record. Yeah. And so it would be about um, finding a way to take possession of those ballots, maintain them and store them in a way that is safe and secure and can provide access. Um, I think that would be very difficult for a state the size of Texas to do uh, because just storage facilities alone, when you look at some of it, the larger counties, Dallas and Harris County, um, it, it's very, it, it takes up quite a bit of storage to store multiple elections. And remember, we have a 22 month retention period yes. for elections. It's exponential. I, I, I would also add one thing to that, sir. I think lo our elections are run locally. And I think that is. A, a strong feature to our election process in Texas. That decentralization allows local communities to make decisions about their election process. They can decide whether to participate in countywide or not, what type of voting system is best for them. And I think maintaining records like that locally also provide a level of auditability for 
local citizens and local residents. And so that might be a policy consideration to think about that centralizing that would, would move elections further, further away from the people that are conducting those elections. I think maybe a, potentially a balance where you have the kind of the random selection process where you've got some items maybe that are uh, stored and others that aren't, and certainly understand the physical challenge of that. But, you know, with regard to, you know, all the digital aspects that you could maintain that obviously here in the state, I think relatively yes, easily. The question is whether or not it's going to random process by which things are selected. Will you maintain local control, but at the same time have uh, greater controls from a state perspective. And you and you did make a distinction there. You know, actual physical ballots versus electronic records yes. um, are two different things. Yeah. And, you know, it is easier to maintain electronic records or to create some kind of repository for election records. So that, that may be a, an avenue to, to look at. Yeah. Yeah. And, and my final technical question, I guess, with regard to the use of um, Albert sensors uh, in the whole process today, uh, what's your perspective on... Um, uh, their impact uh, potentially on what's taking place uh, from when you look at the vantage point of Texas as a whole. What's your perspective on uh, the impact or the particular risk of Albert sensors to maintaining election integrity in the state of Texas? I'd like to get your perspective on that. I don't think that we should ever underestimate the importance of maintaining strong cybersecurity practices in our state. Um, you know, we've seen and we've, we've there's public reports that talk about um, bad actors, uh, foreign nations, and even, even folks within the United States that have made attempts to gain access to things that they shouldn't, you know, th through uh, electronic records, through the Internet. And so I think we never want to underestimate the importance of maintaining really strong security there. But I think strong security is a layered approach, and we cannot rely on any one organization or any one uh, aspect of our government to provide that for us. And so at the Secretary of State's office, we, we do a lot of our own monitoring and we do have a, a lot of our own, uh, maintain a lot of our own security protections in place because I think it's important for us in Texas to be able to speak to our security here in this state. Very good. Thank you all for the excellent discussion. Thank you, Senator Barger. Senator, is there any other questions for this panel? Thank you each for being here. Thanks for your testimony. And let me say, before we call the next panel, to those who are, are planning on testifying, we're going to continue to move through the agenda. Um, and I will go ahead and Ms. Atkins will be up close and ask Josh Reno to make his way down. Before they, before they formally call them, I'll just announce that um, after we hear from Ms. Atkins and Mr. Reno about, about uh, electioneering, we'll then have invited testimony on protecting Texas land and assets then we'll have invited testimony on Delta 8 and 9, and then we're going to open up for public testimony on all the topics today. So everyone who wants to testify will be able to. It's going to be a little while, so just be aware. You're welcome to stay or, or watch online. Everyone's welcome to testify, but we are going to, it's going to be a while before we get through the testimony, so just be aware of that. We're glad you're here, and we want to hear from everyone who wishes to uh, offer testimony. And so next uh, topic on our charge is about... Uh, political subdivisions and school districts using government resources for illegal election, electioneering. The law is uh, clear on this. This has been a concern that's been raised. It's in our committee charge. And so we're going to have Ms. Atkins and Mr. Reno. So the chair calls Christina Atkins, Josh Reno. And so Ms. Atkins, welcome back. Even though we know who you are, introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Christina Adkins. I'm the Director of Elections for the Texas Secretary of State's Office. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here to provide some information and answer some questions for you. Um, this, this particular issue, when it comes to what we're, what we're referring to as illegal electioneering and the use of public resources to promote electioneering or to promote um, certain positions with respect to ballot measures or candidates, um, has been kind of a tricky issue over the years. Um, I would say that over the years, our office has received complaints on this particular issue, and there have been limited enforcement mechanisms in place to address some of these issues. Um, on top of that, I would say, uh, as elections have evolved over time, and as folks have become more involved in the election process, we're seeing uh, greater concern for some direction in this area. You know, my office is a repository for complaints about the election process. And I would say in particular, in the 2023 November election, that, that particular election cycle, I think that there were a lot of local bond measures uh, on the ballot that created an uptick in um, 
electioneering practices. And so just based on the reports that came into our office, um, we were told about school districts that were sending home flyers with their students detailing the benefits of the bond packages. Uh, we were told about uh, websites, schools that were maintaining websites that had information about the bond packages um, that were, again, detailing benefits of the bonds and all of the things that uh, could result from passage of these of these bond packages. Um, we did hear about school districts um, and, and cities as well, but I think we're hearing about it a little bit more in the context of school districts, that were sending out emails to their community members, to families, to parents, and even their own employees. Um, that we're saying everything except for vote yes on that bond package or that we're linking to websites uh, and linking to other information out there that made reference to specific candidates or made reference to voting in a certain way. Um, we had calls from employees of certain school districts. Um, we had a couple of those calls this, back in 2023 where they were concerned because they were feeling pressured to vote a certain way and they wanted to know what remedies were in place. And unfortunately, in those situations, those individuals did not want to identify themselves or file a public complaint because of concerns of, of retaliation. Um, but it was, you know, we typically see those complaints uh, from the voter side, but it was interesting that we started receiving complaints from employees on that. And so I think uh, this is something that's becoming a at least that we're hearing about more. I think the more the public is engaged in this particular area, the more they're aware of the election process, the more we're seeing concerns um, dictated. Now, if a complaint comes into our office that alleges something in this area that, that um, impacts the use of public funds, um, what we typically do is uh, refer that person to the Texas Ethics Commission because they do have some re referral authority to the Attorney General's office. Um, but I know that um, I think folks get a little frustrated that there are some uh, limitations there on what can and can't be done. Thank you, Ms. Atkins, for your testimony. Mr. Reno, welcome. Introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. Good afternoon. My name is Josh Reno. I'm the Deputy Attorney General for Criminal Justice. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be here, and thank you for having this this uh, interim charge. I think all the issues that have been discussed up until this point are extremely important. This one's important as well, uh, but I, I hope this one is a little bit less uh, controversial for you all. Um, I, I think Christina gave a great recitation of kind of where we're at, in the current state of things. Uh, as you all may or may not be aware, some of those complaints did come to our office most recently in the, the past primary election uh, leading up to um, uh, a lot of issues with school districts that were reaching out uh, with their state-owned resources uh, and, and district resources to encourage folks to vote for a particular candidate who was uh, against school vouchers. Uh, and so because that particular issue is, is just kind of on front of everybody's mind, I would just point out that it's, it seems that there are some areas in the law that need to be tightened up that have not quite caught up with the electronic uh, era that we are in. Uh, because what I, th I think is what, what I'm seeing happening is there is a balance uh, when we talk about electioneering. If you are a principal at a school, uh, you're not always the principal, right? You ought to be able to put your principal hat away and go endorse a candidate and block walk or do whatever you can. But then there's that fine line of, well, now you're wearing your T-shirt for your school and you're using some of your influence as that principal uh, in order to, to uh, promote that candidate or that particular issue. Bonds are certainly a, a, a thing that we hear a lot about the complaints coming in on. Uh, and so I think there's a balance that needs to be made, but I think there is some, some clear lines that we can draw in the laws. We'd be happy to discuss that with you uh, during this interim to talk about where some areas that we might be able to talk specifically about emails being sent out and that being a state resource. Uh, thanks, Mr. Reno. Senator Bencourt, you're recognized. Uh, thanks for your testimony, uh, Josh. Let's, let's go over this. Um, you've, got, sorry, you've got at least uh, how many lawsuits are currently underway by, by the department on in this election uh, hearing era? Sure. I cannot tell you which ones are still pending. I know that we filed seven different civil actions. Uh, now, keep in mind, please, that I'm a, I'm a simpleton. I'm a criminal lawyer. I've been a prosecutor my entire career. I'm aware of where those, uh, what those cases are, um, and they were uh, filed through our administrative law division. Uh, I know that we filed seven of them. I believe some of them have already been, been resolved. Right. I was going to ask, I think, you know, three resolved, but you don't know off the top of your head. I think that's about right, yes. Okay. Now, the, 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 what I've seen, and some of these, you know, quite frankly, I've referred some of these to you because we were getting the same complaints that, uh, that Secretary of State's office was. Now, 
the, the general MO of this, and I'll use a criminal term as opposed to civil, is that you've got somebody that crosses the line between state resources and their private opinion, true? That's if, absolutely correct. Is that the, kind of the – that's the general constant MO that we see in this election uh, situation? Correct, and I will – I would at least point out uh, in my mind what I've seen is a lot of times you've got good people who want – to be involved in this process, uh, and they are stepping over the line. And sometimes they're reaching out to us to ask, hey, did we just step over the line? And it's like, yeah, you better back off. But there's plenty of people who want to do the right things, and, the, and they're asking, trying to find out where that line is, what they can and cannot do. But then there are some other folks who I think are willing to push the envelope intentionally. Right, and I think some of your earlier suits were those where it was clearly obvious that somebody was setting up – oops – Okay, good. We seem to be having a run of these, Mr. Chairman. I hope it's not serious. Oh, she's up and doing fine. Okay. Very good. We're, we're very happy for that, by the way. So, um, the, the, uh, Josh, the, uh, you know, look, I, I've seen this cycle more electioneering than I've seen in any cycle in my lifetime. I would agree. And it goes way back because I was an election official long ago in a galaxy far away. And what we don't, what I, what I'm just astonished and disappointed at, okay, is what are clear electioneering, where you've got um, individuals saying, you know, uh, here, go to this link and vote for these people right. on state resources because that's what an ISD list is. If I, am I missing something? No. An no, ISD not. email is not a personal email, right? Okay. Uh, at least I don't believe it is, unless y'all are going to redefine it. No, I, I I think you're correct. I I would like to see and, and make some suggestions to the Please, committee. that's what I was going to ask. Right? I, okay. The electronic part of electioneering, I think, is the, where the law is currently has not kind of caught up. And we are having to look at, or at least in our investigations, and I, I'm pointing behind me to our, <coughs> our election integrity division chief, Jeff Barr, so I apologize. Uh, when we're looking at this, we're having to go back and look at Texas ethics opinions. Um, and not, and we're reaching beyond just the law. We're having to go to the te te Texas Ethics Commission opinions in order to kind of piece some of these things together. And I think we need to kind of put some of that into law to, to deal with the electronic part of, of what we're talking about when we well, talk yeah, about state this resources. Is, look, it's like the poll books were really bolt-ons to existing less, election systems. Mm -hmm. You know, this, so there's technology advances. You, you, and you have to look at these things not as a static unit but as a continued use. But, I mean, the areas that I see that were just uh, quite, uh, you know, over the top were offering, you know, something of value for voting, um, using, you know, governmental resources and direct solicitation of votes, sending uh, people to websites where they were told how to vote, um, you know, direct phone calls by candidates to superintendents that were documented saying, you know, how can I get help from specific school systems to do – I mean, the list is kind of quite extensive. And I will say that in, from talking with folks and what I've dealt with in my experience, this used to be a few phone calls – to some folks saying, hey, you've stepped over the line, you need to fix it, and they immediately didn't mean to back off, resend the whatever, um, and the behavior would stop. Uh, and it, that, that is certainly different than what we have seen in the current state. No, and this is an important point, Mr. Chairman, uh, that, that this, uh, you know, instead of, oh, gosh, I made an error, sorry, I'm, you, you know, yeah, paraphrasing you, it is, no, well, there's nothing wrong with this. We're... We can use state resources to allocate, I mean, to lobby for a bond issue or lobby against a candidate that is pro-school choice. Um, and there's nothing wrong with it. And that's the attitude that I'm seeing in some of these cases. I mean, that's direct, you know, response to some of the direct inquiries from either the Secretary of State or the AG. Am I missing something, Christine? Are you getting that pushback too? Uh, no, sir. I think that you're spot on on that assessment. Right. And this is really needs to end. So this is my attempt at saying stop this. Everybody needs to understand. They need to stop electioneering with government resources. This always ends in a bad place. Ends up in a bad place for the people doing it. Ends up in a bad place for the systems that are doing it. Ends up in a bad place for the schools that are doing it. Ends up in a bad place for the candidates that are doing it. In fact, there's no good place that electioneering with government resources ends up that I'm aware of. Chairman. Dean Zeffering. As a follow-up question, 
What kind of training do school officials receive regarding what they need to do to comply with the laws regarding political activities and the use of government resources? I, I don't have that answer to that question, Senator. I would have to research that and get back to you. I'm, I'm not aware of anything that from my divisions, but that would be on the criminal side of things. Um, but I would research that and get back back to you on that. Okay, and Ms. Atkins, do you have an opinion? No, I'm, I'm in the same situation. I don't know what the current law is with respect to training and, and those items, but we can definitely look into it. And I wasn't asking about laws, just whether they are trained at all. The training programs. Um, I'm sorry, that's just not something I have information on, but, but we can look. Thank you. And to you, sir, how has the implementation of House Bill 20 impacted the number of lawsuits filed by users seeking account restoration or content republication? I don't have any on any data on that, uh, Senator. I know that uh, House Bill 20, uh, I believe, is net choice, as as is kind of commonly referred to. Uh, that was enjoined pretty quickly. That it, case is being handled by our Solicitor General Division. Uh, it was argued to the Supreme Court in February of this year, and we're still awaiting the opinion to be uh, handed down. And so, um, I don't know that there's any data that would be available as as that. Uh, law was enjoined pretty quickly. Okay. Do you have information regarding the complaints filed under House Bill 20 and the outcomes of those complaints? I don't. I would have to speak with uh, some other divisions to get that, that information for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dean. Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, under current law, what are the consequences um, for a school district that is in clear violation of electioneering? Sure. I'll, I'll start with the ones that I know of, uh, and that's the criminal law. Uh, electioneering or using of state resources to electioneer uh, is a Class A misdemeanor. Uh, so that's up to a year, zero days in jail, up to a year, uh, and up to a $4,000 fine. Uh, I don't know the civil penalties. Uh, mostly what we looked for was an injunction, uh, be able to move in quickly, stop the behavior. Uh, and so I will tell you that as the Attorney General's office, when we had the discussions about these complaints that were coming in, we have a choice of whether or not we can go the criminal route to investigate it, uh, or we can move quickly in a civil context uh, to, to rectify the behavior. Uh, our office chose to file the seven civil lawsuits uh, and not investigate civilly because people react a lot differently when cops with badges and guns show up at the door versus a lawsuit. Uh, and so. The other part of the criminal side of things is it moves very slowly versus a civil lawsuit, which we could address the issues that were happening in real time and try to put them, put a stop to them. So what does it mean to put a stop to, this is, I think, a question we all have to think about, right? So if a principal or um, school employee uses uh, the school email to uh, send out an email that is um, in violation of the electioneering, um, I mean, you can't really put that genie back in the bottle, right? I was going to say the toothpaste back in the tube, but yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, it is, at least from our perspective, what we've been attempting to accomplish uh, is getting uh, agreements, consent decrees in place that say, I understand what this was a violation and I'm not going to do it again. Uh, but it doesn't address backwards, um, it, the, like you said, putting the genie back in the bottle of, of, of any electioneering that has already occurred up until that point. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned that there is a, there's a criminal path, there's a civil path. Um, it could, it, class A misdemeanor um, up to a year in jail? That is correct. Or fine. And, and how would that, I mean, if that were pursued, how would that happen? Sure. So, um, the Attorney General's office could certainly investigate those criminal allegations uh, through our criminal investigations division. So a complaint would be complaint. made by someone in the public to the OAG? And, and just as it had come into our office in the seven lawsuits that we filed, those could have been referred to our criminal investigations division. Um, they would have investigated that probably. Uh, these are fairly straightforward cases. You've got a copy of the email. You go look at the, the server. You get some information showing that it came from that computer and being able to prove uh, with probable cause. And then you present it uh, to that district or county attorney of the jurisdiction in which the, the offense occurred. Um, the attorney general in the state of Texas doesn't have 
original jurisdiction to go prosecute those cases. We can investigate them, and then we would have to refer them over to um, the, the local DA or okay. county attorney. Okay. And then it would either continue or stop based on the action of the local DA. That is correct. And I'm not aware of any referrals that have been made uh, by local law enforcement on these particular issues. They've all come from kind of citizen complaints. Mm -hmm. um, and someone may have better information on this. I, I was un under the impression that there have been at least one DA um, that did actually, I guess, press charges, if I'm using the right I think um, that's the right term. language, uh, against a principal uh, who had engaged in this? or I'm not aware. Okay. I don't know if, if that actually occurred or not, but I'm, I'm happy to look into that and okay. find out if, okay. if one. Um, okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Senator Perry, you're recognized. It, it's quick. It's, I'm still on the other panel. Christina, when you get a chance, subject to scheduling on ours, nothing urgent today, would you come by my office and visit to me about the list maintenance and some of the conversation we had earlier? And it's just been running through my mind. I still got a lot of unanswered questions. I'm sure I'm way behind these other experts, but but I need to understand that fully just to 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 have a concept of real time and and why we're not able to do what we say we can't do from the previous panel. So just connect at my office again. Yes, no, no, no sense of urgency today. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, such as any other questions uh, for these witnesses. Thank you. Thank you both for being here. No, You're excused. You. <coughs> Another one of the important topics before the committee with our interim charges assigned to us by the Lieutenant Governor uh, has to do with protecting Texas land and assets. And so uh, we have some divided testimony on this topic that we'll be taking up now. And so uh, the chair calls Christopher Holton, John Yang, Mr. Holton and Mr. Yang will be discussing the, the uh, question about uh, strategic land and asset acquisitions in Texas by, uh, you know, uh, actors from uh, certain foreign and foreign countries, uh, and which was an issue last session. It's been one of discussion for a while, and then following their testimony, then we'll take up the, the issue of um, institutional, large institutional purchases of single-family homes and home ownership affordably affordability in general. So we'll be starting this in just a moment. Everybody hang tight.
and I'm reminded now we have so many uh, matters about real estate and homeownership. On this charge, we're also going to ask Scott Norman to come forward. He's going to be speaking on this topic as well as the next one. So there he is. Come on down. I think Mr. Classen's here, too. He, uh, is, he, is he speaking on the – are you speaking on the foreign ownership issue as well or just – okay. We're good. Hold tight. We're good. You, you – right there for now. Thank you. We do want to hear from you shortly, though, so don't – please don't go too far. We're glad you're here. All right. So thank you each for being here. We're going to start with Mr. Holton and move – my right to your left, that's not a left-right thing. It's uh, depends on where you're sitting. But, Mr. Holton, welcome. Introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. My name is Christopher Holton. I currently serve as Senior Analyst and Director for State Outreach at the Center for Security Policy, a national security organization founded by former Reagan administration defense officials to promote peace through American strength. The center has been actively involved in the issue of foreign adversary ownership of land in multiple states for three years now. Thank you very much for the honor and privilege to address this committee. I believe that it is vital that we begin by thanking this committee for taking a thoughtful approach to this issue. Texas is a leader in the country, and there are at least a dozen states that are watching what Texas does on this issue. Texas very often sets the pace for the rest of America. The thorough and thoughtful reasoned approach to the issue of foreign adversaries occupying, owning, and controlling land and other real property, including land in close proximity to military bases and installations, should serve as an example and inspiration for states from close to coast to coast. So whereas Texas is naturally a national leader, you are far from alone in this fight. Dozens of other states have already acted on this issue. Different forms of legislation have sought to provide protection in different ways. Some bills have focused solely on agricultural land in an effort to maintain our vital food security. Others have focused on restricting foreign adversary ownership of land near military installations, especially after the U.S. Air Force called the proposed acquisition of land by a Chinese entity near one of its bases a threat to national security. Legislation can be and has been structured to include specific remedies, such as fines, voiding sales, forfeiture, judicial revocation of licenses and business charters, judicial dissolution of business entities, judicial prohibition of an identified agent of a foreign adversary doing business in the state, and judicially awarded resolution, restitution for civil damages for harmed innocent third parties. These remedies can be fashioned with full due process for all involved. Now, nations like China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran are quite different from the vast majority of nations around the world. All are adversaries of the U.S. under various levels of sanctions from the Department of the Treasury. Foreign adversaries are defined in the Code of Federal Regulations as foreign governments or foreign non-government persons who have engaged in a long-term pattern of serious instances of conduct significantly adverse to the national security of the United States or security and safety of United States persons. Legislation must recognize this and protect not just Texas, but the entire country from what the United States Air Force has termed a threat to our national security. Obviously, the overarching threat currently is from the Communist People's Republic of China, a threat that should need no introduction, but which includes a massive military buildup aimed at the U.S., bellicose threats directed at the U.S. and our allies, state-sponsored serial intellectual property theft, espionage, currency manipulation and unfair trade practices, violations of American airspace, violations of international law, gross human rights violations, state-sponsored organ harvesting, and global genocide due to knowingly lying to international health organizations during the COVID-19 pandemic and refusing to cooperate with international investigations and research into the COVID-19 virus. Communist China has been waging highly unconventional conflict against the U.S. in a campaign labeled by the People's Liberation Army as unrestricted warfare. And that includes the strategic acquisition of state-by-state-backed state Chinese companies and Chinese Communist Party members to pay top dollar for U.S. companies, real estate, and especially agricultural land. It is important to note that legislation addressing this threat is not part of a protectionist or anti-foreign movement. Texas served, serves as, along with many other states, the breadbasket of the entire world. 
and foreign investors already own millions of acres of farmland because our agricultural industry is so productive. Canadian, German, and Italian firms come to mind. They own a lot of land in this country, agricultural land. It is right and proper that America should welcome such relations with our friends and allies. But China is a different case because Chinese entities are invariably controlled by the Chinese communist government, and that government is decidedly hostile toward America. Not coincidentally, the Chinese regime in recent years has reverted to becoming much more Maoist in its philosophy and policies, and even to the point of declaring a Maoist renaissance. Mao Zedong, in case anyone was unaware, was the biggest mass murderer of the 20th century, responsible for more deaths than Hitler, Stalin, and Pol Pot combined. It is because of China's position as a rogue nation that it is so important that they not control any portion of our food security or have easy access to conduct surveillance and reconnaissance of our military installations. Not only has China attempted to establish an outpost, outpost near Grand Forks Air Force Base in North Dakota, home to some of America's state-of-the-art intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance assets, but in Texas, they acquired tens of thousands of acres in the same county as Laughlin Air Force Base a few years ago, a major pilot training installation. Chinese assets near military installations comprise various threats, including monitoring of techniques and procedures, as well as signals intelligence, in which passive collection of U.S. signals and communications would be undetectable and could be accomplished simply by placing antennas tuned to the right frequencies. It is no wonder that the Air Force termed the Grand Forks Project a threat to national security. China has been particularly active in attempting to acquire line land in the U.S. From 2010 to 2020, the amount of land that China owned in the U.S. was valued at $81 million and increased to $1.8 billion in that 10-year period. Now, food security is national security. If Americans don't act, China will. Now, it's unfortunate that state legislatures are having to act against this threat, but all Americans can be glad that you are. The federal government's response to this has been inconsistent at best. CFIUS, the Committee for Foreign Investment in the U.S., punted on this issue. Fortunately, sanity prevailed in the U.S. Air Force, as has been the case in so many cases and, in, around, and on so many issues, the states simply cannot afford to wait for the federal government to get out of its own way or for gridlocking Congress to break free. Now, some have asked why this legislation must apply to individuals and companies as well as to governments. Well, first of all, every Chinese company, without exception, is majority owned or controlled by the Chinese Communist Party or the People's Liberation Army. In other words, there is no distinction in, chi in China's hybrid communist system between the private sector and the public sector. There is no free enterprise in communist China. Second, there have been instances of Chinese nationals buying U.S. land who were later discovered to be high-ranking members of the Chinese Communist Party. That is exactly what happened here in Texas, where a former officer of the Chinese People's Liberation Army, an official in the Chinese Communist Party named Sun Guangxin, acquired 140,000 acres of land in the same county as Laughlin Air Force Base. That prompted the Texas legislature in 2021 to pass the Lone Star Infrastructure Protection Act to prevent that project. Now, there's another aspect to this that I would ask the committee members to keep in mind. In other states, similar legislation did not apply to legal permanent residents in the United States. So legislation can be tailored so that it would not impact every foreign national, such as those that are here on work visas. Texas has the opportunity to establish the gold standard for what every state needs to do by prohibiting or restricting foreign adversaries from purchasing, holding, or acquiring title to real property in Texas. The language should recognize that when a foreign adversary makes a move to acquire land, it's not the Chinese government signing contracts and agreements. It is done through holding companies, foreign cutouts, and fronts. Legislation can be structured in such a way as to effectively police these activities and entities. Furthermore, legislation can be written in such a way as to hold harmless realtors, land title attorneys, and landowners in such transactions and expresses, expressly does not hold private individuals and entities accountable to be the enforcement arm of government. That should be the job given to the state attorney general or some other officer of the state. It has been speculated that it will be impossible to know if a foreign adversary moves to acquire land, but that is not necessarily so. 
Under existing law, foreign purchases of agricultural land, as an example, must be reported to the U.S. Department of Agriculture in recognition of the fact that foreign control of land in our food security is a major concern. In addition to that, there are many times when we pass laws against crimes knowing that people are still going to break that law, but you have to have the law to have an enforcement mechanism. Now, despite all the attention focused on this issue recently due to China's aforementioned actions, this is not a new issue. According to the National Agriculture Law Center, 21 states already have restrictions or prohibitions against foreign land ownership. Others require permission for such purchases. America needs a government that prevents our potential adversaries from buying our arable land and to prevent those adversaries from controlling even a portion of our domestic food supply. We also need to protect the safety and security of our critical infrastructure and military installations. Again, thank you for your leadership on, on this issue, and thank you for the distinct honor and privilege of addressing this committee. Ms. Holden, thank you for your testimony. Mr. Yang, you're welcome. Introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Chairman Hughes, Vice Chair Paxson, for having us here for this testimony. I would also like to thank a Asian Texans for Justice and other Asian American community groups here in Texas for inviting me here to talk about this very, very important issue. So my name is John Yang. I'm the President and Executive Director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. We're a nonprofit organization that seeks to advance the civil and human rights of Asian Americans and to promote a fair and equitable society for all. AAJC is deeply concerned by the resurgence of alien land laws here in the state and throughout the country. At bottom, these land laws seek to prevent certain classes of people from owning land based on who they are. We are, have tracked at least 27 states, as the previous uh, witness has testified, that have been introduced or pre-filed legislation of this nature. <coughs> we filed a lawsuit in Florida challenging one of these laws. At bottom, these laws exact a clear cost on Texas and Texans from the affected countries without a clear benefit that is being offered. To be clear, the regimes of Xi Jinping, Bashar Assad, uh, Kim, Kim Jong-un, and Vladimir Putin are despicable. They do not represent democracies. They, are, they do uh, attack human rights. But we must make a clear distinction between these governmental regimes and how we address these governmental regimes and the people that are subjugated by these regimes and even the corporations that are subjugated under these regimes. There is a clear distinction, and this notion that all of them are acting on behalf of the government must be dissipated and must be understood. When we in the United States have failed to recognize that distinction, we have subjugated people in our country, often our own citizens and residents, to harm and discrimination. Unfortunately, historically, Asian Americans have too often been that victim. For example, during World War II, the Japanese Empire did indeed present a real threat to America and indeed the world. But as a result, over 120,000 Americans, Americans of Japanese descent, were put behind barbed wires, had their properties taken away from them on fictitious and false allegations that they somehow owed their allegiance to the Japanese emperor and not to the United States. Similarly, on 9-11, there was a terrorist attack by al-Qaeda, but we also saw the profiling and targeting of people of Muslim and Sikh faith that resulted in violence and indeed murder because that they were considered terrorists. These are just two examples of how the mantra of national security has been used to discriminate against Asian Americans. Conflating the actions of foreign governments and entities with individuals who happen to have the same nationality or origin is dangerous and wrong. This also feeds into a stereotype that Asian Americans in particular face and that we are constantly fighting, that of the perpetual foreigner. This notion that no matter how long we've been in this country or we're even born in this country, that we are seen as foreigners and somehow owe our loyalties to somewhere else. From microaggressions to slurs to bullying to outright physical violence, these are the harms and costs that are imposed on our Americans caused by this type of stereotyping. On the other side of the ledger, we also need to examine closely what are the actual benefits that these policies will produce. It is too often too easy to use the words national security and therefore stifle debate about what the actual security threat is and whether that policy being proposed will address that security threat. We, we have to think about what research that we have. For example, many alien land laws prohibit ownership of land close to critical infrastructure. In this context, is this threat being presented to that infrastructure caused by landowners in that facility? By all public accounts, much of those threats to critical infrastructure involve cybersecurity, involve hacking, 
That security does not involve anything related to the physical proximity to that land. Similarly, we have seen laws that limit ownership of agricultural land by foreign entities. It is unclear whether this threat is a true national security threat, and I appreciate how the prior witness talked about this in terms of an economic threat or a food security threat. By making that type of distinction, we help. But even when we make that distinction, we should make clear, of the, of the largest holders of foreign-owned foreign agricultural land, by country, they involve Canada, Netherlands, Italy, England, and Germany. And even the foreign-owned land in the United States only constitute 3% of our privately owned land. China accounts for less than 1% of foreign-owned agricultural land. So if we are talking about economic competitiveness in Texas, really the competition also involves your neighboring states, whether it's cattle farmers from Oklahoma, whether it is poultry far farmers in Iowa, or it is dairy in Wisconsin. To summarize, when we are considering legislation such as this, I ask all of you to engage in thoughtful conversation in doing that thought cost-benefit analysis with the nuance necessary to develop real solutions to precise problems. The costs in this area often are inflicted on individuals and communities that are being stigmatized for their ethnicity or religion. The cost of stereotyping and hyperbolic lang language that we have seen surrounding so-called national security is verbal and physical violence against these communities. Saying that a policy will benefit national security is too simplistic and does not lead to effective results. Only by doing this analysis will all of you as policymakers be able to craft the solutions that are necessary to protect security and protect individual freedom. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you for your testimony. Now, and uh, everybody's welcome here, and we, we, uh, we're going to listen to testimony. We do want to... We don't uh, we don't react from the from the audience though, so we're going to let the witnesses testify. I don't not interrupt them. Thank you, Mr. Norman. Welcome. Introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Madam Chair. My name is Scott Norman, Senators. Good to see you all again. I'm the CEO of the T Texas Association of Builders, and um, my comments on this this part of the charge are going to be rather limited. I'm going to talk more about some of the other, the later charge here in a minute. But um, I will say, following up on both the prior witnesses, we, we were engaged along with a broad coalition last session and continue to be very engaged on this very important topic. And um, as an industry is representing the Texas home building, remodeling, development industry, um, speaking for our association, we share the concerns on foreign purchases from hostile nations of ag land and critical infrastructure and around military bases. But there are a lot of unintended consequences that we have to be aware of. And working with our coalition of mortgage bankers, bankers, apartments, um, realtors, uh, the title industry, uh, we submitted some written comments earlier today that I think the, the committee director may have received. And, and we want to continue to work with this committee to make sure that a couple of different things. One, how is this going to be enforced? I think prior witnesses were talking about should the private sector be the ones that are enforcing this, which is what's truly a national security issue. We do not feel like um, private companies and private individuals need to be on the ones on the hook for enforcing this. Two, what are the remedies involved if, if these transactions do occur? Texas has a very robust real estate economy, one of the best in the nation, if not the best in the nation, and we want to make sure that continues to go forward. Um, also, we're very concerned on the impact of this on single family home purchases, um, individuals, um, as well as multifamily and other residential units um, that we don't affect citizens, even if they are from foreign countries, on purchasing a home while they are here legally. Um, that is something that our industry has worked very hard to not discriminate and not get involved with uh, Fair Housing Act issues and getting um, putting that onus back on our industry and trying to police who can and cannot buy homes um, probably does not lead to a good uh, good solution. So we look forward to working with this committee as legislation, I'm sure, next session will be developed and, and we try to resolve something. And I think there's a way to craft something that does work um, as long as we address some of those issues. Thank you, Mr. Norman. Uh, Senator Menendez, uh, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Yang, uh, Mr. Norman, Mr. Holton, thank you all for being here. Mr. Yang, as I was reviewing your testimony and the charge, my understanding the organization that you represent, uh, Asians at Americans Advancing Justice, uh, you're, you're here to help and I think you did a very good job identifying 
the problems of singling out legislation that, that are going to be focused on a, on a single uh, group of people. That in many ways when we pass legislation that you're going to, how, how do you decide who gets affected? You know, is it the last name? Is it the way they look? Is it the way they speak? How do you decide your, to you, you enforce? And your organization has nothing at all to do with the uh, CCP, correct? That's correct. And, and it is my personal experience that many immigrants who are fleeing communist countries have as much, if not more, animosity towards the countries they've left than the people because they know firsthand the pain and the hurt that they and their families have gone through. So I share your concerns. Um, I understand that in Florida, where this law is passed, I think you're, you are part of a, a a lawsuit that's uh, going on and what's going on with that because I, I'd hate for the state of Texas to put us into a position where I, sometimes we we have intentions that that are, take us down a road that we think is going to solve something but we can actually uh, not fix the problem make it make give us some unintended consequences. Tell us what's happened in Florida with this situation. Sure. I appreciate the question. So in Florida, there are two lawsuits. Uh, one lawsuit that is currently before the Federal Court of Appeals in the 11th Circuit uh, is founded both, both on federal preemption grounds and equal protection grounds. The federal appellate court has temporarily enjoined the legislation from being enforced on the basis of federal preemption. We also have a lawsuit suit that is based on national fair housing laws as well as the state constitution. Mm -hmm. uh, so currently that law that law is enjoined from being enforced and we'll have to wait till see what the courts do. And I appreciate also what you're saying if you, you don't mind me adding about sort of the, this cost on our communities because you are exactly right. If you think about some of the immigrants that are coming to this country from China, from Iran, from a number of these countries, they're fleeing that persecution that we're talking about, that the, the dictatorial regimes that we're talking about. And for us to have laws that are disincentivizing for them to become part of our system, mm -hmm. forcing them to somehow prove their loyalty to this country, really goes against our own national security interests in trying to create a country that has that type of citizenry that is willing to stand up for this country. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, it's an odd juxtaposition to be listening to this type of legislation based on the history of this country, that just about everybody who's sitting up here has uh, can trace their descendants to people who came to this country. Uh, very few of us were actually here in the first place. Um, I, think, um, I think I'm worried about the fact that this country has been based on a system of private property rights and legislation like this interferes with those private property rights. And you need to be careful in, in, the, in going down that road. But thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Mendez, thank you. Senator Schwartner, you're recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this question is for Mr. Yang and, and Mr. Holton to key in on. But Mr. Yang, you, you, would, you rightly pointed out the various regimes, various nations across the world that um, are ruled by despotism and totalitarianism. Would you say that in China that it is, a, it is currently under an authoritarian, communist, despot regime as far as its um, governance? Uh, I want to be careful because I'm not a sort of State Department expert, but yes, I would regard it as a dictatorial authoritarian regime. But again, I want to make a distinction between that government system and some of the people that are being subjugated under it. Okay. And as such, a, a citizen of, of that regime, in this case a Chinese national, as Mr. Holton said, would have very little individual rights, ownership rights, as all means of production, or all free enterprise, all corporations are ultimately subjugated and part of the communist system. That, that is where I would differ with you on. And again, I, I want to be careful because I, although I did actually practice as an in-house counsel in China for an American company called Illinois Tool Works, so I understand 
how the Chinese system Illinois works. Illinois Tool Works. Illinois Tool Works, yes. Mm -hmm. ITW, right? Yes, the ITW, that's exactly right. Um, I, I, certainly, I would dispute this notion that all Chinese companies are completely subjugated to the whims of the Communist Party. You know, there is a distinction to be made between how corporations operate, even under that regime, than having to say that they are all completely under that control. Of Isn't that, that an anthem to the definition of communism? I, again, I want to be careful here, but that, this is where I, I, I would make that distinction and why we need to be very, very careful in how we define these issues and what we are talking about when we're talking about Chinese individuals, Chinese corporations, and what the exact security threat is it, 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 we are talking about. But again, are certainly aren't with respect Chinese to some of these individuals subject, subjects of the communist Chinese state. In a way that is no different than Americans are subject to uh, uh, American law. So would, in that I would context, with you regarding the Bill of Rights, in, the Constitution, and, and right. the rights of citizens in the United States versus the rights of any Chinese under this current Chinese regime. But but if I could, and this is where again, this is where we need to do further study. We need to understand how this works exactly, right? Because when we are talking about some of these Chinese investors that people have talked about, some of the press around that, you know, you you are also looking at people that. Again, we could question sort of the private property interests or what their motivations are from a capitalistic perspective. But some of that, you know, you look at even like the press accounts around Jack Ma, is they, they are suggesting that they want to invest, invest in the United States, not for communist reason, but because they see this as a place that deserves to be invested in. Yeah, I, I would actually point to Jack Ma as a very good example of the power of the communist state to take over a corporation or an individual regarding their freedoms or rights of either the corporation or the individual. And as such, as Mr. Holton, I think, rightly pointed out, when an individual, a supposedly a benevolent individual, comes to the United States and wants to purchase land in any capacity, and they are a citizen, in this case a subject of a communist state, in this case the Chinese Communist Party and the totalitarian regime that is China currently, that they are subject to that regime, even though they are, might have benevolent intentions. And as such, we as a country have every right, even though I agree with my fellow senator here regarding private property rights and ability to do with your land what you want to do, having six generations of land ownership here. I think we have a greater responsibility to our country, our state to look at this very closely regarding who we are selling to because an individual from another country if that country ha gives no rights and stills no rights in that individual or that corporation that communist corporation that, that chinese corporation that commun communist or chinese citizen then they can do eventually with that that piece of property what they want to uh, in a you know a totalitarian measure, uh, measure, just as they have with Jack Ma and, and uh, Alibaba. So my comments. Mr. Holton, do you have any comments to that? Senator, I appreciated your comments, sir, and I uh, agree with what you said. To me, the assertion that a Chinese individual or Chinese entity, and I don't mean the ethnic Chinese, I mean a Chinese citizen, a right. Chinese subject, or a Chinese corporation, doing international business is not subject to the totalitarian system under which they operate is salacious at best. I, and I, I want to draw a very distinct line, a bright line there, regarding a Chinese ethnic, either refugee that has refugee status or has legal status in this country for whatever reason, that is, um, or obviously a Chinese citizen, ethnic citizen of the United States. That's not who we're talking about here. We're talking about citizens of Chinese nationalists, and, and that is our Chinese corporations under the direct control of the CCP and the regime of the Chinese government. Mr. Chairman. Oh, Senator Mendez. Thank uh, you. Uh, thank you, Senator You're recognized, Senator Mendez. Thank you, Mr. I'm sorry. I, Mr. Holton, um, I think that we all – and I, and I want to ask your opinion on this. I believe that everyone in this room wants what's best for, for Texas and for the United States in terms of our security. But rather than 
make this an issue about where the person is coming from that's purchasing the land. What if, and I want you to let me know what your thoughts are. What if we, you know, in this country we have laws that say if you deposit more than $10,000, if you carry more than $10,000 to the airport, you know, they, they, they make a little investigation. Like, what's the purpose? Why? Where did it come from? There's some, regardless of who you are and where you're from. So what if we reframed the issue to discuss purchases of property either in geographic, sensitively geographic locations, in terms of maybe in terms of size, in terms of concentration? Maybe if we focused on the use and the location of the land rather than who's buying it, because I'm, I'm pretty sure there are more people than people just in China that want to compete or, or for worse, do something to our way of life in this country. So rather than just focus it in that, why not focus on the land that's sensitive or that the concentration of it would be something that could potentially harm our food, you know, process or supply? Because I'm with you, everybody here that we need to be protective of our country, our food supply, everything. But I'm not sure that the right way to go about this is to focus on the nationality of who the person is buying it. I think, I think we could be broader and smarter about how we approach it. What are your thoughts? Thank you, Senator, for your question. Um, I would not oppose the concept that you just brought up, but that concept does not exist as a model anywhere right now. Uh, and the thing is, this isn't talking about people as individuals as much as it is. These are foreign adversaries of the United States, and they're classified as such by the United States government for a reason. And it's because they are, have demonstrated hostility towards the United States and United States persons. That's why they're under sanctions already by the U.S. Department of Treasury. Yes. That's why the list has the nations that are on it. I totally agree with that. But here's the issue. Here's the difference. In this country, we're so hypocritical sometimes because we're ready to do this towards Asians or people from other countries. But our policy, especially with immigration towards people from Cuba, even though another communist country, but as soon as they touch land here, the person, we assume that that person that is fleeing Cuba is here to do, we just want to be part of our society. But we're not holding the same people. If, if they're leaving communist China... Are they just want to be part of our society? So that's where I think our foreign policy is not it's not it's not treated the same, not treating everybody the same. And so my thoughts are maybe we should take it out of the sphere of the person in terms of move the, the focus on what are they buying and then focus on that. That's all. That's what I've got. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator. Madam Vice Chair, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you know, I think it's fairly clear for uh, everyone up here, and I would think most people in the room, that there, there's a part of this issue that's very black and white. And I think it's, it's where it's not black and white. This is why we're here today, um, to distinguish between the good actors and the bad actors. Um, and and I'm, I'm just curious. I, I, I think mostly I, this is probably addressed to Mr. Holton and Mr. Yang. Um, Ms. Norman, if you have anything to chime in, I'd love to hear what you think too. But what are your, you know, what are your recommendations to this committee as we are sorting through? How do we decide um, who or what entity, whether it's an individual or an entity, um, is, is a threat to our national security or not? They're just, they're just here, you know, wanting to make a better life for themselves. My recommendation is for legislation that safeguards military installations so that would restrict ownership of land by foreign adversaries, not legal permanent residents of the United States. Nobody in the United States is here legally, but land in proximity to military installations owned by entities and individuals of foreign adversaries as defined by the Code of Federal Regulations. Okay. That's the model that we like best um, because it focuses on national security. And it's not me saying it. It's the United States Air Force saying it. 
and they have a vested interest in our national security, and they have a better definition of national security than anybody that I know of. Um, so, are the you distinction. Air, are you Air Force, sir? I was in the Marine Corps. Oh, okay. Well, then that that's high praise coming from someone in a different branch. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably gonna <laughs> probably gonna hear about that. <laughs> well, I know I've got a daughter and two sons-in-laws that are Air Force, and I, I'll hear from them about this too. So, please continue. Well. I, there has to be a standard, mm -hmm. and the standard has already been set because these countries have raised their hand in becoming hostile toward the United States. I went over the litany of, uh, frankly, crimes that the Chinese Communist Party has committed uh, and is the reason why they're on the list of uh, foreign adversaries. Iran and Russia, North Korea, these countries, I don't need to go into, you know, what they have done and wh why they're on these lists. I don't think. I mean, if you want me to, uh, y'all will be asleep in no time at all. Um, but all of these countries are countries that are of concern, already been identified, already been sanctioned by the U.S. Treasury Department. So it's not like you're making something up from whole cloth. This is a standard that already exists. And... Those countries are responsible for their inclusion on that list, not us. Thank you. If I might. Yes, Mr. Yang, thank you. I, I very much appreciate the question about where there are black and whites and where there are grays, because you are right. Some of this is what we are dealing with with respect to the grays. Here, though, the suggestion that all citizens and all corporations from these foreign, so-called foreign adversaries, as defined right uh, in the CFR, all of them would be considered foreign adversaries and automatically subject to suspicion from all of us is where I think we need to draw a line and be more careful and precise in our thinking. That is an overbroad statement. Rather, what I would recommend is that we do take a more individualized approach. And frankly, I think CFIUS does offer, with all its faults, one approach that sure, certainly can be refined, can be thought about in terms of how we think about individual investments individual land purchases, purchases, individual corporations, and perhaps even individuals with respect to what, how that transaction works. But that is the level of scrutiny, understanding those individuals, understanding the individual issues involved that, uh, that we are seeking, rather than a blanket statement that everyone in this country has a blanket statement cannot be trusted. Because the reality <laughs> of that backlash we have seen much too often. And that is one thing that I, I do expect that all of you understand. And, and what, thank you, and what sorts of factors do you believe should be considered um, with, with those entities or individuals? Uh, again, and this is where I want to be careful because I am, I, my organization is a civil rights organization, not one that deals necessarily in national security or even foreign relations or foreign investments, right? But understanding that, is certainly some of the factors that even the prior witness talked about I think can be considered, but need to be understood in context, right? If, if whether, sort of what the actual ties to the actual government are certainly should be considered, but recognizing the context. For example, if, if we're talking about members of the Communist Party of China, that does include about 100 million people, right? And sort of why you become a member can look very different in context, just as why I might become a member of the Boy Scouts of America. Right? So understanding that context is important. So that certainly is a factor. Certainly when we're talking about what the national security interests are, I think it is appropriate to talk about, are we talking about actual espionage? Are we talking about economic espionage? Are we talking about food security? Identifying those precise problems and understanding how your policy will address that precise problem is the level of scrutiny I'm asking for when we are considering legislation of this type. Well, thank you. Um, Mr. Norman, anything yeah, there? Real brief, and I think everybody's alluding to this, and both Senator Schwartner and Senator Menendez will sit on this, but I think, and this will come even more in play when we talk about the second half of this charge later, but I think any time you're talking about affecting private property rights, the ability for free enterprise and buyers and sellers in this country to to exchange property, we need to make sure that the laws are very narrowly tailored. And so, um, as the first witness said, I think that we make sure the scope is narrow, is important, and are trying to address the problems that exist, both as where the land is, 
who the people or companies that are buying it um, and what they're using it for um, and not make it so broad. We went through this discussion last session. The bill, the bills as originally filed were really broad and they got narrowed as they went through the process, the way the process works. But I think that's an important thing to remember as we, as we start this journey again um, for this next round of legislation. Well, thank you. I appreciate all of you um, going to the time and trouble to be here today. Um, and, you know, when we're, we're balancing here national security. I mean, that's very important. I think we all agree. Private property rights, incredibly important. I think we all agree. And I think this is an issue where we have to really make sure that we measure twice maybe measure 15 times, cut once, right? Because we want to make sure we get it right. And so I appreciate uh, you bringing your expertise and your time and energy to this today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator. Senator Perry, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, everybody pretty much knows where I've sat and where I'm sitting and where I may evolve to, but um, I'll just say it on the front end, be careful what we ask for. And I mean that it's not the CCP, CCP, which is arguably, undeniably, a bad government and, and a bad nation state. No, no, no dispute. Anybody in this room and anybody that's listening, and probably of the 100 million people, 99.99 of them would say the same if they had an option to be done. I, I don't know that, but um, it's a slippery slope when you open up the ability for government to tell you you can acquire, you can develop, but you can't transfer. So over time, it's China today, and it could be somebody else tomorrow or something else tomorrow that fits a political agenda. So that is that is one thing that we're going to have to be very strategic because climate change slash fossil fuels can be a reason to not transfer property if we're not careful as we open up the door to transfer the single most biggest asset anybody in this country will ever have their homesteads or property around the homesteads and things like that. So I don't have the solution today, but I do like part of our objective, if it's to pre pre uh, prevent insecurity in our food supply or prevent access to our sensitive, sensitive critical infrastructures, be it utilities, those things, those all make a lot of sense. And so Here's, here's the hypocrisy and the irony in this. It's a federal government issue. The same federal government that has let more military-aged Chinese people walk across our border the last two years in the history of the country. So, I mean, let's be honest. It's not really just this issue. It's all of these issues that are creating this angst that we're having this conversation about. Arguably, those folks coming across the border that are military-aged without kids and parents are probably not here for good reasons. So we haven't dealt with that issue either. So if we want to just pile it in on in Texas, let's just become sovereign and do it all because that's really what we're finding ourselves in the conversation with for lack of a federal government that will choose not to do. It's not that it could do. I do say that I do IP theft and cybersecurity are the ones that keep me up at night, not the guy that bought something next to me. But I do think there is an element of cautious and, and, and calculated and deliberate processes that we have to go through. So, Mr. Yang, you, you kind of danced around it a little bit. And, and I want to caution you because you've put yourself up here as an advocate. And, and, and I agree with everything you say from a, from a – humanity perspective, I think there is a certain element here that we got to be careful of or we repeat history. This is not a good history of the country. But at the same time, you can't say I'm here to advocate, but yet I'm not an expert in CCP stuff or I'm not going to tell you what I think about it. You, you owe it to the process to interject that there are things that we can do to alleviate the concerns we have. And if it requires citizenship to be able, individual citizenship, the, the corporations, maybe if they're required to be publicly traded in the disclosure of who owns them, now you've got a 51% plus that's not CCP. I don't know. I, I, I don't know where you go with that. I don't have that answer. But my, my, my conversation with you today 
this bill is probably going to get out of this session coming up. And, and you need to take that with everything I just said. This bill is going to leave this session. And I'm mixed because I see where it's going to go with the government I work for or I serve or I took an oath to. The 100 million people that are in CCP took the same oath as an allegiance to their country, no different than I swear allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. So the passion and the, and the dedication to my loyalty to my country is no different, and I think that gives us angst to Senator Swartner's point. But you better provide some very clear, very, very clear, concise, something that's objective, enforceable and measurable that limits the collateral damage that's potential or you will and we all will probably regret a very overreaching and broad bill which I don't think anybody wants I definitely have been a strong advocate of I ain't doing anything till I figure that or have felt like the private property aspect of this is dealt with so I'm just telling you you don't get to come here and say that's not me, that's not my deal, just don't do anything, but you should do something. You're going to have to provide some very, to Senator Paxton's conversation, you're going to have to be very clear on what might be something we can migrate on and walk away from this session going, we've addressed it, it may not be perfect, but the casualty, the unintended consequence has been minimized to the best of our abilities. That's all I'd tell you, because I don't think it's not going to leave this session. If I could, I appreciate that, and I think this is where we all need to work together because there are certain certainly areas where we just don't have the expertise, and then we would ask all of you to help us work together to develop that expertise, to try to work together to develop what that solution might look like. I will be very clear. I have not testified here saying that there is no law nor policy that this legislation should pass. I don't know, right? And, and that is an honest answer, that we are all struggling with this together. And that is what I'm asking all of you to do, is to weigh those. You, may not, weigh those you may not have the resource individually. You can put people in place or in front of us as a body, and it may be, need to be done privately for fear of security to those folks. But if they know things that we should do that will circumvent CCP or whoever it is of the day trying to, to, to do bad things, you owe it to this committee to give us that perspective because out of those conversations, we can be more strategic, more more calculated in how we go about addressing this concern. It frustrates me that our federal government chooses not to do what they need to do. And I can name 20 different other issues they choose not to do. And, and we could have a whole lot of conversation about why they choose not to. We're going to do something here, I'm almost certain. You put those folks that can tell us all the things that we need to know about, because we've just taken over NSA's role. We've just stepped into the shoes of all the people that we're going to try to protect. And if we don't have the full version of everything we can get our hands on, we cannot strategically put a bill out that, that won't have the consequences that you and I, and I think anybody on this committee, would want so just just get engaged and it's an interim but 25 is covering fast thank you senator perry senator middleton you're recognized go ahead, senator go, parker go ahead go ahead i saw you push your button i thought that oh. means you wanted to talk now just, senator parker the author of the really the first uh, texas then representative parker author of the bill on this topic it was rest for senator parker you're recognized oh well look mr middleton go ahead first um, well, just one thing to bring up. So last session with SB 147, um, the opposition, something didn't feel right about it. Um, for example, I got a phone call in my office where someone said they supported the bill, but they were afraid to testify for it because of what could happen to their family in China, right? Um, and so... For Mr. Yang, I, I have a question about a company called WeChat. Are you familiar with that? Um, so there is an Air Force report that says that the Communist Chinese Party uses WeChat to engage in information war warfare. Have you heard of? 
Yeah, and I don't know what this report is, but I, let me say this about WeChat. I use WeChat. Uh, it is a common platform that a number of people use. Are there security concerns? Are there privacy concerns with that, that platform? Yes, just as we have with a number of social media platforms with respect to privacy and data, data privacy. So I, I'm not sure if I can go any further than that, except to say that certainly, again, various platforms can be used for misinformation and disinformation. So in a eight, uh, August 20th article of last year, <clears throat> there was uh, someone from Johns Hopkins, actually, that discovered that the Communist Chinese Party was participated in organizing opposition to Senate Bill 147 in this chamber, in this committee, and in the Senate chamber through WeChat. And one of the accounts was 1.3 acres. Uh, it's a WeChat public account. Uh, and it's managed in China, that account. So if this is all innocent and we don't need to worry about anything, why would the opposition to this bill be managed in communist China? Well, I don't know anything about what the Communist Chinese Party is doing. All I know is what my organization and fellow Texan uh, Asian Americans are concerned about. And that doesn't come from the Communist Party of China. And they have concerns about their, pri their, their property rights. They have concerns about the backlash against our community here in the state. Well, but see, they specifically targeted members of the legislature. And actually, um, specifically Senator Kolkhorst, they, they also did Senator Hinojosa. Uh, they called it an anti-Kolkhorst group. Um, and then one of the participants in that posted something on Twitter that they threatened to kill him because of his support of Senate Bill 147, which lines up with the phone call that I got. So to me, that sort of proves our point. This is a national security issue, and it is truly disturbing that there are connections with the Communist Chinese Party in opposing this legislation. Again, I want to be very clear here. If you are in any way suggesting that some of these groups are in any way connected to the Communist Chinese Party, I am going to vis vis vociferously say that that is not the case. Now, whether they're the Communist Chinese Party, what they are doing, I don't know. But this suggestion that there is conflation between the two is precisely the concerns that we have and precisely the concern that is causing people to potentially question my loyalty to the United States. If that is where this questioning is going, then I, I will take offense to that. Well, we need to figure out what happened with WeChat and why they were organizing opposition to Senate Bill 147 and why their page was man managed in China. We, we need to know those answers. No. Senator Bill, thank you. Senator Parker. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, appreciate the conversation. Appreciate everyone being here today. I think it's been a, a very good discussion. Um, I come at it from a couple different perspectives. Uh, first, as uh, Chairman Hughes just mentioned, um, I was very fortunate to be the author of the Texas Lone Star Infrastructure Protection Act back in 21 as a House member working with Senator Campbell. Uh, and that was the first of its kind bill in the nation to protect critical infrastructure, communication systems, uh, water infrastructure uh, from ownership from foreign adversaries uh, or any of their uh, shell companies, any of those corporate entities and so forth. So. Uh, Mr. Holton, when you comment uh, about what's taking place, what's happening, um, I 100% acknowledge and recognize and agree with you uh, about the threat, uh, the threat from all these hostile powers uh, globally to the United States, and it is absolutely a, a top national security priority. I also agree with my good friend Senator Perry with regard to the fact that the federal government has failed us. Uh, so, again, what's new? <laughs> Uh, it, it, that's over and over again. And so, therefore, the states have to exert leadership to protect the country. When it comes to the topic of the U.S. border, U.S. southern border, uh, no state in the modern history of America has had to do what we're doing to protect 31 million lives in Texas and 335 million Americans. So we're, we're not um, uh, afraid to act to protect the state, to protect the nation. And, frankly, what we do here becomes the standard for the nation because the other 49 states will adopt what Texas does. When Texas passes a good policy, the other states will follow. 
Um, so what we did specifically with regard to the Lone Star Infrastructure Protection Act is that we blocked this concerning transaction on 140,000 acres in Val Verde County, along with any other similar type of situation. The challenge there was that we had concern that you had literally um, uh, folks directly tied to the Communist Chinese Party uh, that were listening and aware of communications directly at Laughlin Air Force Base. Supposedly, it was an environment which was uh, suitable for wind. Uh, but those of us that are Texans realize that's anything but the case. <laughs> and it's one of the reasons why Washington expressed concern several years, actually, a couple years before we took action here in Texas. But because of the broken processes in Washington, we're not able to fix or address the problem. The CFIA structure should have addressed it years ago. And so I guess my first line of question, I guess for a moment, uh, Mr. Holton, is with regard to CFIUS and why CFIUS is failing us. Because uh, I'll, I'll comment here in a moment about why I'm a believer in the CFIUS model, but I'd like your thoughts specifically on why CFIUS, CFIUS has failed us, particularly as of late, the last decade. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Parker, and thank you very much for the Texas Lone Star um, Protection Act. Every state needs to do something like that. Um, to be blunt, CFIUS has become politicized, and that's why it's become paralyzed. Uh, in North Dakota, with the Grand Forks Air Force Base issue that developed up there, they sought out CFIUS's advice on this, and on this on a very similar issue invo involving Grand Forks Air Force Base, where all of our drone technology is developed and trained. Um, and a Chinese entity wanted to buy land adjacent to the base and put in a corn mill. And uh, the government of the state of North Dakota asked CFIUS to weigh in. And CFIUS didn't even weigh in. They didn't give an opinion either way. I don't have an explanation as for why that failure occurred other than the only thing I can assume – is that they've become politicized. If it hadn't been for the commanding officer of Grand Forks Air Force Base, that transaction would have gone through. But he released a statement that said, this is a terrible idea. We don't want them as neighbors because it's a threat to our national security. Absolutely. Well, thank you. And, and, and look, again, that's the reason why we passed Lone Star originally here is to be able to stop those kind of transactions you just described in the Dakotas what we had to stop here and unravel with regard to Valverde County and those 140,000 acres. Those are the kind of strategic things that we as a nation have to protect, as a state we have to protect against. Uh, so I appreciate that very much. I, my view is this. I, I think we need a structure that finds the right balance. And, and that right balance is making certain that we recognize that as Americans, people that are here legally, that our diversity is our greatest strength from no matter where we've come on the planet Earth to get here. And I do believe that uh, for folks that are here legally, that are on a path to formal citizenship or whatever it may be, that those individuals uh, need to have the ability, uh, no matter what their ethnicity, uh, to have the ability to, uh, to live the American dream, uh, to have a small business, to have the ability to provide for their family, to be able to live on a piece of land, so on and so forth. And, and so I think my colleagues all are in agreement with regard to that here in the legislature. Uh, and, and so we, we want to strike that balance to where we don't have a situation where we have Asian hate. Let me be very clear. Asian hate in this country is absolutely unacceptable. When we talk about China, we're talking about the Communist Chinese Party, uh, not citizens uh, that are here in this country or people that are now in the process that have come here legally to the United States. And so that's the balancing act. And, and so in my mind, I worry about real estate transactions. Absolutely. All of us do. But I also worry about businesses that are being bought and sold. I also worry about intellectual property. I worry about all kinds of things that are being bought and sold. And, and therefore, I am a believer in the CFIA structure. And from my perspective here in Texas, um, you know, I was very blessed to carry legislation last session to look at creating our own Texas CFIAs. And yes, to Senator Perry, we are uh, duplicating, if you will, what's in D.C., but D.C. is broken and politicized, uh, as Mr. Holton has shared, and therefore we need to have the thoughtfulness to look at every transaction 
uh, that, that, that trips red flag, so to speak, of concern for us as a people here in, in Texas and the United States as a whole to look transaction by transaction on those things that are of strategic importance to the, to the, to the Texas uh, people and to the country as a whole. So with that being said, uh, Mr. Yang, I appreciate you being here and advocating on behalf uh, of Asian Americans. Um, and again, it's about getting that balance right. I think Senator Perry is exactly correct when he asked for support from the Asian community, the Chinese American community, with regard to specific things that we could be doing that would uh, give guidance to that which is a legitimate transaction by a good and lawful American citizen or someone who was here legally on a path to citizenship uh, versus nefarious actors and so forth. So whether or not you share that with us publicly or you share that with us privately, uh, legislation is going to happen. As Senator Perry said again, we, we have to absolutely protect our people and our nation. And because D.C. is broken, Texas must lead. And when Texas leads, the other, nation, other states in this nation will follow. Uh, and, and so it is an open opportunity for you to come forth and talk about what is legitimate and what is not legitimate. We know what I, I, I know what I believe to be legitimate and not legitimate. But we would welcome your feedback on that so that we strike the right balance in what we're doing. But I think that the CFIA structure, Mr. Chairman, uh, that has really served this nation well for many, many decades, but has now found itself to be politicized, overly politicized, to be broken and dysfunctional and being impacted by a woke, by a woke liberal ideology in this nation today. That's what's happening. Uh, I think that's the reason why CFIUS is not working today. So with that, um, you know, I think that's the direction where we need to go. But I want you to know, Mr. Yang, that we would welcome your feedback uh, again with regard to that. And feel free to comment on it now with regard to, you know, how are we supposed to distinguish that which is legitimate uh, from that which is not. And I also will say very clearly, just as Senator Middleton said, that we have zero tolerance, zero, from anyone with the, associated with the Communist Chinese Party trying to impact Texas policy or U.S. policy on any way, whether it comes with regard to our elections, with regard to cyber warfare, with regard to any issues, with regard to food supply or any national security issue, we have zero tolerance. But for good and lawful American citizens, we're open all day long and twice on Sunday to visit about these issues. So. I love your feedback on those items. Thank you for a lot of those sentiments. Number one, I completely agree that the Communist Party of China or any other foreign nation has no business in interfering with our elections and our po politics. Correct. And I, I, I would agree, and I would welcome further discussion on this, the notion of an individualized transaction by transaction approach, the notion of a CFIUS structure, and obviously we'll need to discuss sort of what that looks like, but those are the types of approaches that we think makes sense because it provides that sort of individualized inquiry, that nuanced inquiry that we're talking about. Thank you for the feedback. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Senator Parker. Senator Lamontia, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so in over 10 years ago, uh, a Chinese company that manufactures steel pipe came into uh, Port of Corpus Christi. They made one of the biggest investments in manufacturing um, in the, the United States in that area. Uh, they did that with a, through a joint venture with a domestic partner. They've been operating there for about 10 years. Texas has a lot of land and seaports. We're seeing a lot of investment. We also have large free trade zones. Port, uh, the Corpus Christi area is one of the largest free trade zones out there. And in order to operate in those free trade zones, not only do you need CFIS, but you also need you have oversight and approval from the free trade zone boards as well as U.S. Customs and Border Patrol. So I guess my question, Mr. Gang and uh, Mr. Holton as well, is how would you see that land and uh, land law in Texas interacts with those federal approaches for investment, not just under CFIS, I know we talked about that one, but also as it relates to those free trade zone areas and how would that impact growth that we're seeing in, you know, the southern area of Texas in that regard? I appreciate that question. That's a, that's a great example of another issue that we need to think through, right? 
is traditionally foreign investment in the United States, direct foreign investment, is seen as a net benefit to that state, but net benefit to the country. Again, I recognize that there may be situations where that investment should be viewed with a different level of skepticism. But it is a question of a baseline that we are talking about, right? What is the level of suspicion that we are offering? What is the, the, the welcoming nature that we want? If, our want? if we want our economy to grow, right, what is the signal that we are sending? Are we signaling barriers in the first instance? Or are we sig signaling incentives in, in, in the next instance? Thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, I have a different view. Not going to come as a big surprise. Uh, there has never been a time in our country's history where we have welcomed foreign adversaries to infiltrate and influence our system. Um, and that's just true today economically as well as with regard to national security as it ever was. And the standards that need to be held up for allowing uh, these types of transactions need to apply no matter where they occur within the United States. It would be easier if the federal government would do its job, but that's not happening. So in terms of Texas, Texas has to have some type of system to handle this situation. It's not a pleasant situation. Um, and furthermore, I would add that the biggest purveyor of Asian hate in the world is the Chinese Communist Party, who in their history has killed more Chinese than any entity in the world by far. No question. No question. Thank you, Senator. Parker, Senator Perry, you're recognized. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, just real quickly, a couple of things come to mind. The irony of our constitutional republic and the liberty and the freedoms that we enjoy as a country are the very things that will kill this nation when detached from good and moral people trying to do what's right. It's human nature. And so we have a responsibility and obligation to make sure the environment that that is allowed in is surrounded by as many good people and good processes. And I'll say, you know, foreign investment, you know, shame on our country. We're the Walmart generation. If it's two cents cheaper, we want to buy it. And if it's two cents cheaper because it came from a foreign entity, then that's okay with us. So now we're having this crisis of conscience about cheaper it, it's, it, it may end up killing us. And so we as a nation have a lot of problems because of the free market, quote, concept that cheaper is better, but, and it doesn't matter who's the beneficiary of it. So and with respect to foreign markets and foreign investment, that cow's done left the barn. We're going to have it. But I'll ask to, to Scott here, we control the specs of the steel and the building materials that go into our buildings and investment, correct? Correct. So as long as we're doing what we say we're doing and are responsible in that, then foreign investment shouldn't scare me, and it won't. Should we be dependent on foreign investment for critical infrastructure? No. But is our country willing to pay more because labor is $2 a day, and yet we're a humanitarian country, right? So our hypocrisy is finally catching up with us. Is that is that a fair statement? Yeah, I that's, think that's a fair statement. I think, but what you've seen post COVID is a huge onshoring or reshoring right. of manufacturing and, and it, coming back, whether it's in the United States or in I, Mexico. I and think Canada. it was a wake up call, and I think we heard it. The question is, is do we have the stamina to follow through? Right. And we'll be better for it if we do. And a lot of these issues we're concerned about. But Mr. Yang, I'm going to go back to what I said previously, and I want to be very, very clear. If, if I asked you today, and you're a smart, educated guy, I can tell, and you're, you're very much aware of the CCP and its culture and how it operates and things, I, I'm almost certain your background, you have perspective there. 
If I were to ask you today, what is a good determinant to start with on a single person and their intent for being here and what can we use as an objective, that's the clarity and the granularity I'm looking for. And if you don't provide it, shame on you and your association and the members in it will, 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 will be the ones that are punished for it. But we need to know how to sort the wheat and the chaff. That's what we're talking about very clearly. And you and people that have lived that culture and are now here for the, for the better way of life are the only ones that can point back and say, if you know this about certain something, then you can honestly say they're probably not here for the right reasons. And that's where I'm going and that's where we need to get to. But we need a fundamental shift in who we are as a country or we're going to reap the benefits or the worst of what we've allowed to happen. And it's not just this issue. It's all of the issues together. On this Texas CFIUS, is that correct? Uh, what I'm asking you, if we design one for Texas, and I'm for that, you and your input and your people of sort that have lived and dealt with that can be leads internally. I understand there's security risk. I do believe Senator Milton, when he said there was people being threatened that testified in committee last session, I don't think they make that up. So you can have those conversations at that granular detail, and it will manifest itself in legislation that will do what we seek to do. But as long as our building groups and communities and manufacturers and our engineers, our architects and the science are specking out things that we know to be what needs to be so that we're not building a building that falls in on us, and that was the whole goal from the Chinese perspective, whether it is or not. I'm not worried about it. But when Scott Normans of the world tell me the specs are open for worldwide, you know, and we're building Tahiti standards, then, then I got a problem with that. So we have things in place. We just need people doing the right thing every day in those systems. Thank you, Senator Perry. Um, I've got a couple of questions. I don't want to foreclose any other members, of course. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Alton, you, uh, and thank you each for your testimony. Mr. Alton, I've got a couple of questions. I was making notes during each witness's testimony, and uh, I don't want to mischaracterize anything, so make sure help me get this right. For one thing, I'm not sure that we, the whole list, so 15 CFR section 74, China, Cuba, Iran, North Korea, Russia, Venezuela, that's the that's the federal list, and that's been pretty static, right? That that that's been pretty, we, that's been those countries have been known and objectively identified as hostile nations for a while. You tell me, is that correct? Yes, sir. It has been fairly stable, uh, but I mean, there's no guarantee that a, com oh. a country could come oh. off the list. You bet. Or, or go on the list. We'd love to see that list get a lot shorter. Hopefully it won't get yeah. longer, but yeah. but that's the current list, and there is a basis for, as you said, those countries have made decisions to put themselves on that list. I think that's maybe how you put it. Is that right? Yes, sir, that's correct. Thank you. Uh, we didn't go make that list. This is based on objective criteria. Is, is that right? Yes, sir. I, in my opinion, it is. Thank you. Now, as far as what a policy might look like on ownership of Texas land, you mentioned a couple of things, I'll, and I don't, I'll help me if I got this right. Uh, land near critical infrastructure is a concern, I think you said. Also, agricultural land, I think you said that. And I'm not cross-examining you. I want to make sure I got your testimony right. So far, so good. That's yes, a, a big concern. Yes, sir. Go ahead. And, and correct me if you need to or clarify if you need to as well. Uh, if, if you don't mind, uh, Mr. Chairman, please. I believe when Senator Paxton asked me uh, my recommendation – my specific recommendation was with regard to proximity to military installations Thank you. and okay. legal permanent residents. I should have also added, if I might, that there should be the safeguards that I mentioned in my prepared testimony uh, about not leaning on realtors and land title attorneys yes. and all those folks who have a vested interest in free enterprise. You bet. You bet. Um, and not having them be the enforcement arm of the government and not and not needlessly complicating their lives You're right. okay. and, and 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 not um inhibiting transactions that don't fall in this category 
Oh, thank you for that. And the reason I was asking you, and you, is we will rely on your written testimony, and, and we may get clarification from you. I ask because the the concepts you're setting out are not near as sweeping as what some have advocated. And that's and again, we can have a discussion. You're, you you we want to get it right, and I appreciate what you're sharing. And so uh, that helps us a lot. And I want and we're going to look at your written testimony as well. But it's it's very helpful. And thank you for walking through it with us and making some recommendations. Uh, Mr. Norman, I want to ask you, uh, I think I know from your testimony, we're talking in concepts, and there'll be details to work out as y'all were so involved in working on that uh, one, Senate Bill 147 last session. So, But even if single-family dwellings are off the table, and I'm not saying they are, I'm just one vote in this process. I don't know what my vote is, but if single-family dwellings are off the table, it sounds like y'all still have some concerns. Well, we want to I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you help me out. We want to make sure the process works, even if it was to the, the land that was narrowly tailored, like Mr. Holton said. Um, you want to, you know, that's going to affect title. It's going to affect sellers of that property. It's going to certainly affect buyers. It's going to affect future potential buyers of that land. So we want to make sure that the real estate process works. And I think we can come up with that. There's a lot of people a whole lot smarter than me that are in our you know, entire real estate world of lending, building, selling, buying, financing, and everything else. And so we can come up with a system that works, I think. That. Well, that makes sense. And that's a great point. I recognize your role representing our home builders. But today there's also a broader coalition. That's, that's correct. Oak Smith and Holton was just talking about. Those that's folks right. Involved in the transaction, all those different people working hard to improve everybody's lives. And that's Our lives are want. difficult enough. We don't need added layers of difficulty put on top, if, to the extent we can. Makes sense. Thank you so much. And, and, and Mr. Yang, thank you for being here. Uh, you have an important role to play here, and, and uh, this is an adversarial system, and everybody has, has a voice, and we want to get to the right place. I want to clarify a couple of things along those lines. So, uh, and again, you don't represent the Chinese Communist Party, obviously. Uh, you, you've had some, you've, you, you have uh, friends who've dealt with them, maybe been, maybe suffered under them. Let me tell you this Texas has done a lot of work in the area of research security. Uh, Senator Parker mentioned intellectual property. Senator Middleton did. Uh, as you know, it's important that in research it's open and we have collaboration and America is working very hard while we, we as Americans, I'm talking to you, we're all Americans here, we're working very hard to protect that research while we still have an open and collaborative process. And Texas was one of the first states uh, which passed a bill about research security in the higher education setting. We have many foreign students, many foreign professors. That's good. That's important. We want to make sure that we're being wise about that. And so uh, we passed Senate Bill 1565 uh, out of the Senate last session, one of the first bills in the country on that topic, protecting our research, our intellectual property. And uh, I heard a lot. I learned a lot. We've met with the FBI. We've talked to professors and students. And I've learned firsthand about situations in higher education where we have a, a Chinese student who has family in mainland China, and the Chinese student is pressured to acquire intellectual property and take it back, and they're threatened with the safety of their family back home. If you heard of anything like that happening, have you ever heard heard that before? Because I've, I've heard that firsthand. And I just, again, this you didn't do that, but I wonder if you've heard that because we, we hear a lot of things like this, and Senator Middleton had a similar experience, and it is something we need to talk about. Uh, thank you for that question. Certainly there are cases like that, and then it's a question of how do we protect those students. And again, many of those students, those professors are coming to the United States to help our economy, to help our research. I completely so how, agree. Right. So how I do we agree. protect them from the, what we call transnational repression? Right. So that is absolutely an interesting topic that we should talk about as well. And I appreciate that, number one, that you recognize that I'm an American. Uh, and number two, that, that our community is tremendously diverse. Right. So I am speaking from one segment of our population. And we also should recognize that these laws that we've been talking about involve many adverse, so-called adversarial nations. So I cannot speak for all of those communities, whether they're Russian, Cuban, Venezuelan, et cetera. So again, it's a question of making sure you all get the input. And we certainly will do our part to get give you the input from all of these communities about the impact that is being felt. And I, I thank you for that. And I recognize you, you stated you're not a foreign policy expert. I'm obviously not. Uh, 
thank you all for not laughing when I said that. Uh, we, uh, as an American, I've got to ask you that you don't have to sp- you don't have to speak for your organization. But now let's talk about those governments. Can we agree that the governments of those six nations on the list are hostile to? the United States and her people, to us. We can agree on that, I'm sure. As I said at the opening of my testimony, these governments are autocratic regimes that abuse human rights and that are anti-democratic. Absolutely. And, they're, and specifically, they have, they have bad designs on the United States, on record, wouldn't you say? Certainly those governments. Those governments. Like those leaders. Yes. Right. I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Yes. The, the, we're talking about the governments. That's right. Right. That's correct. And then speaking about the companies, you have experience working – uh, with an American company in China, I think you a company we've heard of, uh, and you and Senator Schwartner discussed whether a Chinese company is under the control. I, I don't want to misquote you, but the topic was whether a Chinese company is under the control of the Chinese Communist Party or whether every Chinese company is. And I think you said that in your experience, uh, based on your experience in business in China, every country every company in China may not necessarily be under the control of the Chinese company. Did I get that close? That's correct. I mean, companies ask for uh, – you know, companies operate for very complex reasons, as we all know. Most of it is based on their own private interests, right? right? So that that is correct. I want to be very clear that in, in understanding what that system is and what the so-called control is. Now, that's helpful. I want to ask you this question. Knowing that system, having done business there that many of us haven't, would you agree – that every Chinese company may not be under the direct control of the Chinese Communist Party. But would you agree that every company doing business in China knows that the power of the Chinese Communist Party is there and that is a looming threat over every business, every company doing business in China? I would agree that they understand that they operate under the laws of China and then they make a, their own risk assessment of what that means for how they want to operate their companies, especially how they operate their companies abroad. Would you say that a company operating in China, knowing it's under the laws of China and performing its own risk assessment, would you say a company operating in China is under the same risk of influence by the government as a company operating in the United States? Now, come on. Let's be fair. It's not the same, is it? It, it would not be the same, but then. I want to be very careful in making sure we all understand that that doesn't translate into saying that the, that company always operates in a manner that is consistent with the Communist Party of China. But that company knows that if it gets too far afield, it is subject to being under the boot of the Communist Chinese Party. I, I, again, I want to be very careful. I mean, again, in my experience, I want to be a little bit more personal here. That was never really a concern. I, I will be honest about that. It was more about commercial interests. I, I will be very honest and sincere about that. So your company was not concerned about engaging in speech that might be offensive to the Chinese Communist Party? And now I cannot speak for ITW. I'm no longer employed by them. And so, again, we, we are getting into an area that becomes a little bit more subjective. You know, again, we all consider these issues. Just as I am considering sort of how I want – how it's best to answer this question, recognizing that I am under oath, right, and making, making clear what sort of – what those ramifications are. Do you think the threat of giving a wrong answer here is the same as the threat of giving a wrong answer in front of the Chinese Communist Party? <laughs> And again, when we say the Chinese Communist Party, and this is why I, I want to be very careful about this, is that that is suggesting that that is one entity, right? Just as testifying before all of you is a different experience than testifying before the U.S. Congress, just as it is different before testifying before the city council. And so when we're operating, whether it's in China or wherever, you know, that has a different feel depending on what the issue is that you're talking about what the government entity that you're talking about. And it's not – it really – I want to be care, careful to say that there's no one answer to that. Mr. Chan, thank you for your testimony. And we recognize that uh, you're representing a constituency and, and Americans of all uh, walks of life and all backgrounds are Americans. We're a melting pot. We're a nation of immigrants. It's always going to be that way. I will confess I'm troubled by your refusal to acknowledge 
the threats placed on Chinese businesses and Chinese citizens by the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, that, I'm just telling you that's how I feel, but we're listening to you. We're going to try to work together on this. But that's an important distinction I've given you a number of opportunities to acknowledge. To be clear, not, Ch not Americans or not Chinese citizens here, but the Chinese Communist Party, the threat that they impose on Chinese businesses and people. You can respond if you'd like to. I'm just telling you how I feel. I, I, to be honest, I'm not sure if that's really what I said. Is yes, with respect to what is what the Chinese companies face, it is different. I have said it's not the same as what U.S. companies face. But where I am be trying to be very careful is being asked to quantify what that actually is, right? Certainly, Chinese companies offer under uh, Chinese companies um, operate under less freedom than in the United States. No question about that, and there there's clear agreement. Thank you for that. Members, any other questions for the witnesses? Senator Parker. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, again, it's been a really good conversation, so I'm grateful for everyone being here. Uh, I want to switch gears just for a quick moment and, and come back to Mr. Holton. Um, Mr. Holton, back on just a CFIUS question, again, based on your national security background. I'd like to get your perspective for the committee uh, and those viewing today. But my question, I guess, is this. CFIUS was really loosely started uh, back when President Truman uh, was in office. It was formalized in about 1975, and it really functioned very well, I think, in a non-political environment till roughly the last decade, maybe 15 years ago. Um, I I'd like to get from your national security expertise perspective whether or not you agree with that, that it functioned well uh, in previous decades, uh, and whether or not there was opportunities for improvement of the structure at that time before we lived in the, the current uh, politically correct woke left environment that's driving the narrative that I think is impacting um, our national security with regard to how CFIUS has been acting. So I'd love your thoughts on whether or not historically it was successful for America. Thank you very much for the question, uh, Senator Parker. I think it depends on who you ask. I work with a lot of cold warriors. I'm 61 years old, but I work with some folks that were in the Reagan administration and were coal warriors, and they were critics of CFIUS back then. I thought that CFIUS was not tough enough on the Soviet Union in particular uh, back during the Cold War. Uh, the end of the Cold War resulted in a multipolar world uh, that changed the orientation of CFIUS, and like a lot of national security organizations, including the entire Department of Defense, they had to almost reorganize themselves and reorient themselves based on that changing world. Uh, and so CFIUS at one time was mainly focused on just the Soviet Union. Yes. Soviet Union dissolved. And so in the post-Cold War world, it has to focus on many different threats. And those threats run the spectrum from high intensity to low intensity uh, and, uh, it, you know, varied in, in many ways. Um, the threat from China is different from the threat from Iran, but both countries pose threats to the United States, for instance. Um, and they're both on the list of foreign adversaries for good reason. Yes. Um, and so... Uh, I don't think that CFIUS was ever completely divorced from politics, but there was a time in this country when national security was a bipartisan issue. I don't see much evidence of that now. Oh, sadly, I think that's exactly right. And I, I think in many ways we went to sleep at the end of the Cold War. Uh, we thought that there were no threats left in the world per se, and, and I think that's where we failed to further define how CFIUS needs to operate, right? And so it needs that direction in 2024 at the federal level. I don't think we'll get there, but I think Texas can provide that structure. Yes, sir. I think you have an opportunity in Texas to uh, create something uh, not based on the CFIUS model. Yeah, no, that's right. Uh, well, a, a kind of a, a, a CFIUS 2.0, so to speak, right? And then, I, and then I think, you know, as you rightfully commented on these bad actors in the world, I mean, that's why we passed the Lone Star Infrastructure Protection Act, right, is to address many of these other critical infrastructure investment concerns and challenges. So I think as a state, we're well along the way. We just got to continue to provide some refinement to these other types of transactions that are concerning to the threat, the security of the nation. Thank you for your feedback and for being here. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, Senator Parker. Senator Perry, you're recognized. Real quick, just for my own edification, but I hope some of the members don't have the answer to this either. Is the CFIUS Act preventive, proactive, or is it prospective looking back? It's just a reporting mechanism. My basic understanding is it's just a report. That they don't have authority. That, that's right. They make recommendations. So, so it's just after the fact. Yes, sir. So if that's we're going to do a Texas version, we would have a little more preventive slash proactive up front. Well, that's up to you all. But, but I mean, that's that was something I thought I understood. It was reporting only that the transaction had happened and not a whole lot of teeth in it. Uh, CFIUS is, uh, has the opportunity to weigh in on transactions. Um, uh, but they don't have the power of law. Okay, thanks. But but just for clarification, Senator Parker, go ahead. CFIUS at the federal level is supposed to be proactive in a necess in necessary situation. It's not just a reactionary reporting tool. And certainly what we're envisioning here would give us the ability to have teeth and be proactive. Thank you. And that was just basic understanding. Yeah, no, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. if I might make a comment on that. Mr. Olson? Uh, what both of you gentlemen just said was correct, but in the case of Grand Forks Air Force Base, the state of North Dakota had to ask CFIUS to weigh in, and then CFIUS said, uh, no, we don't want to, you know, so I don't think that's what you want from the Texas version. Thank you. Mr. Yeah. Ann, did you have did you have something on that? Sir, Sorry, Mr. Chairman, please. I was just going to say the distinction, I guess, is notified versus non-notified transactions, right? I guess it's the, the distinction historically that's been in the books. Members, any other questions? Thank you each for being here. Glad you came. Thanks for your testimony. You were excused, except for Mr. Norman. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so the, uh, that's right. the second uh, portion of this, uh, our charge about land, uh, and uh, has to do with, of course, uh, one that came up last session toward the end of session. Mr. Clausen, come on. Thanks for waiting. I didn't want to deny you a seat, but I didn't want to make you sit there during all that testimony unless you wanted to on that topic. So thank you for coming. Thank you. And so uh, it's been a larger issue uh, in recent years uh, that is about the large-scale purchase of single-family homes by large entities. Uh, and so that's uh, our charge to look at. There was some legislation about this last session. Again, the issue arose later in the session. There's been some more time now to look at it. And so... Uh, we have two witnesses to talk about this. Thank you again about the large-scale purchase of, thank you, single-family homes. And we have Christopher Holton, and uh, the chair calls Christopher Holton, and the chair uh, recalls, I guess you're still there, Scott Norman. Welcome back. Mr. Holton, thank you for waiting. Introduce yourself. Did I call you? I keep calling you Holton, and you're Mr. Clauston. I thank you. And the council was trying to help me. You're sitting where Mr. Holton was, Mr. Clauston. I've known you longer. I've known him. Thank you for waiting. Thank you for being here, Thank Mr. Clausen, Gerald Clausen. Welcome. Right. You are recognized. Introduce yourself and Thank you, give us your testimony. Good. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, Chairman Hughes and members of the committee. My name is Gerald Clausen. I'm the research data scientist at the Texas Real Estate Research Center at Texas A&M University. I'm here today to provide follow-up testimony about the impact of institutional investors on the Texas single-family housing market. When I last appeared before the committee, there were many reports circulating about institutional investors buying significant numbers of single-family homes for rentals. These reports generated legitimate concerns about the impact of large investors on the single-family housing market. The common study methodology cited in these reports was based on searches for corporate-sounding names, including characters like Inc., LTD, LLC, and Corp. Searches like these lump together corporate entities of many types and sizes into a single category called institutional. They conjured up images of names like Blackstone and Cerberus taking over the single-family housing market. I also conducted an in-depth study of investor activity using the center's extensive housing data. I went one step further to analyze full legal entity names on the tax rolls to connect related legal entities and categorize them by investor types. I focused on the Dallas and Tarrant counties uh, because of the um, in property year, 
uh, property tax year 2021 because of the large volume of investor activity in these counties. Uh, and going through the tax rules at the county level is a very intensive uh, piece of work. And so I, I decided to look at just at the two largest. What I discovered paints a very different picture. In 2021, 66% of single family rentals were owned by private investors in their personal names. They are what we commonly call mom and pop investors. 17% were owned by small corporate non real estate investment trust entities. Many of these small entities are what I call the weekend wealth builders who attended an investor seminar where they created an LLC to purchase one or more rental homes to build their wealth. And that, that, was, uh, that was a 17% of what I found. Many attained three or five year adjustable rate mortgages at a rate lower than the prevailing 30 year mortgage rate. This gave them a cost of capital advantage over regular households. 11% of the single family rentals were owned by large corporate non-REIT entities. One of the largest of these is a single family rental developer in Houston called Camillo Properties. They have developed a large portfolio of affordable rental homes under their Simply Home brand. The final category of single family investors was large corporate real estate investment trusts. These are the big names like American Homes for Rent, Invitation Homes, and Tricon Residential. Blackstone's REIT single-family REIT platform is called Home Partners of America. In total, these large REITs owned a small 6% of the single-family rental market. What happened in the housing market from March 2020 to the spring of 2022 was an anomaly driven by significant Federal Reserve intervention in the mortgage market and an unprecedented surge in fiscal stimulus. No one anticipated the impact uh, it would have on the housing market. I provided data and analysis of how the Fed impacted the mortgage market in my submitted presentation. Fed policies ultimately led to growth of lending products for single family investors to inquire properties. Leaders in Texas were correct to be very concerned about the impact of, in, of investors on the housing market. With better analysis, we now understand that small investors own the large majority of single family rental properties in Texas. Even though large corporate investors made significant percentage of purchases for a short period of time, their overall ownership remained small. The rise of large single-family REITs with highly professional service and extra amenities for tenants may actually be a positive development for a new class of tenants, and that's baby boomers. A recent Bank of America survey found that 80% of baby boomers believe it's better to rent than buy a home in the current environment. 87% prefer to avoid the financial responsibilities and stresses of home ownership and 83% value the sense of freedom to move when and where they want that comes with renting instead of owning. Single family REITs may be best positioned to provide this, to serve this kind of market. In conclusion, it may be prudent to continue monitoring the single family <coughs> rental market for the unwinding of single family investor portfolios. The investor acquisitions worked, that worked with low adjustable rate mortgages from 2020 to 2022 may no longer work in the current high rate environment as mortgages reset. Higher interest expense, higher insurance premiums, and slower home price appreciation may force some investors to sell. The great financial crisis of 2008 taught us the impact of adjustable rate mortgages resetting in a higher rate environment. The impact this time will be smaller, but it may actually increase the supply of homes available for households. Thank you for the opportunity to make these comments before the committee. Thank you for your research and your testimony. We're going to have questions after we hear from Mr. Norman as well. 
Thank you very much. Mr. Norman, welcome back. Introduce yourself. Give us your testimony. Thank you. I didn't go far. Scott Norman, CEO of Texas Association of Builders. I appreciate the opportunity to address this very important topic as well. It's interesting we're going to have this conversation on the heels of the, the discussion we just had on um, foreign governments purchasing land. Um, I think if obviously certainly there was compelling state interest on that topic. On this one, I think the the wise words of Senator Perry need to be cautioned. We need to be very careful when we start going down. And there has been a lot of there's been some press attention to this and some political conversations about is this one of the reasons why uh, people are unable to find homes to purchase and those sorts of things. And whether it is impacting it very much or not, and I think the research from the Real Estate Center shows that maybe it's not to the extent that's maybe been portrayed in the media and other places. Is there a compelling state interest, though, to somehow restrict that? And as an industry, Texas Association of Builders, speaking for our association, we strongly are opposed of any efforts to limit the free market um, here. Now, um, there's three things driving housing affordability right now in this country. Um, it's inflation, it's inventory, and it's interest rates. Um, all of those are very problematic. Obviously, inflation um, has something that you've seen a, a – curve on housing costs that has been just rising exponentially um, and it really started she was going up before the pandemic during and post pandemic it continues to go up whether that be um, land costs whether that be materials costs cost of labor I think this legislature is to be commended for a lot uh, that y'all have done to try to address our labor situation and getting more people into career technical education um, and the the slowdown that we're seeing in the housing market has um, it's helped a little bit on the labor side, but on the materials side, prices are still up and continuing to rise. Inventory, um, lot inventory across the country, but especially in Texas, um, in, in certainly in our major markets, but also in, in many of our medium and small cities as well. The availability of land to build houses is limited um, through a number of reasons. Um, and so you've seen the price of that land go up. As land goes up and land costs goes up, the way the, the economies and the, the economics of the, the the housing market is, the cost of those houses is going to go up as well. And then interest rates. Obviously, uh, it, it seems like a long time ago now, but it was only two or three years ago. Uh, people were getting uh, mortgages in three, three and a half uh, percent interest rate uh, realm, and now we're looking at six and a half, seven, seven and a half percent. Um, that is costing the average family or the average home buyer one, two thousand dollars more a month if not more, in mortgage interest payments. Um, an NHB study that was released, the National Association of Home Builders last month, or I'm sorry, last week, said that almost half, 49% of U.S. households can't afford a $250,000 home or $250,000 mortgage. That's half. Um, and, and they must spend 38% of their income on that mortgage. If you're a low income, and they define low income as – as someone who is below 50% medium family income, it takes 77% of your income to afford that $250,000 home. That's pricing it out. Uh, the nationwide median uh, new home price is $495,000. Texas, we're a little better off. It's $350,000 median home price um, in Texas. But nationally, we're short about 1.5 million homes a year. Um, and if in, in Texas, you know, we're, we're over a tenth of the market. We're the number one housing economy, continue to be every year since the, the downturn, um, the Great Recession. We've led the nation in housing starts. We have three or four of the top markets in the country, um, and that's because people are moving here. It's because what you all have done to create jobs, um, to create an, a real estate uh, system that works is very important. Um, Senator Hughes mentioned you had the bill last session that, that was commissioning the Real Estate Center to do a study um, on this topic. We strongly supported that. Um, unfortunately, it got caught up in the some of the veto mayhem at the end of session, um, but I, it's good to see the Real Estate Center continue to work on that. There is a strong demand for single-family housing, and our industry and our association's approach is it should be in all of the above. Certainly, we want people to buy and have the dream of home ownership, but buying is not an option for everybody. And um, you know, even those that that may have the means. He, he mentioned um, the the baby boomers that are retiring; they want to lock and leave. A lot of people 
want the option to rent and and the lesser uh, the lesser homeowner maintenance and and that comes with that. You've also got a large population that are starting to form families as as Gen Zs and others are forming households. Um, they use the uh, you know they want a they want a dog and a yard and all of that, um, but they may not because of those three eyes I was talking about cannot afford to buy. So rent is an option, and they should have that option. And so to meet that demand, um, our industry is working very hard to put more houses on the ground. Um, there's two kinds of single-family rental things really going on that you all need to be aware of. One is what's gotten a lot of the press, and that's large. It's not necessarily our members at all that are doing this, but that's large, whether they be REITs or other investment firms that are going around and buying individual houses in neighborhoods, existing homes. Um, the other... Um, phenomenon that is occurring is is companies building neighborhoods or a portion of a neighborhood that is a single family for rent neighborhood let's say there's a thousand lot subdivision coming in well there may be an investor that wants 200 of those houses to be just rental and that that portion of the neighborhood is a single family rent community and that's something that our members are very involved in in building those types of housing we look at that as really it is a multi-family uh traditional apartment, if you will, spread out into a single family product that the market is demanding. And so we're very concerned um, in any attempts legislatively to try to restrict our ability to provide that product. Um, so our members, Texas Builders, we obviously build homes, we sell homes, but also remember we buy a lot of homes, whether they are homes that, and all of our members, I forgot to say earlier, almost all of our members to a man or a woman are some type of corporation, um, even if they're just a sub-S corporation. Um, some of our smallest remodeler members may not be incorporated, but most of them are for liability purposes. Um, but they buy homes. Um, they buy homes to remodel. They buy homes maybe to tear down and replace. And that occurs from some of our larger companies on a very large scale. And so when you get into the who are these corporations buying homes, there's all types of that that occurred. So, um, and lastly, my only comment, I'll be happy to take any questions, is remember if, if we do anything that are affecting who can buy these homes, you're also affecting the sellers. And if you're limiting um, the number of potential buyers out there, the amount that sellers can receive is going to be reduced. And so your constituents are going to be impacted um, when we start playing in the market. We've seen some of this happen in other states um, on the east and west coast. And I don't think I have to tell you all that those real estate markets are not as robust as thriving as we have here in Texas. And so we strongly feel um, that, yes, we need to continue to study this issue, but, but trying to do anything beyond that is very concerning to us. Thank you, Mr. Norman. Uh, Senators, any, any questions for the witnesses? I've got some, but I'm going to wait for the members. Have... Yes, sir. Senator Parker, go ahead. You're recognized. You're first, man. You, sir? I'm first, I think. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, appreciate the, the thoughtful testimony and commentary from both of you. Uh, I think, Mr. Klassen, the first question I have, just pertaining to the research that you're doing, and appreciate you doing it without passing uh, the good bill that uh, Chairman Hughes had. Um, as I look at what you just shared, not looked at the presentation, uh, but you really have 17% of the market that you're concerned with potentially. And con by concern, wants a further review, meaning larger corporations uh, that are holding uh, significant numbers of homes uh, that are non-REIT, and then you have those that are REIT-specific for about 6%. So in aggregate, you get to about 17% of the pie that is your concern that uh, probably warrants, and I'm going to say maybe it's a concern, that it warrants additional monitoring uh, and review. Is that is that a fair assessment? I, I wouldn't say monitoring for ownership uh, uh, or, you know, increasing or decreasing size of ownership. What is the, the my concern is particularly amongst the, you know, the mid to small uh, investors is their reliance on variable rate mortgages. I see. And so with the Fed policy that uh, lowered the Fed funds to a zero policy, the zero policy bound. It made the initial uh, introductory mortgage rate on three- and five-year adjustable rate mortgages very low, which I believe made it possible for a lot of investors who maybe shouldn't have been, been or at least it worked in that environment. Yeah. And, and, of course, we were expecting long-term holds at those low rates. And so my concern is that now that Fed funds is 500 basis points higher, those deals that worked for investors back then 
might not work right now when these mortgages are resetting. And that, so that was my That's your focus. Concern. That yeah, helps me a lot because I didn't understand. Yeah. That's your focus is stability, so to speak, of the housing infrastructure of the system yeah. as it pertains to right. Fed policy and, and obviously the rates going up dramatically the last couple of years. One thing I've noticed, uh, and it started happening last fall, was the a growth in new listings in the state of Texas in a few areas. This spring, it start, it, it, we're running a, full, a bull market in new listings across the state coming into uh, houses coming for sale. And I've been trying to piece together what's going on. We, we hit, uh, in April, we hit 4.01 months inventory of homes available in Texas. That's single family, townhouses, and condo. We haven't seen a forehandle on months inventory since August of 2014. Huh. Huh. So I know the mainstream story is shortage of supply, and that may be true in some local areas. But on the whole, the mass, you know, the, the huge increase of new listings in on the MLS. I'm trying to figure out why people with two and three quarter percent mortgages would be rushing to list their home. That doesn't, that doesn't quite make sense to me. And so what I would like to look at going forward in, in the data is how many of these homes are actually investor homes coming onto the market before their mortgages start resetting this summer? Yeah. Oh, good. And so that's a – so when I, I mention it might be worth monitoring, that's what I'm talking no. about. Well, th no, thank you for your additional commentary because it gives me perspective broadly on what you're doing. Yes, I mean, you're, you're looking at all these various factors affecting housing in Texas. Correct. Not particularly just this discussion that we're having today that was an interim charge, but more broadly you're looking at the health of the system. So right. that, that, that's very helpful. And then with regard to definition, when you classified the 11 percent of the pie uh, as large – um, entities that are non-REIT. Uh, do you have a certain capitalization that you tie to that definition or a number of units? I did number of units. So in my classification, I looked at, um, and it's in the presentation, zero to nine, I called the small entities. Okay. 10 to 499, I called midsize. And 500 and above, I called large. Okay. And that was after having looked at kind of who the owners were and what the legal entities were, it came up with that that level or th those three levels. I know others use lower levels for, for middle, but that's okay. what I use. But it's all based on units as opposed to capitalization. Correct. So whether or not Correct. it's a $150,000 home or a million-dollar home, you're looking at units. Correct. Okay. And then in the 6% uh, category of REITs, um, a formal structured REIT, uh, that also fits the same definition you just described. Correct. Those are way over, <laughs> yeah. way over 500. Yeah. And so there's, there's a, a you know, small handful, and I put a list in the presentation Perfect. for you to see and to see the entity names. The challenge, and this was something I wanted to express last year, um, but when I went through the exercise and really did that analysis of legal entities, um, uh, Scott knows there are people for many entities, many different legal entities with very cryptic names. And so the biggest challenge, and, and for your weekend wealth builders, it's a special name that needs something to them and nobody else. And so it was an incredible challenge to try and relate these legal entities. Yeah. One observation I'll make is that the greatest website that helped me was a website out of Florida hmm. where many of the REITs are registered. So I could track down kind of the top level entity and then see, and then on that website, find all these related funds that were connected hmm. to the top. If, if there would be one suggestion or recommendation, one idea that comes to mind is how can we relate how can we build a system into, you know, in Texas that would help d draw those relationships? Not for the purpose of restricting purchases. Um, I completely agree with Scott that, you know, impacting buyers impacts sellers. But um, it's just one way to have additional information about what is going on in the market. Yeah. Uh, 
And so, yeah. Well, thank you for the, the great analysis and overview, and I appreciate the depth of what you're studying just to make certain that the market is healthy and working with all the stakeholders to keep uh, Texas the place to own a home. Uh, and, Scott, I appreciate your testimony as always. Uh, I concur fully that, you know, it's all about we need to focus on the economics of building a home, getting those costs down as best we can. That's ultimately the best interest of the market, all of our citizens, buyers, sellers, you name it. Uh, but I think you're in agreement that the, the kind of research, this kind of ongoing analysis is always a healthy thing for us to have as a tool. Absolutely. Terrific. Absolutely. Thank you both. Very Knowledge much. is always a good thing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Parker. Senator Perry, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to say thank you for coming back. I know I remember bits of that last hearing. We kept throwing things at you, and you said we don't have that. that you, you did your homework, and uh, that doesn't happen as often as it should, but you took us seriously. A uh, couple things. Market is not agnostic to reality, so we need to acknowledge that there is a generation that home ownership's not as valuable as it was at 62-year-old that I am. And, and, and I think that's sad in, in some ways, but they're going to adjust into the amenities issues and things. I see it in Lubbock, Texas, even. It's it's kind of interesting phenomenon. Secondly, I can answer your question why new listings are going up. Uh, it's called downsizing. Mm -hmm. I have suspended equity in my house, and I no longer want that space, nor do I want to mow the yard, and I can buy a new home for half the price, but a quarter of the size with 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 the value. So I think you'll see a lot of people are just at that pr they know their house value is not going to go up anymore. They're going to get while well, the getting's good and they're going to go down and they're going to go down to the next development that's half the, half the, half the size, probably not far off the same price, but they're but they're moving in something new cuz it's maintenance free, it's new stuff. So that's one thing. And then secondly, or thirdly, a final comment I guess there's 53,604 homes owned by institutional investors, according to your data. But the, the corporates. Corporates or single-family investors. I'm, I'm going to name a number if I'm oh. totally wrong. Nine million households in Texas? Oh, no, no, no. This, what this is just that, – that total number is just for the top 30 on this top list. Top 30. Oh, yeah. There, there's many, many more owned by the small, the small entities that are not on this list. I, okay. If I gave you a list of – uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of small mom and pop investors. That would take a lot of paper. So I just tried to to you, give you, you a flavor. For I think the our top. Texas home ownership rate, y'all come in at like sixty four percent and change uh, in that so area, right? The other forty six. Six. Is, okay. Is, That's yeah. There is a lot of small not, entities. Right. That owner occupied of, homes is sixty. Well, I guess I guess I'd phrase it this way: We were alarmed because we were told we were believed that all these homes are being sucked up by just a few people. Right. We're at 56, 53,000 top 30. Right, right. That, that's to show how how small, really, the, the large right. folks so own a of, of the home market. Ownership and I, to, to, it's pretty small impact. We're, we're not right. getting a monopoly, I guess, is what we're saying. Far from a monopoly. Uh, and I think your dad and Scott, Scott's point, it probably is providing housing for people that wouldn't have it if not for. So I... I I think that's it's good information to have. Yeah. I'm glad you did the work, and I applaud you for doing yeah. it without the bill, because that would have been an easy get out of jail yes. free card, right? Yeah. No. You did your job, so yeah. uh, I'm not seeing a trend here that should put the brakes on. And, and, and two other points to what you were saying: um, one, I think some of these people that have been waiting for interest rates to come down to sell their house, either because they want to go buy at a low rate, or they think the market will improve, or that they've realized. Yeah. It that maybe isn't happening. So this is normal, actually. Right. Most of my folks got spoiled. My first home ownership was nine and a it's half. It's not normal for people younger but, than us, but uh, it is. Than, but this is really where the mortgage rates were supposed to be, and in some ways, yeah. it's a protector that you don't overbuy. It, it's a and, return to normal. Can't afford insurance and taxes now. Yeah. The ones you bought for three percent. So uh, there's some there's some economics there that I think we're having a hard lesson to get through. But and and the other thing I would say, Senator, to your <clears throat> demographic changes about maybe not wanting to own, but they do because of these folks forming households. They do want a, a house. Yeah. Perhaps they want the room. They maybe don't want to raise their family in a multifamily well, situation or whatever. And so there is always going to be a market for rental homes. We're never going to well, get 100% home ownership. you got to acknowledge the mobility in the workforce now. That's right. Correct. Where we used to live, where we worked, m there's a generation that can move anywhere and work. And so having a permanent mortgage that they've got to list and sell and move to the next town, 
that's not in that culture anymore. I'm truthfully, I'm, I'm saddened by that because it has a whole connotation and, and, and connection to community, and there's just not building a wealth. And there, there's not there's not that issue. It, it's not important to them. Maybe it'll change, but again, I, I, I'll say it one more time: market's not agnostic to reality. If the market is saying this is where it's going, let it go. It'll adjust if it needs to. Uh, I'm to to Scott's point. I'm I'm that guy. I think today I'm that clinging symbol. So I will say, uh, Senator, I'm very impressed with the Lubbock's housing market. You guys are going blowing up there. When I look at the data, it's I, I just wonder what's going on up there. We, so we see our value and we out. think, man, we can move. And then we look around. To Hub we, City. We, we, actually, uh, we don't want to give up the space yet. Uh, there may be a day in the re in the future that I do, but today I don't. So. All right, that's right. Thank you, Senator. There's any other any other questions for the panel? Thank you very much. And I'll just say uh, this is really helpful. Uh, a couple of years ago, when these data looked like they were spiking, when they were, to an extent, and you've and you've explained very well, there was that window. I think you nailed it between March of 2020 and the right. spring of 22, where those interest rates and threat of inflation lined up and provided a, an opportunity for those larger institutional investors to really jump in. That's the spike that a lot of people saw. Is, is that fair to say, Mr. Klaus, so based on your research? When I, look, when I look at the history of the home price in the United States, I look at the Case-Shiller Home Price Index. I think you may have heard of that. Adjusted for inflation. When you adjust it for inflation, Prices, the values remain basically flat from 1946 up until the late 1990s, huh. which basically means that home prices were rising at the rate of inflation. Okay. There were no real returns okay. above the rate of inflation. Interesting. In early 2000, that changed significantly, and uh, single-family home prices started appreciating much faster than the rate of inflation. So real returns were very positive. Well, when you're an investor, that's like raising, you know, waving a red flag yeah. to come purchase because investors are looking for those real returns. The financialization, uh, increase of financialization in the economy made it possible to put more, more debt on houses. Mm -hmm. When you can put more debt on houses, it raises the price of those houses. People can borrow more for the same amount of money and it gets less affordable. Mm -hmm. So there, during the 2000s, that was really the takeoff of real returns on single-family homes, which became a magnet for investors. And when the Fed started quantitative easing and purchasing mortgage-backed securities at very low coupon rates, it made possible for banks to make even lower mortgage rate uh, lower 30-year uh, rate mortgages, which encouraged more borrowing for the same monthly payment, which then pressured home prices up even more. Well, that was a real pressure on home prices, which attracted more investors. Okay. And then in 2020, when the Fed decided to take and basically make the statement that that short-term Fed funds rate would be at zero for an extended period of time. That's what in, that was a full on invitation for investor activity, which gave us the spike okay. from March of 2020 to the spring of 2022. Now that rates, the policy rate is 500 basis points higher. Home prices appreciation is leveling off. Now we see that the investor activity has come to a halt. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's why I mentioned it's a one time anomaly that I wouldn't expect to return given the exceptional circumstances we went through. That makes a lot of sense. You know, when those numbers began to show up from so many different quarters, numbers are numbers. And, you know, right. uh, a lot of folks left and right, and it's really not a political issue, you notice that or were concerned is it just contributed to, to home ownership getting further out of reach of so many Americans, right. which we're all concerned about, of those who want to. Senator Perry, you're right that some of those changes are cultural. So. Thank you for helping us with this. As Senator Perry noted, this came up for us at the end of last session, and you were so kind to come. And we knew the Texas Real Estate Center at Texas A&M was there, knew a little bit about what you did. But we had no idea what a wealth of information and research and expertise. And so you came then 
uh, with really we hadn't really prepared you for what we were looking for. Thank you for doing this research for, for pulling out those numbers and researching all those entities. And I want to say something that everybody in this room knows. I know Mr. Norman knows this. Uh, when we when this issue came up in the session, when Governor Abbott raised this issue over the, over the last few months, let me be clear, and you all know this, but just so we're clear, no one on this issue in on this committee, Governor you know, Abbott, no bill that was filed was ever advocating limiting who someone can sell their home to, uh, who can that, that was never an issue. The, the concern was because we see this spike, let's see what caused it was causing that. Let's see what the next steps are. I think we can all agree, and the record will bear it out, no legislation was filed to say you can't sell your house to Blackstone. Uh, as much uh, as gratifying as that might be, it's not fair to that seller to say, hey, they're paying you above market, but you can't sell to them. Of course we're not going to do that. Of course we're not going to do that. What we are going to do is find ways to help those first-time home buyers who, for all of these reasons, find themselves getting priced out of the market. So what you will see or policies I believe most of us are going to be in favor of, subject to the will of the legislature and, and the signature of the governor, you are going to see legislation to make it easier for those first-time home buyers and who are going to buy and, and live there and raise their families there and begin to build generational wealth. We want to make it easier for them, not at the expense, not limiting who you can sell to. Uh, that, that was never even discussed in this committee. I know everybody knows that, but let's don't forget that. Sometimes the game of telephone has a is it multiplied in the legislative setting, and social media has a way of amplifying that. But, but, but thank you both. These numbers are important. And, and again, Scott, man, you're so right. We uh, talk about building wealth, having a, a rental property, building up some rental property. That's a wonderful way for people to build wealth, as it should be. We're thankful for that. And you're right. That build to rent was kind of new for a lot of us. You or your members are going to respond to the market. That's what they ought to do. That's what they're supposed to do. That's what everybody expects them to do. The government's not going to get involved in that. They're going to respond to the market. So thank you guys for that. We're going to, and as you say, what you noted, by the way, Mr. Clausen, about the recent homes we're seeing available, the increase in the amount of inventory and how what that may be. And you, as you say, it may be, we don't know, it may be no, it may some be. of those investment homes coming back on the market. So please help us keep an eye on that as we go forward. And then let me ask you both a couple of questions, if we can, about about home ownership broadly and about housing, right? Uh, about those concerns. Now we're going we're going to set aside for now the issue of large institutional ownership, and talk about the last part of our charge, which is uh, make recommendations to ensure homes are affordable in our state. So. As you both know, there's been some legislation over the last couple of years focused on that. Senator Betancourt had some. <clears throat> Many cities have uh, uh, limitations on lot size, and I guess I want everybody to have a nice big yard. Those are nice to have, but it's kind of like saying you can have a Cadillac or you can walk. Some folks would rather have a house with a smaller lot size if they can have a house. Right. And so the Senate led on those issues. Mr. Norman, do you, do you – what about that? Were you all involved in that? What about yeah, those absolutely. bills that absolutely. say, I'm a landowner, I can build – I can build on a small lot if that's what people want to buy. What about that? And does that help in more houses and lower prices for housing? Absolutely. As I, and I appreciate you bringing that up. As I was saying earlier, the cost of a house is so dependent on the value of the land. The old ratio, you say you build a house that's five times whatever the land costs. Well, if you have a city that has, and Austin was a great example, and I will give uh, y'all's former colleague, Senator Watson, credit for leading the charge on this. Um, the Austin City Council just voted last week, actually the week before last, I think, to lower their their minimum lot size. They had a minimum lot size that was very large, right. um, three or four times what Houston's was, for example, and they voted to lower that with the understanding, and that was driving up home costs right. because they had these huge three, four, five thousand foot minimum lot sizes um, was the minimum you could have in this city. Mm -hmm. And so when you have that, you're not able to build tiny ho homes on these small lots. And so they took action locally to lower it. There was legislation. Um, I don't think it ended up passing um, that would have done the same thing um, statewide. Um, that's certainly a very important issue. You mentioned Senator Betancourt. He, he had Senate Bill 2038 last session that he worked very hard on that dealt with the overlap in the ETJ between city and county and trying to resolve some of that um, and getting homeowners involved. That's very important. I think one of the things that that we y'all hear us talk about a lot, but to continue to improve and streamline the regulatory process. Yes. So much of that 
cost driver that is government effective is actually at the local level. Most of the regulation, not all, but most of the regulation of our industry happens at city county level. Um, and so anything that we can do to continue to streamline that, I know um, there was legislation that Senator Betancourt worked on last session, worked on in the House as well, that did pass that was saying for those local governments that aren't able to meet their deadlines, um, that third-party inspections are an option, third-party plan and plat review. Most of the cities that y'all represent and across the state do a great job of meeting those statutory deadlines that already exist in state law. But for those that don't, the homeowner should not be on the hook. You know, time is money while they're waiting um, for a city or county not to act. And there ought to be a way um, that we we can make that work. That's one thing. Obviously, continue to limit restrictions on the free market. And then the last thing I'll throw out, and this is kind of a, a you were talking about uh, first-time homebuyers. Uh, it's not this committee's charge, but I know all of you will be working on uh, additional property tax reform. I know finance and is looking at that and the tax committees and others. Um, maybe something to throw out is if we're going to do additional property tax reform, because rising property taxes is another component to housing affordability. Obviously, it's rolled into your monthly payment. As, as you know, most people escrow their property taxes. It's certainly a barrier on how much you can buy. Maybe we ought to find first-time homebuyer tax credit of some sort in yes. the property tax reform world, because that's who we really want to get into that housing ownership cycle where they get their first home, get going, whether it's, you know, a reduction for a few years or a deferral of a few years for first time home buyers is something to consider. And we would love to work with the Senate on that idea. Thank you for that. Mr. Clawson, based on your observation, uh, we're not, we're not asking you to advocate for policy though. You're welcome to, but is it, is it your observation that, uh, limits on the size of lots have the effect of decreasing the amount of houses that can be built on lots and affect prices and affordability? The, uh, so I just want to follow up. Scott hit on one of my three main contributing factors. One trying to steal your thunder, I promise. <laughs> Lack of supply. Yes. And I think you are the most uh, qualified to speak on the restrictions and obstacles you have into providing more supply. But I think so greater supply is the most important tool to improving affordability. Mm -hmm. And we have been under building since 2010 with okay. difficult uh, conditions for financing, land, ac you know, land acquisition, development, construction, and regulations. Um, it has, you know, hampered the building community from providing the adequate supply yes, that would have prevented the situation that happened in 2020. Yes, um, the uh, it's interesting. I went and looked at the. Texas urban counties in the state of Texas, I went and looked at the housing stock that was built during the 1960s, the, the late 1960s to early 1970s, okay? The great inflation, the period of the great inflation. What was the trend in, in building houses back in the late 60s and 1970s? And the uh, living area declined uh, from 1,843 square feet down to 1,678 square feet. So that was a, a living area declined by 165 square feet. Uh -huh. Builders didn't stop building. They kept building, but they built smaller. So mm -hmm. living area was 165 square feet smaller, and the lot size shrunk by 726 square feet. Huh. So I would just say that as in a solution, in a, in a period of high inflation and high costs, the two greatest things that could be done is make sure that the builders can build and allow them to build smaller to hit the price point that's affordable for households. And that will get you through the period uh, to keep things affordable uh, until we can start building bigger, less efficient homes in the future when the economy straightens out. <laughs> that is helpful. Now, is that Two of your three, or was that everything? You said the... Oh, the three contributing going. factors. Sorry. So the first one was to what happened from 2020 to 2022. Oh, right. First one was lack of supply. Right. I always like to say it takes uh, several months to build a house. It takes 30 days to create a buyer. <laughs> right? And so when interest rate policy uh, changes and influences mortgage rates lower, you can create a buyer in 30 days but it's going to take you five to six months to create a house. 
And so you can create a lot more buyers a lot faster than you can create houses, which then means people have to bid up all their extra purchasing power on the existing stock of housing, which is what pushes prices up to being unaffordable. So that so the lack of supply relative to the creation of the number of new buyers that happened okay. you know the second was the the fed's de- uh, per- decisions about mbs purchases to buy lower and lower coupon rate mortgage backed securities which enabled banks to you know lend more at the same monthly cost and then the third one was their short term policy decisions so those are my three factors but supply was at the top of the list Thank you both. Senator Menendez, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So uh, the one thing I had not heard yet, and, and I mean, we I barely, I don't know if we, anybody touched on, there was a time in the early 2000s when then President Bush, I think I could quote him saying he wanted everybody who could afford a house to be in a house. I think uh, home ownership rates were amongst the highest in our history. Uh, right before the 2008 Lehman Brothers crash. And Texas got the highest at that time, too. Yeah. And, and, and so as we move forward, you know, what happened since then? One of the things that you all haven't brought up is a little company that got founded and started in 2007 that uh, took a lot of inventory, Airbnb and short-term rentals started in 2007. So now you mentioned something, Doctor, the, the – the fact that you waved the red flag in front of investors, when you can be an investor, not just buy and rent, but buy and do short-term rentals and do a lot and build an inventory, uh, it's a whole new market, and, and it's a market that buys into the to the single-family homes. It's not a condo mm-hmm. thing exclusively or anything like that. So, it is. Uh, there are a lot of factors at play. Now, I, I think if we want to help uh, first-time home buyers, we need to focus on that market. And look, the the reality is that. We can help. It. Government can help, but it comes at a price. And and it's like anything we do, whether we can have uh, policies that say smaller lots or whatever, whatever costs that builder more, they're going to just pass that on to, to the consumer. And so every time you raise the cost that used to be, you raise the cost of a lot by $1,000, you would price out so 22,000. 22,000 people, that first-time home buyer because they just can't afford that increase because the, they won't qualify for the mortgage. It's not a simple, it's not a difficult equation. And so um, as I looked over this list, this investor profile, there, there's overwhelmingly number of lenders on here. You know, and so these could be a lot of foreclosures as well. A lot of Texas banks in here. And so it's not just uh, REITs doing this. Uh, a lot of iBuyers, people buying people. So... I'm glad to hear that we're moving carefully and cautiously as we move forward. I think every time, any time the government gets into the trying to fix the private sector, most of we, when we try to correct something, we tend to overcorrect mm-hmm. because we don't do it on a daily basis. And so this is a, it's a good to see that we're we're pumping the brakes a little bit and just figuring out what can we do without help without actually hurting the system. Amen. It's a system that, that that has worked for a long time, but we just need to be careful not to. Uh, Doctor, thank you for your your stats. One of the things here in the the slide that I thought was very telling is you said the cost of buying versus the cost of renting. And when that relationship gets inverted and when it gets more expensive to buy, well, that's when we see more people renting. So it just makes sense. People are not uh, dumb. They know how to make and they know how to make quality. You know, they can pencil things. And and then fortunately, since the market crashed 2008, when people were just uh, anybody who could fog a mirror was getting a mortgage. Um, you know, we weren't doing – in Texas, fortunately, we were, but we weren't qualifying income on a lot of folks. We were filling out their forms, and that was the times, too, of, of high-interest loans in terms of uh, uh, predatory lending. Uh, those are the things we need to watch out for, mm-hmm. the abuses of people who are first time to, the, to buy because they don't understand. We want to help something. Let's stop, uh, you know, uh, contract for deed. Let's do a lot of little things where people get – get taken advantage of. Let's make sure that those first-time home buyers understand what it is they're getting into and that they're not abused. And that's really where the role of government can actually help, uh, help understand people what it is to ho- own home ownership. One of the things I, I hope on these rental properties, on these large uh, single-family rental properties, that they get individually platted so that eventually there's a possibility of an individual sale of that property. 
Um, as we look at doing that, I think we also need to be careful to eliminate barriers so that people who do own a large lot have owned it for years. What if they want to put a, a, a dwelling, a, an additional dwelling, on their own property? Uh, that's something that we need to be careful because I think some cities are limiting the rights of owners to have large lots uh, to not add an, an additional living uh, dwelling on their property, an ADU. So these are a lot of things that, that we can look at uh, in a cautious way so that we don't overcorrect. These are not partisan issues. These are hopefully they're common sense issues. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator, you, you're so right. It goes to all of that. And on those ADUs, of course, you know, you and I had that bill on that very issue. It's, it's one thing if if a uh, homeowners association or deed restrictions want to limit that, but the, the, the government should not be saying you can't have an ADU on your own property. And you're right in the Senate passed that and then the, didn't get through the House, but we're, let's take another crack next time. You're so right. I know this is your field. I know you help people get in houses, which you do in your day job, but uh, thank you for that. And, uh, members, any other questions for these witnesses? Thank you both for being here. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much. Thanks for your work.